Pursuant to board rules, parties can file appeals to actions of the Board of Zoning Appeals. Specifically, a writ of certiorari can be filed before the Chancery Court in Davidson County within 60 days of the hearing date in order to challenge a board decision. Additionally, under certain circumstances outlined under the BZA rules and regulations, uh, certain cases may be subject to a motion for rehearing within 60 days of the original hearing date. After that 60-day window elapses, no further action can be taken and the board's decision becomes final. For the appellants, this is important. If your appeal is granted, you are in fact required to obtain the permit for which you are applying. A permit must be obtained within two years in order for a board's approval to remain valid. After such time, an appellant would have to start all over again with a new BZA case and seek the same permission in order to obtain the permit sought. Should also be noted that if any false or intentionally misleading testimony is presented to the board, any board approval could be revoked at a later date by means of a show cause hearing before the BZA. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I submit that all the cases have been filed in the proper order, all appellants have been notified by certified mail, and all legal notice requirements have been fulfilled. We have a handful of preliminary announcements before moving into the next phase of the meeting, Mr. Chairman. We'll identify the three cases that have been deferred from today's docket, namely case number 409, that's again BZA case 2018-409. involving the property at 8234 Highway 100 in Council District Number 35, be deferred one meeting to August the 16th. Next, case number 2018-414, involving the property at 220 and 222 Duke Street in Council District Number 5. That uh, case has been deferred two meetings to our September 6th docket. And then case 2018-417, involving the property at 4313 Albion Street, deferred one meeting to August 16. Finally, Mr. Chairman, just here at the beginning of the day, we also received a request from the appellant to defer case 2018-366, involving the property at 2812 Hillside Drive. That too will be a one meeting deferral to the August 16 board meeting. With those four deferrals, our docket is shortened somewhat. We also have one case that was formally withdrawn, namely case 2018-377, which involved the property at 21, 25, 24th Avenue North in Council District Number 2. That case has been formally withdrawn. Mr. Chairman, we would ask politely on behalf of the appellant that case number 2018-380 involving the property at 851 Clayton be moved all the way to the heel of the docket. The appellant is unable to be here promptly at 1 o'clock and wanted to make sure he did nothing to interrupt the board's proceedings, but at the same time make sure he could be present for the case. Uh, with the board's permission, I'll just move that all the way to the heel of the docket, including after the short-term rental cases. Absolutely. Finally, the staff has asked that we pursue a deferral and ask the board to consider a motion for a deferral on case 2018-392. It's a short-term rental appeal involving the property at 2104 Elm Hill Pike. Warrants have issued for that property involving the short-term rental permitting. Uh, it's my understanding the warrant has not been effectively served yet, and that's part of the issue. However, staff respectfully requests a motion on whether or not to defer case 392. It's my understanding the appellant is present, and the board may wish to hear from the appellant before taking formal action on that motion. I'll defer to the chairman. Hey, board members. Uh, you know, John, do you know when that's supposed to be going to environmental court? Or? Because the warrant has not been effectively served, there is no date set yet before the environmental court. Otherwise, it probably would have already not only had a date, but might have even been heard, but for the warrant service. I mean, I think it's appropriate to defer till after the environmental court. I agree. Do you want to make a motion? I'll move that we defer that case until after uh, its issues with the environmental court are settled. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. With that motion, we'll treat the matter as it deferred indefinitely, and once the matter is resolved in environmental court, we can place it back on the docket if need be at the request of the appellant. 392 is deferred to a later date. Mr. Chairman, as always, we'd like to use this outset of the meeting to go over the board's consent agenda. The board uses a consent agenda in order to identify those cases where the appellants have met the criteria for their requested action before the BZA. One board member reviews, and in identifying such cases, uh, he or she would determine if the testimony in the case would not alter the material facts. If that's the case, then the case is recommended to the board for approval. We will enter into the record those cases that have been so recommended from today's meeting. 
And if anyone is here in opposition to one of those cases identified for a consent agenda, please raise your hand, make sure that we see you, and the case will be removed from consent agenda and then just heard in its regular order. I'll humbly solicit the chairman's assistance in identifying waving hands behind me at this point. <laughs> uh, we have five cases recommended for consent agenda. The first of which is 2018-343, involving the property at 222 Myatt Drive in Council District Number 9. That case has been recommended for consent agenda. Oh, the second a call for the opposition. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 343? Seeing none, the next case identified for consent is 2018-386, involving the property at 1812 Beach Avenue in Council District 17. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 386? The next case identified for consent agenda is case 393. That involves a property at 214 Reedhurst Avenue uh, in Council District number 21. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 393? <coughs> Seeing none, the next case identified for consent agenda is 2018-402, involving the property at 1502 57th Avenue North in Council District 20. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number John, 402? John Michael, yes, we have opposition. Yes, we do. As a result, that case will be heard in its regular order. Finally, uh, the last case recommended for consent agenda is 2018-407, involving the property at 407 Douglas Avenue in Council District Number 5. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 407? Seeing none, that which remains of the consent agenda is case 343, 386, 393, and 407. Mr. Um, Chairman, we'd solicit a motion on that. I have a question. Uh, in your earlier correspondence, did, did you not mention case 380? on the consent? Was it removed? We did previously, and there was a request that we remove that from okay. consent agenda. Thank, Thank you for clarifying, Mr. Harper. Okay. Any other questions? I do. Um, I believe I understand that case 386, they will pay into the in-lieu fund for the sidewalks, and 393, they agreed to planning's recommendation. In both instances, that was actually the request on 386 was to have permission to pay, so yes, that's correct. And on... Reedhurst. I've already forgotten the case number, 393, 393, I believe. That was the agreement to follow the planning's exact recommendations, and we have that in writing, of course. Okay. Anything else? I'll second. Okay. That's been moved to the consent agenda. And second. There's a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the consent agenda signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Mr. Okay. Chairman, for those who are here on cases 343, 386, 393, and 407, your cases have been approved. You can come see code staff as early as Monday in order to pursue the appeal that you're, or pursue the permit that you're seeking. Uh, you're done here for today. For those who are here on the cases that were deferred, withdrawn, or otherwise moved to the heel, or rather deferred and withdrawn only, those cases will not be heard today. You're welcome to stay. You're welcome to depart at this point if you wish. Mr. Chairman, here at the beginning of the meeting with the consent agenda tidied up, we always like to use a moment to recognize the elected officials who are with us today. There are three council members present, so we'll identify council member Kathleen Murphy from District 24 and invite her to the lectern at this point. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking me out of order. Um, typically, I like to stay for my cases, but it is election day, and so to all of you watching at home, stop watching, go vote. This will be replayed. Um, Polls and, close at seven. <laughs> right. And so, um, but I wanted to come today because there's two cases, um, and I think you've gotten previous letters on them. The first case that I'm going to address is case 122, which is 4804 Dakota. Um, I wasn't here last time because I had another conflict, but because of neighbors' emails to me, phone calls to me about this property, I've taken time out of, obviously, as you can tell, I've been out in the field today for the election. Um, what's important about this property is that it seems that a lot of properties in Sylvan Park are starting to build these garages or these detached what have yous. Um, they go by very different names by whoever you talk to. And they oftentimes are being overbuilt. 
they're being too tall, or they the intention and they're calling it a garage, yet then it will have a room above it, and then somewhere down the line, you know, maybe some plumbing got added, or maybe an extra bedroom is added, or something like that. And so there's there's a couple of different folds of issues here. One is that if something is being permitted and built as a garage, then it's being inspected as a garage, not for a space that someone is maybe sleeping in here or there, or a space that um, should be constructed to a residential standard rather than a, a garage uh, storage standard. And so I know that this case was before y'all and that they've closed the public hearing, but I've got the um, the, the zoning chair for, for Sylvan Park Neighborhood Association here with me today. And so I'm speaking kind of on their behalf because this is happening all over Sylvan Park. And, I, and what I'm seeing is that a lot of times codes inspectors and I are going back and forth. Neighbors are going back and forth with the codes inspectors about houses that are built maybe a foot too high or the roof line is too high. And I think that we have got a very slippery slope in Sylvan Park where neighbors are building garages and then asking for forgiveness. Um, I don't know if it's that the, the plans don't match what is built or vice versa. Um, but originally this case I think came before was uh, filed as a setback issue and then later added as a height issue, which is a whole nother concern that I've addressed with y'all staff about making sure that cases are noticed to neighbors appropriately in the beginning because it does become like, um, it, it wears neighbors down when they have to keep thinking and keep researching and keep remembering, now what were they asking for? Do we need to go again? Did we miss the meeting? Oh, it's been deferred and that type of thing. And, and it really, on this property, I had neighbors reach out to me because evidently there have been issues well before my time on the council. And neighbors just quite frankly kind of were tired and didn't feel up to coming and speaking because they felt like it was a done deal. Um, because it was, it had been here, it had been changed around. And so what I'm asking you here today is to deny this, um, the height variance. Um, I'm not as familiar on the setback variance. That might be a little bit more something that you're used to. But, but in Sylvan Park, across the board, we are seeing these garages being built, overbuilt, and I mean, to the point where I'm having neighbors sending me pictures of people living in them and we're sending them to the codes inspectors. Codes inspectors are trying to catch people living there. It's just, we're at a slippery slope here and, and this is one, it, they need to start being denied. Um, Y'all are the Board of, of Appeals and so it's very appropriate for you to grant variances when there are legitimate hardships, but you're not the board of forgiveness. And I feel like a lot of times, um, you know, if neighbors are not able to come down here aware of it, um, you know, that that's what's happening is, is developers a lot of times, or even neighbors feel like they can just ask for forgiveness. And some of y'all know I'm, I'm a seamstress. And so if I buy fabric and I cut my dress out wrong and I sew it wrong, I can't go back to the store and ask them and expect them to just give me new fabric. I mean, when you make that mistake, there there's consequences. And so it's, it's, it's not fair to put one person's, um, you know, ability to use the system over the rest of the neighborhood's quality of life. This is a neighborhood that's neighborhood maintenance. It was zoned single family um, at least 15 years ago, I think. And so when we get these detached garages and homes, it, it's changing the character of the neighborhood. So it's something that I, I'm asking y'all to, to deny. And then the second, um, the second case that is before y'all today is... <clears throat> 2018-375, and that is for a sidewalk variance. Um, a lot of times I typically just send y'all letters saying we want the sidewalk built because pretty much 9.9 .9 times out of 10, I'm going to ask y'all to say, make them build the sidewalk. This one, you need to make them rebuild the sidewalk. <laughs> this is my, like very close to my house, it's on my running route to the Greenway, and the sidewalk's destroyed. Um, I saw that planning had kind of sent y'all a letter saying, oh, it's okay if X, Y, and Z, but once we sent Michael Briggs at planning, the, the pictures that hopefully y'all received from one of my neighbors too, you can see that the sidewalk's just destroyed. On this street, there has been, um, it's zoned R6, so two, two 
two homes can be built where one is now. Um, a lot of them are duplexes. We looked at down zoning because of just the con the construction pressure here, and this was a street that planning didn't uh, think would be best. Planning said, you know what, we need to keep the density there. The neighborhood agreed with it, but as these homes are being turned over and rebuilt, the sidewalk is just being just. It, it's not there anymore, it's destroyed. And so I can't imagine who would wanna buy it with a broken sidewalk in front of it. Um, but again, it's also, a, it's a safety hazard. We are right next to White Bridge, which has mass transit. We are close to Charlotte that has mass transit. And if we wanna to continue to have my neighbors and myself use mass transit or get to the Greenway, we've gotta have sidewalks get there that we don't fall on our face and then sue Metro later. So I'm gonna ask y'all to, to disapprove and have that sidewalk um, completely rebuilt to the standard um, f of what is required. So, so on that one, um, it has an existing four-foot uh, sidewalk and a two-foot grass strip, and so you would prefer to have the four-foot grass strip and the five-foot sidewalk and have it jog, or do you want them just to completely redo what's there and have a straight line on the street? I think that there are other properties maybe that have gotten away with it or they pulled their permit before, and so... I mean, this is where we'll go back and forth a lot of times because, I mean, we pa the council passed the sidewalk ordinance for a reason. We need our sidewalks upgrade. I think this is an area that it could be okay to do the two-foot um, buffer that maintain that. Um, but the problem is a lot of these homes that are re being rebuilt on, on Kendall and Knob right there, the entire front, and I'd have to pull it up on the map or whatnot, a lot of times these homes, the front yard ha is becoming completely sidewalk. I mean, it completely a driveway. Um, I, I don't know how that works with stormwater. That's a whole other issue. Um, but I mean, it's a lot of concrete. So some sort of grass buffer needs to be there. Two foot or four foot, I'm okay with that as long as it is compared to tip top brand new shape. Um, that's And I think you've got a letter from our neighborhood association president on it and some of our leader, our board members with those pictures. Council Lady Murphy, I just want to make sure I understand. The planning recommendation was to maintain the existing sidewalks in good repair and pay in lieu on the frontage. You're, but you're agreeable if they maintain the existing sidewalk with the two-foot grass strip. You're okay with that? And pay the in lieu on the yes. frontage? Yes. Or, okay. Because, again, at the end of the day, like, these sidewalks are going to have to be maintained okay. um, and kept up. And and as you have seen through our council budgets and read in the paper, we don't have a lot of excess money. Um, and, and it wouldn't surprise me if sidewalk funding, you know, is, I mean, that's a lot of times seen as kind of more fluffy time. So we need to make sure that everybody is paying equally and fairly into that. <laughs> Any other questions for Council Lady Murphy? Thank you. Well, actually I have one related to case 122 that you were saying. So this is already built, as you know. It's just framed. Hmm? It's, not, it's just framed. Framed. So you want us to not give any variance on height? That is what the neighbors have expressed that they want that to me, and we've done you've done that in other properties in in my district. I think there was another case, not far from here, closer to 46, that I believe they rose the height of the main structure to fit. Um, my memory is getting where I don't remember all the cases, and John Michael and Bill might be able to help a little more. Um, but no, this is I mean, just coming to ask y'all for forgiveness every time is it, it gets neighbors start to feel like why should they be held to the code and to the standard if you can just pay the what is our fee a hundred or two hundred dollars to come to y'all and ask for forgiveness that's that's what is really starting to get and erode the neighborhood morale and quite frankly neighbors are tired of having to police this but again it's, it's real easy for me to build a, a house that's too big and then ask for forgiveness for y'all and just pay the two hundred dollars yeah, and I, I'll, I'll say I, I was the I was not present for that hearing uh, and I think was the only one here that wasn't and uh, did watch the the tape and actually was confused enough still uh, to uh, drive by the property just to see what it looked like and um, there was a little bit of confusion about whether it was built or not, and it is just in, it's been framed. I mean, it doesn't have a permanent roof. It has a plywood roof. It has uh, the wood frame up, has plywood walls, and, you know, uh, appreciate the homeowner respecting the stop work order, but it appears that they did stop work, and it wasn't a case where uh, they finished the, the, the property. So I do think that that's a 
uh, for discussion, and I think that they 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 may have something to new information they're going to share in the case. But but I, I do think it's you know, to sure. your point, it was confusing when I watched the tape at what state of construction it was in, and so when I drove by it, it uh, it clearly is in a situation where it could be fixed. It's not a finished product. Even better, because I mean, again, it's better when these problems are caught before they they finish out, and and then, again, financial hardship is not a hardship right. to be to grant a variance. Um, and so I guess if there is new information, it does that mean that the the I know the public hearing is closed on this one, but if if one party is in, entering. Um, new information, does that allow the public hearing and the other side to have the ability to rebuttal on new information? I think, it's cl I think for, from what I understand it, John may say it's, it's, a, it's a survey that provides clarity, not new information. I mean, it's not a new argument. It's, I think, in response to a question with a survey. You're certainly welcome to okay. take a look at it and see. But I think that's, I think that's all we that's have. It. Okay. Okay. It's a I think there was survey. a question to say. I just what, wanted to make sure. Yeah. I think it really is a, cl a clarification type of information, not a new argument okay. or anything. Okay. But as the person who didn't hear the first one and saw, has seen yeah. the new information. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, Council Lady thank Murphy, you. for being here on Election Day. Um, like I said, everyone go vote. Polls close at 7. Thank you. Y'all have a good day. Bye. Mr. Chairman, we're also joined by Council Member Karen Johnson. Council Member Johnson. Mr. Chairman, we're also joined by Council Member Brett Withers. Councilman Thank Withers. Thank you. Council Member Johnson. Appreciate that, Council Member Johnson. Um, good afternoon, uh, board members. I have just two items uh, this time. Um, let me see if I can find those quickly. The first one is for property that's located on uh, Main Street, case number 2018-413, for property located at 912 Main Street. This is a request for a variance from the sidewalk requirements as well as parking requirements. I'm sort of with Councilmember Murphy that ordinarily I'm a bit of a stickler for sidewalk requirements since so many constituents expressed to me that we need uh, developers uh, to help us maintain our infrastructure. Um, for this particular case, uh, I am willing to uh, support the applicants in um, their request to forego the in lieu contribution uh, for the sidewalk variance. I'm also willing to support them on the parking um, variance that they are requesting. This is um, uh, one of several properties on Main Street for which any level of work uh, that we could get to spruce them up is a gift to our community. And so um, I, I appreciate the effort of what they're trying to do. It, uh, in learning a little bit more about the project, uh, I'm surprised by, why, by what they uh, seem to be able to do on such a small budget. And therefore, with the, um, with the, the fact that this is a lease, it's not a, a new sort of permanent structure that's going on. It's a lease from a long-term neighborhood and property owner uh, for a few years in, in recognition of those things. I think that uh, foregoing even an Luffy is fine. If a permanent structure were to be built later, by which I mean, you know, on Main Street you can build up to a five-story building. If we have a substantial structure like that that's going in, obviously we would, we would require more. Um, but with this, basically it's a modification of a very, very small nondescript building that will turn it into a another uh, food and beverage destination for Main Street, um, and I, I wish them the best in that uh, luck. So uh, I do support the uh, request not to pay the in lieu fee for the sidewalks. The sidewalks that are there are eight feet wide. They're in decent shape. Uh, so there, I, I have walked it recently, and I'm not even aware that there are any major even repairs that are needed in that particular block of sidewalks. Similarly, with the parking, there are um, a number of there are some parking lots in that vicinity. It's quite quite an entertainment destination. What we're starting to see, fortunately, in this little pocket of Main Street is that we have folks who um, will sort of come and visit one business, but then also circulate to other businesses. So it's not, I don't think that everyone who's going to this business would necessarily drive specifically to that business. They might stop at any one of the other places nearby as well uh, on their way to or from. Uh, it is on Main Street, as technically is in walking distance to downtown. I can walk there. You can walk to Five Points. It's served by uh, a couple of bus lines. So for all those reasons, I think that a parking reduction is uh, fine for this particular endeavor as well as the sidewalks. So I support both of those requests. Okay. 
next one. And then the next I one had a is question oh, on that one. Yes. Sure. These come to us all the time. These small additions or or what have you renovations, and we don't understand why the sidewalk requirement is triggered. Um, so do you see in the future any legislative change that would prevent these from coming to us? I'm wondering, or I mean, that's that's an excellent question, and I know Councilmember Henderson is. Uh, one of the ones who's sort of looking at revisiting the sidewalk bill now that it's about a year in. Um, we haven't really gotten to a, uh, a definitive place yet. You know, it, uh, there has been discussion sometimes about having it be a percentage, for example, a percentage of the total permit. When you look at the incredibly low cost of what this permit is, even if you went by that, you know, this, the just the in-lieu fee, the in-lieu fee is, is, would be a substantial uh, component of just what this permit is. So I think even if we did have a version like that, it's uh, this would be one that we would probably be willing to forgive the, the fee on. I just like to point it out because I know you're proactive and maybe you can bring our comments back to yeah. and have a legislative solution. Thank you. Uh, the other one is a short-term rental request. This is 2018-340 uh, for property located at 1101 Shelby Avenue. This is um, a short-term rental. It is owner-occupied. Uh, the information that I have is that we are talking about a day due that is being rented, so not even a full house. Um, it's uh, the applicant uh, contacted me and let me know that there were some kind of personal uh, situations that happened over the last you know year or so that uh, led to some confusion about paperwork being filed and. Um, uh, again, if it's owner-occupied, we are talking about a day due. We're not talking about a house full of a dozen people that would potentially be there. Um, you know, that uh, we, we definitely want people to follow the rules, but this would not seem to be one that has caused a lot of problems in the neighborhood in the past, as some others have. Uh, I was able to speak with representatives from the East End Neighborhood Association, and they were uh, okay in supporting this appeal as well. We do have some that are problematic, and we really appreciate the board looking at those uh, and taking those concerns seriously when we do have. This is the one on Shelby? Bridges. Yes, sir, 1101 Shelby. So I'm willing to support that appeal as well. Any other questions for the councilman? Thank you for being here. All right, thank okay. you so much. Have a great day. John Michael. Councilman Rickard and Johnson. Welcome our former Board of Zoning Appeals member and our future clerk. Thank you. <laughs> well, happy Election Day, everybody. Uh, chair, is it Chair Ewan or Chair Taylor? Which one of you all chair? Okay. <laughs> chair Ewan. I'm the assistant. Okay, Chair Ewan, Vice Chair Taylor, esteemed uh, board members, um, uh, Council Lady Karen Johnson. Uh, thank you all for the incredible amount of time you all spend uh, serving in this capacity. Um, For the I record, when you were on the BZA, meetings were like two hours, three hours. Some. <laughs> Unless it was really, really heated. We were there a long time. Well, I, I have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I mean, okay, seven. And uh, could you pass these around? I want these to be made part of the record. Um, one of them is an email that I received back uh, from a constituent who could not make the community meeting. Uh, I am speaking on item uh, case 2018-291 on page 10. Um, before I read my comments here, I do want to express that I asked um, the owner of this property who was here last time uh, to withdraw. Uh, based on the community meeting. Uh, he did not want to do that. And uh, so I am, before I read my comments, are going to ask that you uphold the zoning administrator's denial, and I'll explain why. On July 31st, uh, 2018, I held a community meeting for District 29 in order to give both the community and Mr. Rule, the property owner of 288 Clear Lake um, Drive West, the opportunity to express their thoughts regarding the property being used as a short-term rental. Close to 30 families came out to express their concerns with the current and future use of this property. After giving Mr. Rule an extended opportunity to address his plans for the property, 
Neighbor after neighbor spoke against Mr. Rue using the facility as he currently is. To be fair, Mr. Rule did provide two emails from neighbors not in attendance stating that they were in support of Mr. Rule's desire to rent out his property. Upon speaking uh, with one of the neighbors who sent an email, it was discovered, which you all have a copy of that email, that that neighbor travels um, often and is not home enough to be impacted um, by the activity on this property. Um, and the reason why I had um, responded to this particular person was because they sent me an email and I asked them um, why did they have a lockbox on their house. I thought their house was for sale and this is the person that lives right next to them. And they indicated that um, they used the house to they house sit, have someone to come over the house sit the dogs when they travel. The neighbors in attendance had numerous concerns, including but not limited to noise, parking, safety, and compliance with rules that have already been established for that neighborhood. Neighbors expressed their concerns that there is often a lot of noise coming from the property, primarily on the weekends, but also during the week as well. Residents who live behind um, this home on Islandia and adjacent to Mr. Rule's property complain they cannot sit outside in their yards due to the level of noise. Mr. Rule stated that he had three bedrooms that could be rented for up to 10 people. There were concerns that allowing the property to be used as a short-term rental and housing an additional 10 people would add tremendous safety and noise concerns. Neighbors complained about the numerous cars, oft oftentimes parked in the wrong direction on the street in the front of the home. The number of cars makes it difficult to navigate the portion of the street uh, because that is actually a curve where his house sits is actually in a curve and it's a blind spot. Um, so vehicles coming down Clear Lake Drive West uh, have a very hard time um, with that particular area with visibility. And there was also a wreck that happened in front of his house. There has already been an accident reported where Mr. Rule lives and neighbors believe allowing him to utilize his property in the current manner he wants to do will add more cars to the street and create congestion, visibility, and safety issues. Concerns were brought up that a child uh, may be hit by one of the cars. He had placed out there a um, basketball goal and that really should not be on the street. But um, that, that has um, attracted children uh, within that vicinity. So that's a, a big concern. There were numerous examples brought up of breaking the rules, such as parking the boat on um, the Corps of Engineers property in the back, which is not allowed, renting his home prior to receiving appropriate approval, and leaving the rental sites active during the process. Neighbors were upset that the rental page stated uh, that you could rent cars from the home and outside the, and that the outside tent, Mr. Rule stated, was being used to cover a car. Now, we pulled up the site while we were in the meeting, and those are the pictures you have. He stated to the people in the community meeting that he placed a car underneath the tent. But as you can see, the outside tent is a bedroom, which I don't understand that. <sighs> um, the neighbors do not believe they can trust Mr. Rule to comply with rules. Um, you know, there are rules with short-term rentals and codes and, and, and established rules by the Army Corps of Engineers. While my constituents made it very clear they were not interested in dictating how another property owner uses their property, 
it was clear that uh, Mr. Rule doesn't seem to think he has to follow the same rules as everyone else in the neighborhood. Allowing the property to operate at the current level of activity um, with no regards to the rules and the dangerous um, concerns for safety that people have expressed is why we are asking that you do not um, reverse the uh, zoning um, administrator's denial for him to operate at this time. What people really want to happen here is for him to work with the community, listen to the concerns, and adjust the activity accordingly. But um, unfortunately, uh, the safety issues that were expressed, he was kind of combative <laughs> um, and very defensive uh, that he's not creating that. And so I see this as a situation where um, there will be a lot of back and forth and a lot of issues with people feeling that they are not safe uh, coming through this area. So with that, um, does anyone have any questions? I did what you all asked me to do, and it was to have a meeting, but I think a lot of people are really, really concerned that that site was still active when you all expressed to him to, that he shouldn't be doing that until he gets all of his approvals, which he had not yet, and that, that is obvious by what we pulled up and gave you a copy of. Thank you. Councilman A. Johnson, I know you get a lot of kind of concerns about short-term rentals in your area, as many other council people do. Where does this particular case rank in the ones that you've heard from your neighbors? Um, honestly, you all have had others, and there, there weren't any safety issues. Um, this, this blind spot and area um, with regard to children and people having a wreck already right there and the fact that um, the activity there exceeds what we have seen with others, this is a severe case, um, I feel. Um, I would rank it up to a 9 or 10 <laughs> in terms of severity because, again, I think Mr. Rule has to be cognizant of safety issues uh, with the blind curve and with the amount of people that are coming within the, the small area um, that he has in his home. Okay. Any other questions for Council Lady Johns? We really appreciate you being here on Election Day. Thank Good you. Good luck with your new position. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, before taking on our first cases that are regularly scheduled on today's docket, we of course have three items, actually five cases, but three items that need to be addressed by the board um, that did not re previously receive four votes. As I always make the introductory announcement, cases that do not get four affirmative votes stay on the board's docket for 30 more days, and board members have the opportunity, those who are absent at least, have the opportunity to review the record, review the entire case file, confirm they've done so, and then participate in a final vote on the case. Our board members who are absent uh, from either one or both of the last two meetings were Cindy Chapel and David Taylor. So first, Ms. Chapel, I'll ask you, um, have you had the opportunity to review the case file and the um, hearing video as well from the cases you missed? I believe that was namely the cases 352, 353, and 354, the contiguous properties on Hummingbird Drive from our 719 board meeting. Yes, I have. I tried to stretch that out so you could <laughs> The second question, did you also get a chance to review the case 363 involving the property at 1907 A&B, 9th Avenue North? Yes. And are you prepared to participate in the vote on both of those, or all four of those cases today? I am. Very well. Additionally, Mr. Uh, Taylor, did you get a chance to review not only the four cases just identified to Ms. Taylor, but also, or rather Ms. Chapel, but also case 122 involving the property at 4804 Dakota? Yes. And, and are you prepared to participate in all five of those votes today? Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, the first case out of that sequence is case number 122 involving the property at 4804 Dakota. You've heard from the district council member. You have been advised that there is a recently updated survey that corrects the small area in the prior survey that's been submitted in the plan. Um, 
absent any questions or desire to reopen the uh, public hearing, which I don't think has been the will of the board in any of these, the board can now deliberate, take up a new motion, and vote accordingly on the request for a variance from height and also a variance from uh, side and rear setbacks. Okay, what's the board's wishes on this case? And Mr. Chairman, sorry, uh, counsel for case 122 is here just to explain that survey that was submitted and clarify what that is. Okay. Good afternoon, members of the board. Cleveland Bain, 4800 uh, Charlotte Avenue with the West Nashville Law Group. Um, Mr. Chairman, were you going to say something? I didn't mean oh, to Oh, no, go you. ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, um, like the council lady said earlier, the public hearing is closed, so I have a very limited and direct clarification. As you can see in your package, earlier in the week, uh, we submitted a new survey. Um, during the last hearing, there were some questions about the height uh, of the accessory structure. Um, so we had asked the surveyor to come back out and measure as it relates to the height restrictions um, as uh, they're contemplated in 1712.060. And, um, and if you will note on that, from the top of the block to the eave is 16.8, mm -hmm. uh, so 16 feet 8 inches. Um, and if you go to the natural grade, it is 18.1. So I believe there was some, dis some discussion about the structure being 24 feet last time. So I thought that it was important that we clarify that for the record. Um, so where, where are you measuring on that? I mean, this is, this is from the bottom of the eave to the, to the ground? To the natural grade, yes, is 18.1. Okay. And then, and, and I want to be careful not not to speak outside of um, my, my limited thing, but, but what the appellant, I believe, done was looking at the top of the block to the bottom of the, the eave, and that was 16.8. And what the surveyor notated um, was something different. So that's that, that's why we wanted to clarify this, so, so the board would have an accurate understanding of how tall this structure actually is. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. Open our discussion. It's time for our discussion again about this particular case. Since y'all have already discussed it, what are your thoughts? Um, you know, at, at watching the hearing and um, and then again, as I mentioned to Council Lady Murphy, um, I drove by um, because I I really thought that from the testimony it it seemed like it was a, a much more finished product than it was uh, from the hearing. I, I definitely was empathetic on the side setback and the rear setback because uh, that, to me, was an honest mistake based on an old fence and the neighbor who was impacted didn't care. Um, and I think that's a classic uh, reason for the variance in addition to the mature tree. The, the height, uh, it, you know, it, it is built very tall. Um, I'm not an architect, but I also think there are others there that may be as tall. but. You know, through the use of eaves and other things that, you know, I mean, uh, through dormers and whatnot, I mean, they designed it in a way that it complied with codes. And my thought on the height is I, I don't see a reason it can't comply to co with codes on the height. It, it's uh, it, it's, an, it's a, in a frame state. It's not in a finished state. And I think if you're going to fix it, now's the time. I do, again, I think I mentioned earlier, applaud the applicant for uh for stopping work when uh, they were told, and I think that ultimately will benefit them regardless of how it turns out. One of the arguments that council made on behalf of the applicant last time was that you, could, you couldn't you could see the structure when you drove by from the street. Did you find that to be true in your drive? Well, I think, that, yeah, there is there is some truth uh, to that. I think in part because of planning. I think, you know, I did drive both ways because I wasn't sure where the house was. Now, there is a place where you see it. I mean, it's, it's not, um, you know, the, to me, I, I think it's the 18 feet bothers me more than the 25 foot height. I mean, I, I, to me, the the pitch of the 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 height of the top of the building. I'll look at my architects to tell me what what I'm supposed to be saying in terms of uh, architectural language. Um, you know, that wasn't as offensive as it was when you go down the alley and you see a massive wall that really. I mean, it. You know, when it said 18 feet, that's where I was like, man, it's really tall. Now, that, the applicant also said, well, there are others on the street that maybe appear to be as big or, or, or whatnot. And, you know, if some of those are in violation, I think that's something that can be addressed. Uh, 
there may be, like as I said, through dormers and other uh, architectural elements, uh, have been a way to to do it. But it, it and again, I, I I can't impose my. I, I don't know what the person's intent was, but when I look at a building like that. I infer that the intent is to maximize the square footage of your second floor and you build your wall taller and you don't have as much knee wall and you don't have as much, you know, the, the roof is pitched less steep and you get more space. And like I said, I don't know that that's what that person's intent was, but when I looked at it, I thought, well, that's why it's tall. It's not tall because of a hardship, it's tall because you want a bigger room up there. Um, but again, not, again, not, not it, that's, that's how I view that. I, I don't know how that person did, but, but it, I didn't see a hardship, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, I agree there wasn't a hardship, but um, it's what you're saying. It may not be their intent to use the second yeah, I floor I mean, as living space, but this would make it, if the variance was approved, this would make it easier for someone in the future to retrofit um, and make it a residence, which is, or a occupiable space with a bathroom that's not allowed. And I think that's what the council lady was getting after, is people are retrofitting and making dadus when dadus aren't allowed. I mean, I know there, I mean, you know, again, if it's on a hill and you, and, you know, if, if it's on a hill and, and the hill causes it to be taller, one side's taller than the other side, we get those all the time, and that's that's a different situation. But I, to me, this was a design choice issue, not a, a, um, a topography issue. And like I said, it was in, in the state where it could be fixed. So like I said, I, I left my review thinking, you know, I fully can support a, a side and rear setback. I think that's absolutely been proven by the applicant. Um, Ms. Chapel, what do you think about the side and rear setbacks? I'm and I was at the hearing. I'm agreeable to the side and rear setbacks. And I will say, I was agreeable to the height setback, but it is compelling to me when a council lady comes here and speaks uh, as passionately as Council Lady Murphy did about her concerns in the neighborhood. So that's something that um, could sway me. Okay. More discussion. Do you remember I, who made the motion? Well, I don't. I don't. It was it was three to two for for the the uh, three variances, and and I I don't support that. So it, it's it's three to three, okay. which means that they get no variances. Or if someone well, John Michael make we, another motion, we the, can start a new, right? We actually prefer that you start a new to make a clean motion, particularly if the vote is has any chance of being bifurcated with partial approval, partial denial. You can specify if you want, but we always prefer a clean motion. Well, so I think it'd be good to have a motion for setbacks and then a motion for the height. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll move that we approve the variances for side and rear setback. Um, because of the unique uh, situation of this case, including the mature tree and the historic fence that was misplaced. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Next motion. Well, I'll, I'll move that we deny the um, <coughs> variance for height because of the lack of hardship. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, we have a five to one case, but the motion passes. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, before moving into the second item, which involves the three cases, 352, 353, and 354 from our last docket, we will note that Council Member Tanaka Vercher has joined us as well. We would invite her to the lectern at this time to address the board on her case of interest. Council Member Vercher. Thank you so much, commissioners. I am uh, Councilwoman Taneka Vercher. I represent District 28. Um, I would like to speak on case 2018-291. That is Council District 29. Um, the boundary for our two districts is Murfreesboro Road. I have uh, significant interest in this case um, due to um, I'm the district uh, across from it. As it relates to um, the appellant and the property owner for located at 288 Clear Lake Drive West, um, I'm asking that you as the commissioners that you uphold um, your denial of a short-term rental permit um, as it relates to um, the property owner. 
I had um, the pleasure of, of, of um, attending um, a community meeting this week and um, listened to the concerns of the, the constituents of District 29, um, where this would actually um, directly impact many of them. Um, I don't want to speak um, as it relates to the matter of safety and, and so forth and um, the conversations and what was transcribed at a community meeting. I understand that Council Lady Johnson has already, already done that. I just want to simply state that um, um, the owner um, is still violating the law. So I would ask that you still consider that um, in your deliberation, in your decision today. Um, this property is, is still listed um, after um, knowing that he's uh, breaking a law. So he's continuing um, to ignore our laws. And many of you, you've been on this commission a long time. You know this process does not work when we have um, uh, um, some uh, that refuse to do um, right. Um, we have those that come down here and, and wholeheartedly want to do right. Um, but this, this particular owner, he's not going to do right. Um, by our laws, and he's not going to do right by the community. And with that said, I ask that you deny um, this permit. Thank you so much. Council Lady Vircher, um, I have one question. I know that um, Council Lady Allen, the author of the short-term rental bill, always kind of tells us that we should start at a year and go down, because basically that's the penalty they have and that we're supposed to look at if there is any mitigating factors that they should get less. So you are saying to us that you want us to I want the maximum. Year, which is a year. Yes. Okay. Thank any you. Any questions for the council lady? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, cases 352, 353, and 354 were heard at our July 19th meeting here in this very room. They involve three side-by-side-by-side uh, -side -side properties on Hummingbird Drive in Council District Number 1. Since that hearing date, you have received an email in your board packets from the newly elected and newly sworn in district council member in District 1, Jonathan Hall, expressing his support for the variance requests at these three addresses. Uh, after the public hearing, we made that only addition to the file as a deferential maneuver on behalf of the district council Council member with the unique circumstances of the very recent election and filling of that spot. With that, the board will have the opportunity to discuss the setback, or rather the variance requests involving street setback, height, and square footage restrictions at all three of the addresses with all three of these cases. After the deliberation, we would of course encourage the, boat to give, uh, the board to give three separate votes, one for each of the cases. Although there are the same requests for each property, single family uh, residential proposed for each of the three, we do still need the three votes. Mr. Did, Taylor. Did, and when I reviewed the case, I thought that the applicant said he did not want the height variance. I do happen to recall that. It was originally filed that way, so I, I'm sorry, you're exactly right. He did state that in his comments at the prior hearing, okay. which would, of course, leave the board just with the uh, street setbacks and the square footage the restrictions. Right. Okay. And this was one of the ones that I think I made the motion on, you know, I thought it met the requirements, and it's nice that we have a letter from the new council person, uh, Hall, out there. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't have any issue with the uh, front setback. Um, to me, the, the, the shape of the lot is very is much uh, less deep than all the neighbors. And so to me, that was a pretty obvious uh, hardship in terms of the, the way the lots were shaped. I did have an issue with the uh, square footage variance because, you know, we've had contextual overlays before and, you know, we've had authors of contextual overlays come to us <laughs> want an increase in their own personal property. And I, I know people want to build to what they can build, but it, I, I've, got a, I've got a bit of an issue with the 33% increase, 33% uh, requested increase in square footage, um, but I don't have an issue with the 60-foot setback. I, I, I do agree with the councilman and, uh, and with this board, but okay. you know, that there may be four votes that, that are okay with both, but I, I did have an issue with the contextual overlay setback. What I was hoping, and I was the one who um, actually got you guys to, to look at the tape because I voted um, dissenting. Um, so sorry to add work to your plates. But my what I was troubled by was the neighborhood went through the contextual overlay. So they imposed that on themselves. And they worked really hard, I'm sure. I know because I went through the same thing with uh, my former neighborhood. And 
so it was, that meant a lot to me. And there was some room. I mean, no doubt there's a hardship, but there was some room to push the house back so it didn't have to be 60 feet from the road when the other ones were at around 90. I think the average setback was 119. So that is a big ask. So what I had been hoping is there was they could reach some kind of middle ground, like maybe 80 feet or 90 feet, which would still give them a backyard. I don't have the drawing in front of us. Um, it wasn't in our packet today, and I, but I just recall that from the. Yeah, and I don't. I don't know that. Meeting. I'm not set on the 60. I, I think, in concept, up front, a setback is appropriate, um, mm -hmm. whatever that might be. But I don't. I don't have an issue. And you know, I was just deferring to the councilman who and and who said. He was yeah. okay with that. To me, District 1 is a unique place. I grew up in District 1, and they have has been widely reported five council people in the last few years and just a lot of change. And the new council person, who obviously wasn't part of that, you know, has weighed in strongly about this particular case. So I, I actually thought, given that this was reasonable, given how the street curved, and the other thing, it basically applied to one side of the street, which of course is their right, but the opposite side of the street, the houses are much closer to the yeah. road. Yeah, I, I was okay. Like I said, to me, my my only issue with this case, um, I mean, I, I, I respect that, and I, I would, I wouldn't, yeah, I would be okay with looking at it a little bit. What is the right thing? But I, I can live with the the 60 feet. Is the the allowing a house you know, one third larger than right. the t contextual overlay, because I do think that you, you know, you start to get into, you know, changing the nature of the neighborhood and, and the, the price point of the neighborhood and other things that, that ultimately cause problems that I think this neighborhood worked, worked hard to say, no, this is not what we want in our neighborhood. So that, that's the only thing I'd, okay. I had an issue with, but oh. like I said, if, if y'all, yeah. if y'all are okay with it, um, because I think it was, he said it was about a garage and that kind of thing. And I, you know, understood that too. But uh, well, I'll um, I'll renew my motion for 352 to allow for the street setback and square footage based on the curve of the street and the odd shape of the lot. Do you want to do these separately? As yeah, well? we're doing them all separately. No, I mean, do you oh, want the, to do the variances the separately? The street setback versus the square footage. So there may be different okay. types on that. I'll do the street setback first. So, uh, 352 street setback, um, odd shape of the lot, and um, at 60 feet. And at 60 feet, yes. Uh, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Five to one. Um, and then for 352, I will renew my motion to allow a variance for the square footage. Uh, based on the odd shape of the lot. I would second the motion, and I would like to add that in viewing that tape, my recollection is even the opposition was not opposed to the size because they wanted nice homes built on the lot, and we're talking about three homes. So I would second the motion for that reason. Okay. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Five to one. Okay. No, that's just four, four to two. two. Oh, four to two. Oh, you. Yeah. Okay. Four to two. Okay. Um, and then I'll start again. Three fifty-three, and I'll do them separately. Um, motion for street setback, given the odd shape of the lot. That's my motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Five to one, and I'll. Go with 353, the variance for the square footage variance um, based on the odd shape of the lot. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Four to two again. And then the last one, um, case number 354, I move that we uh, grant the street setback variance due to the odd shape of the lot. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Five to one. And then the last one on 354, I move that we allow the variance for the square footage 
based on the odd shape of the lot. That's my motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Four to two. With apologies for the formality, we thank the board for getting all three of those voted up individually. The next case for the board's consideration is case number 363 involving the property at 1907 A and B, 9th Avenue North, a sidewalk variance case. This was heard previously at our July 19th meeting. All members present have indicated they are prepared to vote or would uh, open up its deliberation and take a motion. Okay. Um, who was missing for this case? Was that? I I think so this was a, we, you watched the tape? 363. Okay. I watched it. Okay. So yeah. discussion on this, any? I mean, I, 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 my, in, on this case, I, I, uh, so I'm, I'm, would vote for the appellant, which would make, would basically effectively keep the motion in place. I mean, it was three to one to deny the, uh, the sidewalk. Um, but I mean, so I, I, I would, I'm, in favor of the appellant's appeal, uh, I think. In, I think the eight-foot sidewalk that's already there. Um, Why don't you just make a motion? So, well, uh, my mo my motion is to approve the sidewalk variance uh, and not have the appellant pay. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? Oh, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? I. I'm having a hard time remembering this case. Could, what was, what the one, was the vote last time? It was three to one to deny, and the uh, appellant was, you know, saying it's cheaper to build the new sidewalk, but it was going to have this really strange, you know, parking paved area, then a grass strip, then mm, the new okay. sidewalk, mm -hmm. and right now it's got, okay, I on. think, a <laughs> eight foot sidewalk that is in good condition and. The appellant said, basically, well, if you make me pay, I'm going to build it because it's cheaper. But the neighbors came out and said they didn't want it. Um, they wanted to keep it like it was. And so that, anyway, that, but I get, you know, I get, I get the law. I just thought to me, I was like, where do I side? Well, I, I, I thought it was a reasonable request based on uh, the existing sidewalk and what the neighbors wanted. But, uh, but, but it was three to one opposed. Three to one to deny the appeal. Yeah. In but your motion, me, yeah, we have no input from the council person. We just, we just that was, and, and again, I, I mean, it was fresh on my mind because I just watched it. But that was why I thought, well, I don't know why you're making me, why you want me to make a motion. My motion's going to fail. <laughs> you know? We only had thirty cases, <laughs> unless <laughs> unless, I, unless it was just so compelling. What I just, you so know, persuasive. <laughs> you are. All right. So how about I make a motion Wait, to? We, well, we, we have still a have a motion, motion. Vote, unless oh, you want to second. A motion vote. hadn't failed yet. Okay. And we could vote on his motion. <laughs> Okay, so any discussion before we vote on his motion? All those in favor of his motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, you get to do a motion next. Okay, then I'll uh, move to deny the variance request. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second it. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, four to two. John Michael, Mr. Chairman, we'll begin our Board of Zoning Appeals meeting. We have a real meeting, yes. Well, very good. Well, before we begin our meeting, um, it's election day, of course, but it's also David Harper's birthday. So happy birthday and glad that you were here. Make a Thank you. Sorry you have to be here for your birthday. Can we, can we take a three-minute recess? Three-minute recess. Birthday. The birthday boy wants a recess. So. A brief break before convening with case number 252. Because I'm old. <laughs> on which you've already heard from two district council members in which the other people here on has requested a deferral of his case so that he could work with the community in order to address the issues and the concerns related to his short terminal appeal. He made that request and as you know staff grants or uh, arranges deferrals on a first request by an appellant on every short terminal case or zoning case that comes before the board every time they come forward. However, the council member is still present and other neighbors are present and they wish to oppose the request for a deferral because they're present today. Um, it's my understanding the appellant has already departed. However, that's case 291 
He has requested to defer his case to meetings to September the 6th so that he can work with the community. The board can take up consideration of whether or not to grant that deferral request and I'd be glad to answer any questions that the board may have. Is it possible, John, to hear from the opposition or to hear the neighbors' testimony so that they don't have to come back? Um, I mean, I know they take, you know, I mean, I don't. I think we should d discuss the larger issue first if we're. Oh, whether it gets deferred? Yeah. M Mr. Chairman, I would say in response to Mr. Taylor's question, which I think is going to be completely relevant in a moment, uh, if the board did not wish to grant the deferral, they could take testimony from opponents and choose to hold the public hearing open to a later date so that the appellant could then make his presentation. The board would, of course, have the opportunity to take into consideration those who have spoken today and those who speak at a later date, then give the deciding vote one way or the other on the request. Um, or, in the alternative, the board could decide to grant the deferral as requested by the appellant, a request that he has not made before, and uh, just have it set for September the 6th. You have multiple options in front of you, though, in how to proceed. So the applicant, uh, can the applicant be contacted? Well, this is a long meeting, and I'm sure. I'm not really in a position to do that while we're here, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Can I make a suggestion? Okay. They are going to be here a long time. This case is on the docket. It's on page 10. <clears throat> So I think it would be, they may not realize this now, but in their best interest to for it to be deferred and then be first on the September 6th docket um, and be heard then. And that Why not defer to the very next meeting? Why is oh, it, I thought the to, why is it to, to September? Six. That was the specific request of the appellant. Oh, we can defer it to the next meeting and then they can be heard first because they're going to be here a long time anyway. I'm just trying to talk about the practicality of it. I have a question. Okay, next meeting, yes. That's not the motion. Okay. I have a question okay. that I would like to have answered before I would vote on either way. Is it a fact, as uh, Council Member Johnson related, that the gentleman was asked or ordered to take down his listing and he refused to do that? Is that a fact? I have no experience whatsoever on the uh, refused to do so or said anything to that effect. We only have information with regard to whether or not the listing was up previously, yes, is up presently. The, the inspectors can address that if, in fact, the case is heard. Um, don't have any information with regard to what was reported. We just weren't present for the meeting, so have no reason to question anything that was presented by the council members, just we weren't present for that. I mean, you know, it, it's not unusual. I mean, this is an unusual case because it's it has such passionate... Uh, opposition, which uh, it is, you know, noted and 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 somewhat rare, and that they're all here. It is also fairly standard to, uh, you know, grant a deferral based on the applicant's request. But now, what? How long that deferral is? I know what the, I know what the applicant asked for, but whether that's appropriate or not. And I do think that that regardless of what happens, you know, we can make an exception to. Our uh, ordering of cases where the short term rentals are at the end of the docket to, to make this absolutely the very first yep. out of respect for the neighbors that have come. I also don't mind I mean, I, uh, deferring it, but I also don't mind uh, hearing from folks too if, if that's necessary. I, but I, I don't know. I'd Mr. Taylor, I like your idea to um, you know put it at the top of the docket if we do defer it but I think it's more appropriate to only defer at one meeting. They've already had a community meeting, and you know I'm not sure what more, a whole month of time would do to this case. So I think he should be ready and be ready to have this case at the next meeting at the top of the docket. Okay, then I'll make that motion to move the, this hearing to the next meeting in August and that it be heard first. And can we also let the opposition know that they are welcome to submit letters in advance of the hearing? Their, hear, their presence is not required. We do yes. review these packets up until the day of the yes. hearing. And then, um, and I don't know if, I mean, I think Council Lady Johnson is... Well, we, so we have a motion. We have a, we have so a motion, motion on that's the, with... With a friendly amendment, or yeah, well, it's just a suggestion. So, okay, is, is, we have a motion. Is there a second to that motion? Then we could have discussion. For one meeting. Okay. I just wanted to yep. see if there was if if if. Council if Johnson, a please come forward. <laughs> How much longer, and you are you going to be representing the Antioch district? I know you always will be representing the Antioch district, but well, that's officially. what he's trying to get around. I'm a 
you know, say the elephant in the room, he knows that I won't be here in September. And so that was the goal after he saw two council members. It's very rare to see two council members come up. Um, and Council Lady Virtue took her time to come to that community meeting. But more importantly, we have a lot of neighbors that came out as a result of that. And so that was what my concern was. And that, again, was another example of the disregard for the process that Council Lady Virtue had expressed. When you have no regard, he didn't come and talk to me as the council person. He saw me sitting back there. He sees all the neighbors that were at the community meeting, but he didn't get, afford us the opportunity to ask us, would we be okay with the deferral when I did the same thing at the last meeting? I afforded him that opportunity. That is a blatant disregard, um, I think, of the rules and, and the respect for everybody's time. So. I'm going to be um, accommodating again <laughs> with a one-meeting deferral because I will still be representing the district. Is the one-meeting deferral still in no, that's August? What, that's, 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 that's the motion. That's the motion, the second, okay. two weeks from today. You would be at the top of the docket. Yeah, so you could I, tell. So I want to know how many Antioch neighbors are here today in reference to this case. Okay, raise your hands. Thank you for being here, and sorry that we're not going to hear it today, but what we're going to do, we start our meetings at 1 o'clock, as you know. We're, two weeks from today, it's going to be heard, and you're going to be first or near first on the docket, so you won't have to sit okay. through. And we, we didn't vote on here. the motion? Yeah. Well, when we vote, when we vote. We won't be I here. I appreciate you all, and okay. and we're, we're in agreement with... Okay following the rules. Thank okay, <laughs> so we still have our motion to make this official. Any more discussion about this? Okay, so the motion is to defer this two weeks from today when we're back at Sunny West, not here, and um, we will hear the case near the top of the docket. At the top it was the motion. Yeah, I think John Michael likes near. Oh, just near we'll top. get it to the top if at all possible. And, yes. and to be clear, the August 16th meeting will not be at this location, but our traditional BZA home, the Sunny West Conference Center on campus uh, at 800 Second Avenue South. <laughs> Okay, so uh, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. So thank, thank you again for being here. We'll see you in a couple weeks. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the first case for the BZA's consideration today is 2018-252. This is a case that was presented to the board at a prior board meeting involving the request for a special exception for use of a kennel, the property at 1802 8th Avenue South, shown here in the aerial photography. Board has already conducted its hearing, but asked that the appellants go back, have another community meeting to address certain fact questions that the board had presented with regard to, among other things, waste management, uh, animal waste management in particular, sound prevention, and other issues related to the nearby residential zone own properties. The uh, proposed layout for the property shown here from my site visit a while back, the face of the property in the lower right-hand corner and view across the street in the upper left, the view up and down 8th Avenue South outbound in the upper, inbound on the lower, and the rear of the property presently uh, undeveloped except as a surface parking lot. Um, the appellant, Joni Elder, is represented by Mr. Uh, Dean. Again, the request is for a special exception for the use, but also a variance from one of the enumerated conditions, namely the minimum separation requirements in this, a CS zone district, for use as the kennel. As a reminder, the board always knows special exception cases, if it is found by the board that an appellant meets all of the criteria for a special exception, it is required by law that the board grant the special exception. However, in this instance, because there is a request for a variance from one of the conditions, the board would have to first find that uh, there is a hardship that gives rise to granting the variance to one of the conditions and then make the determination whether or not they've met all the other conditions before they could consider granting the special exception. Uh, forgive the overly technical legal explanation, but I think it's valuable at the front end for the benefit of our board and their consideration. Mr. Dean represents the appellant. They'll have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation, saving some of that for rebuttal if they wish. Then because there are opponents uh, present, they will have the opportunity to share 10 minutes to speak in opposition. Mr. Dean. If it please the board, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is George Dean. Joni Elders here to my right. Um, I'm here representing her on application for a special exception for the kennel. As uh, John Michael mentioned, <clears throat> there's also uh, involved in this case uh, a variance application. The board's heard this case before. Uh, uh, Ms. Elder was here without me on uh, June 21st. <clears throat> At that time, the board had a, um, a request of deferred it. Uh, the um, board requested, though, that uh, Ms. Elder 
look at several different specific questions in order to help the board make a final decision in this case. Those things involved um, hours, hours of operation, the, the number of animals that would be kept, uh, sound control, waste management. Uh, there was a question about walking the dogs and uh, some overnight care. And I'll try to come back to those five things as we go along. Um, uh, board also asked that she hold another neighborhood meeting, which was done in early July. Um, uh, the uh, original case that you heard back in uh, uh, June, uh, the proposal was to include an outdoor exercise area for the animals. Uh, during the course of uh, that meeting, uh, in kind of discussions with the board and with some of the folks who were there in opposition at that date, Ms. Elder uh, kind of retracted that and has uh, agreed not to have an outdoor exercise area uh, for the animals. Uh, this is an effort to keep down kind of noise, odor, that kind of thing. Uh, we, we still retain that uh, concession. We're, we're not uh, moving away from that. Uh, there are um, a couple of technical procedures that the special exception requires here. The, oh, and by the way, if I could just reserve two minutes, I always forget to ask for that. Uh, hopefully I won't take that long anyway, but just in case. Um, the, uh, uh, the application we would suggest meets all the requirements. Uh, the, uh, they're fairly simple for the most part. Uh, the building temperatures got to be uh, heated and air conditioned to take care of the animals. Just makes common sense. The um, floor area inside has to be impervious uh, just from the standpoint of uh, cleanliness. That would be the case uh, uh, with this property. Uh, each animal is required to have a certain amount of space inside uh, the containers that they're kept in. Uh, again, Ms. Elder will comply with all of those requirements. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, exercise here won't be outside except for there may be a few animals that won't be able to um, uh, use the restroom facilities, if you will, inside. Those will probably need to be walked. Her estimate is that that might be 2%. She's, she's looking at a total of um, uh, animals on site at something less than 100. So it might be a, uh, two or three of the animals might need to be walked from time to time. Uh, generally speaking, that would be down 8th Avenue and on the adjoining streets. Uh, one of our present, one of one of the materials we presented, by the way, had Wedgwood, and uh, my mistake should be Eighth Avenue. This property's uh, fronts on Eighth Avenue. I, uh, fresh water also pursuant to the ordinance has to be available at all time. It will be, and um, uh, on-site waste collection. That was one of the concerns both of the neighbors and the board at the last hearing. Uh, I'll just read off, but in the package that I submitted to the board, we. Uh, discuss this in some detail. And there was, again, some concern from the neighbors last time about uh, storing animal waste outside before the pickup. Uh, towards the end of that hearing, Ms. Elder agreed to store it inside, wrapped in plastic, probably in a freezer to, to minimize any odor, but it would not be stored outside except on the day when uh, pickup would be made so that um, uh, that material could be disposed of without causing uh, problems with the, with the neighbors. Uh, the, uh, there's a kind of a detailed uh, explanation of it on the uh, materials. And again, it'd be immediately picked up. Uh, the area would be cleaned immediately uh, with um, uh, a, a cleaner that would take care of the uh, uh, problems. Uh, tied in a plastic bag, uh, put in a lidded bin with a second plastic trash uh, liner. A empty the uh, trash bin at the end of each day, double bagged, and then placed in a freezer. Trash probably collected uh, uh, weekly by the um, uh, Metro cl Trash Collection. Uh, the, um, the other thing I wanted to mention before we uh, got too far down the line was that this property is zoned CS. Uh, the board made mention of this last time, but I'd like to um, <laughs> need to, ah, I see, you can't see it either. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, since this property is zoned CS, there are a lot of different kinds of activities that could take place on this property. It, it fronts, as I mentioned, on 8th Avenue. Uh, uh, CS zoning allows things like bars and nightclubs, mini markets selling beer and cigarettes, flea markets, grocery stores, liquor sales, uh, vehicular rentals, uh, many kinds of other commercial endeavors. Uh, so. When, when you look at it from the standpoint of the kinds of properties, kinds of uses that could be put onto the property, uh, this one I would suggest is, 
not the worst kind of thing that could possibly happen there. It, it, it is a commercial area. Uh, this is a commercial use of the property. Uh, Ms. Elder is trying to go out of her way to, to try to minimize the impact on the surrounding land uses. Um, the, uh, the, the variance that we're asking for has to do with the 200 foot require, distance requirement between the uh, facility itself and any existing residents. I think the nearest is, is just under 150 feet away. I'd suggest that the, the basis for the variance is essentially the idea that the, the, the house, the, the commercial structure is going to be, uh, if you will, retrofitted in order to uh, try to uh, baffle any sound uh, that would come out uh, uh, as a result of the, no the dogs being there. Um, we've submitted as part of the package a letter from a sound expert who basically says that the sound would be uh, very muffled anyway. Probably you'd get more sound from 8th Avenue than you would from the animals. But in addition to that, in, in the materials that we submitted, there are diagrams of how the walls and ceilings would be altered, re rehabbed, if you will, in order to further uh, buffer that sound so that it wouldn't cause additional problems for the neighborhood. Now the, did the the sound person that you consulted with was that based on? I don't. I don't think he took into account that. Uh, uh, so that was before. The, the, so that the, that opinion was before the additional work that you planned to do. No, no, he he, uh, he did. took into okay. account okay. Um, this this soundproofing design. I see. I'm sorry. Indeed, into the uh, number right. of calculations. And there no. And I don't. I, I don't remember seeing the side. I mean, I remember seeing the side in the back. I don't remember seeing windows. Are, are there windows in the back or the sides? I don't remember seeing those in the picture. Uh, there are windows in the front. Yeah. Um. You know, the glass doors in the back. There is. Um, I don't know what the right is. A metal back, but there's also concrete block. And yeah. You know, that that metal. Yeah, that's what um, I so thought the, I remember seeing. The perimeter of the building is different depending on the front versus okay. the back. The front's brick. Okay. And then on the, I guess the variance, the hardship for the variance, it, it relates to the noise. I mean, that I mean, if they if you don't have an outside play area, then right. The, 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 and the idea is to ch change the condition of the building. Uh, as the board knows, the, the one of the things that can be looked at. Um, there, there are actually five separate kinds of things that serve as a variance uh, 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 basis. Uh, and one of those is kind of a catch-all or, or any other condition. Uh, and really what we're trying to do is in order to, um, uh, if you will, shorten the, the uh, distance requirement from 200 to 150 feet, use the, the sound muffling that we would put into the property and we think that that condition of the property not only satisfies the statute and the ordinance, but will also give the board a basis for, for granting that variance. Obviously, the idea of the distance requirement uh, was noise control and um, uh, odor. And we think by taking the, the actions we're taking with regard to the condition of the building, that that would form a basis for the variance. So what's your hardship as far as that variance is concerned? Uh, it's really the, uh, uh, the, the hardship is the, the putting in the uh, uh, baffling itself and the condition of the property in order to do that. Putting in what? Putting, putting in the sound control measures. I'm talking about what's your hardship that you're asking for that you need a, a variance. Uh, well, and, and again, the, the hardship has to be based on the uh, condition of the property and the, the condition that I'm citing really is the uh, change in the structure of the building in order to baffle the, the But that's the a change after you your new use. That's not before. Right. So right. what is your hardship based on it as it is right now? Why do you need this? Well, I guess my reaction to that would be that it doesn't necessarily have to be before the fact. It can be after the fact in that catch-all category. Um, actually, this board had a case years ago, none of the members here were, were on the case, uh, where if, if, the viol if, if the change violates the zoning ordinance, that's, that's a, a problem as far as the use. But here, the, all we're doing is using the construction, a manner of construction of the building in order to accommodate and uh, restrict the way that the sound would travel and hold it to a lesser distance. And, and that really, from my standpoint, is the basis of the hardship. Could it, could it be a hardship that because you're not providing the outdoor play area, the requirement of 200 feet becomes less 
but certainly that important but I mean that, that you're you're basically being penalized because of an assumption you're having an outdoor play area and if you agree not to and that's part of the conditions then then that square that length of space is not needed because of it's there because of the noise and, and certainly that's another way of you know kind of approaching the same issue I think yes Mr. Dean, in your application, it says that anywhere from 50 to 100 pets will be their dogs, I guess. So uh, I, how I many? Less than 100 that's, is what that, That's I've a been big told. range. So what, what, are we, what are you asking for here? But, well, the, it, I, I don't even remember what I said actually in the letter, but it should be less than 100 was the proposal that, that I, I was given to approach the board with. And did you use that number for your sound people to come up with their assumptions? Yeah. Yes, sir. And so how many, Mr. Dean, you said that 100 or less than 100 dogs barking doesn't sound as loud as 8th Avenue. Well, it, that's based on whose word is that? Well, the, 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 the acoustics engineer who, who submitted the, the uh, materials on that. Uh, they say that 100 dogs barking is less than the sound of... Well, you know. Now, remember, we're talking about inside... I know. ...and uh, baffled with the alterations to the wall structures and the ceiling structure. I mean, it's not just a regular building at that point. It's kind of a soundproof building, if you will. How many dogs will be walked outside at one any given time? One or two at the moment. But you have yeah. 100... You might have 90 dogs in there, and you only walk one or two at a time? Because we only walk those who won't relieve themselves in the building, and we find that somewhere between 1 to 2 percent of the dogs. So it's very, it's an exception basis. We don't want to walk the dogs. Quite frankly, it's safer to keep them in the building uh, because you have to worry about, uh, you know, dogs um, not, not, not um, being in the, the environment that you can control every element. You got rain, you got snow on occasion, not as often here as other places. So um, we only walk them if the dog will not relieve itself inside. So, Mr. Dean, getting back to 200 feet, you know, you are asking for a variance because, as you know, the code says 200 feet. Why should this be allowed to have less than 200 feet? Because I think that distance was put into place because they know the impact of these kind of organs, these kind of businesses. Well, it's 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 uh, the impact of the business on on adjacent residential. And yes. I, I, obviously, that's that's why it was. And prepared. you're asking for 50 feet under what the code allows. Right. That's again, a lot. Well, and again, the uh, uh, fact that the building will be soundproofed will diminish that impact. Uh, in addition. Uh, the concession of not having the dogs exercise outside should also go a long way. The, the assumption when you read the code, uh, as Mr. Taylor noted, is that you'd have an outside exercise uh, run. In fact, it's, there's an interesting section of it that says if you've got the outside exercise run, the, can't, the homes can't be closer to 100 feet, which I don't quite understand, but it's, it's a little unusual the way it's written. But uh, because of the fact that she's not going to have an outside exercise area now and will uh, muffle the interior sounds by use of the rehabilitation of the building's walls and ceilings, uh, we'd submit that that is a reasonable basis for the board to grant the variance. Okay. Anything else to add? You have three minutes and 12 seconds left. Let me say one other thing. One of the other things that the board had, had asked about was uh, overnight care, uh, and I, I think it was said at the last meeting, but I'll mention as well that uh, staff will not be there overnight. There will be um, motion detectors and fire alarms, but staff will not be present. They usually arrive um, uh, between one and two hours before it opens, uh, stay for an hour or two after, but they will not be there overnight. Uh, again, uh, that's not an unusual situation for facilities of this type. Uh, if there's a problem, either the motion detector or the fire alarm then obviously um, uh, people would be uh, uh, advised and, and whatever needed to happen would, be, would, take, would take place. Uh, but there was a question about that, and I wanted to just uh, address that in case the board had other <coughs> issues uh, with the overnight protection. Okay. What is the length of the proposed lease, please? 
Um, we we um, we're still in negotiation on the lease. We haven't finalized, but we asked for a, a ten year lease um, because my franchise agreement is for ten years, and then an option to uh, two five year renewals. So it is a long term investment. I will be investing over seven hundred thousand dollars in the building to meet the noise requirements that we're talking about. So but it's what is your flexibility if the board? I mean granting a special exception for 10 years in, in the face of vigorous opposition from all of your neighbors, most of your neighbors, do you have flexibility for a shorter lease term? Um, I, would have a diff I would have a severe financial difficulty with that because I've got the franchise for uh, 10 years that I've already paid mm -hmm. for. I, I have to put, like I just said, a significant investment in. Okay. I'd be hard pressed to make my money return in, in a shorter lease return. And then what I would have to do is find another building right. and spend a similar amount of money to rehab it. It becomes a non viable business at that point. Okay. I think, think that's all I've got, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, let's hear from the opposition. The opposition will have 10 minutes. Total. So, the are, are we hearing the whole thing again? They're just responding to what Mr. Dean argued. Doc McDowell, 702306, Wedgwood Park, uh, speaking on behalf of the opposition first, and we have three other people to speak as well. Uh, good afternoon, members of the board and Chairman Ewing. Um, first of all, uh, I would submit to you that the applicant should not be given brownie points for giving up the right to have a dog run, something that the code would not support in any event because that puts the activity that is prohibited even closer to the existing residents. So I don't quite understand why she should be given brownie points for not doing that. But more importantly, uh, the- I don't understand that point. How, how are they closer to you? Well, if she uses a dog run at the rear of the property, that's going to put the activity, a significant amount of the activity of the dogs closer to existing residents. So she's given that up for her benefit. Now, but let me address the main issue here. And the main issue here, it strikes me, is that um, the, the section of the, uh, the standard for variance relied upon by the applicant is or other extraordinary and exceptional conditions of such property. Uh, soundproofing does not relate to the property, the fee simple. Uh, uh, the terra uh, uh, firma, the land. That relates to the building. Um, modifications to the building do not relate to the land. As I heard earlier, uh, Chairman Ewing talking about the shape of the property as a possible basis for uh, a variance. The narrowness of the property that is in the physical characteristics of the property section of the uh, standard for variance, uh, that has not been cited by the applicant. Rather, the things cited relate to the building, not the property. So it should not qualify for a hardship on that basis alone. The investment of money that she has uh, spent is not a basis for a hardship. In fact, you have one category that says the hardship should not be self-imposed. That certainly is self-imposed, and financial gain is not the only basis. Here, this is not a not-for-profit business. It's not being put in place for altruistic reasons. It's being put in place to make a profit. Uh, so you have three of the categories that she does not meet. Uh, I would also submit to you um, that the distance between 1802 property site, the senior citizen building on Argyle, and the alleyway between the uh, properties, that's distance. That is not something unique to the land. Uh, in other words, the building was there being used as a retail business prior to these particular uh, things that she is seeking. The, uh, variants for. So I don't, I would submit to you that the facts do not support the granting of a uh, variance for that reason. I also want to address this dog run issue that um, sh she has indicated in a previous uh, appearance before the, uh, my time is running out, uh, before the board, that the green space between the two buildings is going to be used for dog activities. <clears throat> that would put the dog run 
ostensibly that's going to be used as a dog run, that green space between the two buildings. She wants to use that uh, as a exercise area for the dogs. Yeah, I, I, I remember the testimony on that. I think I remember the testimony was that that there was a relative or somebody that, that owned her building that she's wanting to rent that owned the building next to it that had the green space and that if she were to walk the dogs to go outside that they could go outside in the green space and that was in that was in uh, countered to the testimony I think by some of the opposition that said they were going to be walking the dogs up and down the street and down the alleys and I think she said well no we'll just I'm just let them go to the bathroom next door I'm not going to walk them far but it was never I don't remember the testimony ever being that this is a play area, I'm gonna take them out. It was just, hey, I'm gonna take them out here Oops. to use the bathroom. I don't know if you may have heard something different, but that's what I remember hearing. Well, that's a, may I speak now? Yeah. That's exactly my point, is that circumvents the requirement for requirements for the dog run, and more importantly, it will put that space 100 feet away from the existing residence at the corner of Argyle uh, and 8th. Uh, my time is up at this point. I hope yeah. you will deny the request. And, Okay. And, Questions and, for no, this I do have a question, and, and just the, uh, you know, and, and again, we, we we don't. There's an awful lot of opposition that's been mentioned, um, and and that is something this board absolutely pays attention to and, and has respect for. When I read the letters, and when I looked over the letters again before the the case, they almost all talked about. And I remember some of you uh, being mostly concerned when you when we first heard this case, talking about noise and odor. And it seems like, and, and I'll, I'll throw this out there, I just want to hear what you have to say, and you may not agree, um, and I'm trying to form my own opinion, but it seems like the applicant's done an awful lot of work to address noise and odor. And, you know, I guess the question is, where are your, where are your concerns still? And you, it, did that satisfy you? And if not, uh, why not? We'll let Mark, uh, okay. Chris, I appreciate the time. My name is Mark Scottline. I live at 110 Duke Street in Nashville. I come before you in kind of a unique position. I actually owned and operated possibly the most successful dog daycare franchise in Nashville for the last decade. At this point, I've sold that business. I don't know the applicant. I don't necessarily know the opposition. And I literally come to you as an expert. In the previous meetings, the board indicated that it needed some expert opinion as far as odor control, sound control. What does the future of this look like? And I'm in the position to actually sketch out exactly what this looks like in the future, having been through this. Can you tell me what the, t tell, tell us what dog, Tell us sure. I, for the first several years, I operated what was Dogtopia on 1315 8th Avenue South and became Southpaws, uh, and then I sold that at the very beginning of 2017. Okay. Uh, I'd like to touch on a couple of things that weren't touched on that you at least are worth considering in this board, and no one would really know unless you've cared for 90 dogs a day for 10 years. Uh, safety, dogs generally escape. That's what they do for a living, whether it's from a client's car pulling into the <laughs> whether it's from a client's car pulling into the facility or whether they're slipping through an open door when someone walks in. In this instance, they're escaping onto 8th Avenue South, which is the busiest arterial in the city of Nashville. So whether it's a dog hit by a car, a person chasing that dog, or two cars wrecking because they're trying to avoid that, I think that that's something that the council should really consider because in, in an extensive experience, that's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And was that an issue at your facility for the last decade? Absolutely, because no amount of signage, whether it's you can't drive 65 miles an hour or above, and how did you address or wear that? a leash, is going to tell people, people yes, are going to ignore it. How did you address that? But we don't face 8th Avenue South. My, into, my hmm. former back parking lot is actually enclosed. Hmm. Okay, so a fence is how you address that. That is correct. Okay. Uh, we, we do have, we did, sorry, old habit. Uh, the facility had a door facing 8th Avenue South, which is welded shut. So everything had to go into the back parking lot, which faced exactly away from 8th Avenue South. Um, and additionally, I would submit this as a question, and I don't know where the board's authority is on this, and this is literally just a question and might not be something that you would consider or, or have knowledge of. And that is the question of the amount of traffic impact that this will have. So as a general rule, I understand it that there's six non-handicapped spaces at the front of this building. At any given time during peak rush hour, you're going to have between 8 and 15 cars show up at the same time to pick up or drop off. With six spaces, that means people are going to have to wait. The average transaction time inside that facility is going to be between 2 and 15 minutes. Uh, so what you're going to wind up with is a bit of a backup right there on 8th. And, and when I went through all this originally in 2008, there were 35,000 cars 
a day going on 8th Avenue South. I doubt that number's gone down. I'd also like to address noise issues. I'd be happy to address if you guys have questions along that side. And then finally, cleaning procedures and odor management. At, <clears throat> at the previous meeting, it was somehow suggested that I didn't, I, I wouldn't be considered an expert. I would say that on this. And I'm not sure where that comment came from. I'm not sure what that was based on. But I'm certainly an expert in the issue of, in, in fact, sadly, I would say I'm an expert in the subject of dog waste. And uh, I'd be happy to address any issues, because obviously some, a variety of different subjects have come up and ways to manage that. And I'd be happy to address any issues you guys have on odor control. <laughs> Uh, dog waste well, so, in general. Okay. The um, applicant said that most of the dogs, I think 98% of the dogs, will do their business inside. Is that true? <laughs> to, to expand on that, uh, there are facilities in that franchise that, or at least I know of one facility in that franchise that does not have an outdoor space. Uh, we did have an outdoor space, and so I, I can't answer that. It specifically, but let me say this, having had an outdoor space, there are dogs that need to be walked outside and that's not a large number. The applicant is absolutely correct in that, in that instance. That said, we had an outdoor space. The majority of dogs go out there. So I, I so can't- Out of your dogs, how many did you take outside to just go to the bathroom? Maybe a couple on any given month. Uh, meaning, uh, you know, we have a lot of repeat customers and so I, I'd say if we, we average about 90 dogs a day and I'd say probably one or two dogs a day. Okay. Yeah, that's um, what she so, said. Right, but again, we we did have an outdoor space, and all the dogs go out there several times throughout the day. All right, so, I mean, and, you know, the way I'm kind of looking at this right now, this is a commercial building that uh, the Planning Commission has evaluated and said, uh, if it weren't for that 150 feet, uh, if it had been 50 feet further from any residence, we wouldn't be here. Um, that building on 8th Avenue would be uh, a, a kennel, most likely, based on the Planning Commission's recommendation and, and and what they have a right to do in that property. And so I'm more concerned with that 150 feet and whether or not we grant the variance. Um, and I'd like to have your thoughts on noise, uh, particularly the noise that would come from, you know, inside that well-insulated enclosed building to the people behind the building because those are the that's where the residences are in my experience and, and dog noise isn't a static issue and so it, it isn't a constant throughout the day it, or there are peaks and valleys to it and uh previously it was stated that larger dogs make more noise and i i, I would submit that that's not accurate it, smaller dogs actually make substantially more dog more noise than larger dogs small and since children make more, more noise than right. big big people um, but my my point there is that i think the applicant is right anywhere where there's brick and mortar and it's been reinforced with soundproofing that'll do an excellent job of soundproofing anywhere there where there is glass soundproofing will prove ineffective uh, regardless of what the study tells you, I've sat there and listened to it. Well, so, I mean, I guess that's what I'm trying to figure out is, is how, you know, I mean, it is, it's, I'm thinking, gosh, if, you know, there are hundred and something people in here, if we all screamed real loud, would they hear us outside? And if that, if that's the case, and does it matter that we're all screaming in here? I mean, I, I you know, that, that is the, the, to me, it's, it's, this issue comes down to the nuisance of the folks that live 150 feet rather than 200 feet. And we've had kennel cases before where folks were within the 200, I mean, they had the 200 feet, but they had an outdoor space and, and the neighbor said, man, it keeps us up at night. You know, they had 600 feet and, and they kept them up at night, but this is, this is less feet, but they're all inside. So I guess I'm... Well, I would say this, the, the, the issue that in my opinion, you're likely to run into is not necessarily that during the operation, although there will be peaks and valleys during that where the neighbors possibly can hear it, but probably not to irritating levels. The nights is where you run into problems because the dogs are essentially going to be asleep in their cages or kennels or what have you. And then an ambulance is going to, I spent 10 years on 8th Avenue South, an ambulance is going to go by. A dog's going to wake up and start screaming. Everybody that has dogs know that every dog is going to wake up and start screaming. There are no motion detectors that can alert you to that. There are no sound systems that can alert you. And to that. that's the but middle of the night when correct. people are sleeping. And they are going to sit there and scream until they stop. But again, if they, again, they can bark all they want to inside. What will people hear outside? That's what, based on your experience, what do people hear outside? 150 feet at 11 at night, if the whole kennel's going off, they'll hear it. I, I can't speak to whether it will annoy them. That's an individual preference, uh, preference, but they'd hear it. You'd hear it 150 feet away from my building, certainly. Now, the soundproofing is, is 
I assume their franchise has even better soundproofing than in my day. But, uh, you know, if it's 100 dogs and it's 11 at night when there's not a lot of other noise going on out there, you know, that's going to be tough. Uh, you know, the, the issue with noise during the day is, unlike like a yoga studio, which seems to be the popular thing to open on 8th, uh, this, um, a, a dog business is subject to the requirements of the clientele. So it's going to be busy at 8, it's going to be busy at 5, as far as noise goes. And then it's going to be busy if they wake up in the middle of the night. Other questions for this particular person in opposition? Okay, next person. My name is Linda Hartman. I live at 702 Wedgwood Park. I'm, um, I represent, there are 198 close by residents to this facility, this building. I represent 185 of them. That is 94%. The other 6% are neutral. We're not interested in having a dog kennel next to us. We feel that it impinges on our quiet enjoyment of our homes. <clears throat> Excuse me. We feel like it will lower our property values. When we, when we went to one of the meetings, the neighborhood meetings, um, Ms. Elder's partners asked me who I had as um, document or what documentation I had of it lowering my property values. What I can tell you is that if I were buying a house, particularly the house that some of the homes butting up to it are over well over four hundred thousand, and the ones on the corner of Eighth and Argyle are six and above. Those people are part of the 185 residences that don't want this kennel. If I were buying now and saw that there was a kennel there, I wouldn't buy it. The other thing about the waste, I went to a kennel and I got what I considered a good distance away from the dumpster and it was like death warmed over. It smelled so bad. And I saw one of the um, employees there and they said they wouldn't even park their car near it because it smelled so bad. When, if you have that, all that smell wafting down the alleyway, which we all walk our dogs, you're not gonna be able to walk there. Ms. Elder also said at that meeting that she would not walk dogs in the neighborhood. She said she'd only walk them in that little green space. And um, she changes the story every time we get questions. And we, this is the fourth time we've been here. And the only rules that she has abided by are the ones that you have in, you forced her to go back and get have another meeting go back and do this go get this that does not show me somebody who has intent of following the rules somebody who has um i mean it's like even today she's parked in a reserve parking spot i mean this just shows contempt for for the rules um, yeah, I see that. Okay. Um, she has said that, um, or I am saying that the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior, and her behavior has been that she's going to say whatever you want them to say and then do what she wants to do. Thank you. Uh, one final comment, members of the uh, BZA. Uh, the, the, the ordinance in question was passed for a reason, and I submit to you that one of the reasons was that they took into account, they took into account the 200 rule, I mean 200 feet rule, and the purpose of that was to eliminate, to prevent this type of infringement in business from being located so close to uh, residential, uh, uh, existing residences. Finally, there's a question as to whether she has standing because she's not a leasee, uh, she does not own the property, and the property owner is not a party to these proceedings. Thank you.
Okay. Last person. Oh, so any questions? We're out of time. Before you all go, questions. We have questions. The former kennel owner, I want to ask about the um, amount of waste that is generated by 100 dogs in a day and how do you deal with that? Sure you want the microphone for that answer? No. Um, that's not an insignificant amount of waste. Um, so say that box is one kind of unit, the, the green box over here. How many of those green boxes would be filled with 100 pets waste? I think it would be day. better to, to use this scale, and, and I mean this, in terms of dumpsters. Okay. Um, I mean a whole regular size dumpster? Fill up a dumpster once to twice a week. Wow. Um, I, it's what dogs do on so, average three times but I a guess day. To, <laughs> yeah. So to me, to me the, the, the important question I'm thinking about is, you know, um, the, the lady, I'm sorry, you, and I don't remember your name, and I apologize for that. Uh, it talked about you know being in another kennel where there was just really horrible odor, and you owned a kennel. Did you have horrible odor at your kennel? Were you able? I don't to think so. It was the, one of the busiest places in the city. So were you Were you able to control the odor? I, I didn't. Oh, in the dumpster? No, yeah. Were you able to control the odor in your in your business? Inside the facility, yes. In no. the dumpster, I, you have to understand. And this is not meant to sound condescending. Plastic bags are actually made of essentially polyethylene, and it is designed to allow gas to pass through it. So you can wrap something in a plastic bag with four different plastic bags. There's a reason biohazard suits aren't six trash bags thick. It's a different material, because the number of plastic bags is not going to stop the gas from getting out. There's very little you can do in that instance to- So your dumps are stinked. Of course it did. Um, right. Which is why, in that instance, it Thanks. was in the middle of nowhere. I, it was a hundred and something feet away from the building, which was another hundred feet away from everything else. Okay. Uh, so you put your dumpster purposely a hundred feet away from your building. A absolutely. Um, it, yes. Uh, it's, there's just not much you can, it, it's not a sanitary, I guess byproduct would be the right word. It's not a sanitary byproduct. Uh, somebody mentioned something about freezing it and I, I can't speak to that. I've never, I, I've never heard of that before, and I know probably 50 different kennel owners. So um, a kennel with 100 dogs, what's the greater nuisance, the noise or the smell of the waste? It, in this specific instance, uh, if you're an alley walker, you would say the alley, the smell. If, if it's close to the alleyway, you would, that, that alley would, that area would be almost, I mean, it'd be unpleasant to walk down. Um, the noise is an individual taste thing. It really is, and it's going to depend on... Like the 4th of July, for the first five years, we went up there every 4th of July until 2 in the morning. Fireworks set dogs off. So, uh, sirens. sirens. And well, but the 4th of July is particularly bad. And so, uh, in this instance, smell would be the dominating factor as far as the alleyway goes. Uh, and noise is just a factor when it's a factor. There's really no way to predict it except <sighs> that it's going to happen. You talked about at the beginning that dogs escape. I mean, is that really a common yeah, problem? Yeah, that's a legitimate problem. And, and, and one that I, I don't know where you sit in the position of putting the city and the, and the traffic issues in this position, but like a, you can't, Sammy Hagar can't drive 55, nobody, you know, people generally ignore posted speed limits to some degree. And you can post signs that say your dog can't be off leash, but whether your dog escapes as you open the door to leash him or it's an off-leash facility. Dogs oh, so, are walking around. So sometimes it could be the actual person who picks up and drops off as the offender. A actually, how the more dog often gets than not, that is the case. You all um, are a little bit more careful. That's what your business is. But if you've but got a dog behind just... the counter and it's wandering around, which happens a lot, and because you're dog people, and somebody opens the door that doesn't know there's a loose dog in there, uh, you're chasing dogs. Um, and... and my concern, if I were in this position, would essentially be that they've got one way to go, and that is 8th Avenue, and that is not an unbusy road. And that's a lot of negatives in one sentence. Questions <laughs> of the opposition? Okay, thank you. We're, we're going to hear from the applicant again. Rebuttal time. We have about three minutes and 14 seconds, I think. Okay, Mr. Dean, this is rebuttal time. Please respond to what you heard from the opposition. Yeah, just just a, a couple of points, and, and we'll turn it over to the board. Uh, oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, as to the uh, variance, I, I would 
uh, you know, argue that we meet the conditions for a variance. Uh, we've, we've talked about uh, the uh, 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 catch-all factor that's in both the ordinance and the statute. In addition, there are a couple of other things that usually uh, uh, are in the variance requirement, self-created hardship. Um, uh, my client, nor did any predecessor in her uh, line of title, have uh, anything to do with where the uh, residential buildings got put up here. It was out, out of their control. It's not a self-created hardship in any way whatsoever. If you check the consistency of the general plan or the sub-area plans, community plans, uh, this is exactly the kind of thing, uh, uh, a, uh, a commercial endeavor that's actually uh, called for on the general plans. So really not <coughs> um, from the variance standpoint, I, th I think we meet all the requirements. Um, I would mention as to the traffic impact, I don't know <laughs> what you do uh, with the, um, uh, the ability of the dogs to escape. I, that, uh, certainly nobody wants that to happen. Uh, I, I don't even know how to respond to that. I would say that uh, 8th Avenue is a busy highway. Uh, one of the reasons commercial endeavors are allowed in those areas uh, remember, one of the other things is allowed is, is a bar. Uh, people coming out of bars tend to have a little bit too much to drink. They also have to go out on 8th Avenue. Um, uh, the, the traffic issue, it seems to me, was looked at by the Metropolitan Council when they passed the zoning ordinance and allowed this kind of use by uh, decision of the board. Uh, same thing, I'd make mention of the property values. Uh, every time I'm at the board, there's a question about whether or not the property values are driven down by the proposed use. It's very rare that we have anybody who actually has any expertise in that area. Uh, there was no expertise here. Uh, really, in, in order to board, for the board to rely on that, you need somebody who has a degree or some experience in making those kinds of judgments. As a matter of fact, most of the property in Davidson County, as probably everybody on the board knows, has been going straight up the last 10 or 15 years. And I dare say the same has been happening on 8th Avenue. So we believe we meet all the requirements. Uh, we've tried to uh, tailor the application to meet some of the, re the objections by taking away the outdoor. There won't be a dog run. There won't be outdoor exercise, except for the very small percentage of the animals who may need uh, that to um, uh, use the restroom facilities outside, uh, but those should be a small percentage. And secondly, by uh, putting in the uh, soundproofing, uh, uh, thank you very much for your um, consideration. Okay, Mr. any Dean? questions yeah. for Mr. Dean? Well, you know, I, I, th I think I've, my thoughts on the variants are starting to gel, but there's this thoughts on the special exception. Um, and I mean, I know the Planning Commission recommended it, but I know there's also um, an element of a special exception that talks about neighborhood impact or, or impact of certainly, and you know th this is a case where you know I, I can't recall a case that had as much opposition, you know, it, uh, letters and emails and that type of thing, and uh, and we we have a pretty thick stack, and and at the same time I'd, I'd have a lot of respect for the applicant and the effort that she's done to address some of those issues. So could you talk about how you think we should think about um, the impact on the neighborhood in light of the substantial stack of, of neighbors who say they don't want it. Uh, part of my problem with special exceptions always is that people have a lot of respect for the neighbors. Uh, uh, there's, there's always uh, uh, a, a fear factor of something that's not there. It's a new thing coming in. Um, uh, People have a uh, uh, preconceived idea how it'll, how it'll operate, uh, and so it makes it makes it harder. And those are le legitimate fears. I'm not trying to, to denigrate those in any way, uh, but customarily, if the um, uh, requirements of the uh, uh, ordinance are met, usually those kinds of, of fears and, and uh, observations aren't usually enough to offset compliance with with the requirements. Um, uh, again, uh, possibly one way of looking at it is to, um, if the board was willing to grant the special exception, uh, to, to limit the um, uh, time frame I, uh, uh, to, to three or four years or something, have us come back. Of course, there's always the possibility that, that um, uh, it might come back even sooner in any event, but, but that might be one way to balance the two concerns involved in the process. I'd like to make one additional comment with regard to that. Um, I, at both of the um, neighborhood meetings that I held, um, made an offer 
to uh, the folks in opposition. There were very few people who showed up at the meetings of seven and one, and um, even fewer in the next. So I understand a lot of letters, um, form letters were signed. Um, but I have another facility, and I've invited, I think a lot of this is fear of the unknown because they don't know what they're going to get, and they're thinking in their mind, it's a kennel with an outdoor runs, and dogs are going to be barking. And I, I, I really feel like if they would have taken me up on my offer to come see the property that I have and the, the level of soundproofing and the quality and care that's gone into the care of the dogs and, and making, um, acu you know, making it work for the neighborhood that they might feel different, very differently. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? Thank you. We're going to close the public hearing. Uh, John Michael, can you, um, this is kind of a hybrid, so walk us through this again about the variance and then the special exception and what's the standard that we are here to um, look at in deliberation. Prudent for the board because you have a variance request to take up the consideration of the variance question first because the variance is from one of the conditions that is considered part of the requirements for the special exception. If that variance is not granted, it is tantamount to an admission by the board that you do not think they meet the conditions, which does not necessarily moot the special exception vote, but makes its outcome obvious. So it's wise for the board to take up the variance first. Of course, the requirement to grant a variance for the board is to find a hardship associated with the land, as outlined in both the zoning code and touched upon in state law as well. So if the board determines that there is an appropriate hardship, that would be a basis by which the board could grant the variance at which point the board would then take up the question of the special exception and determine first whether you think they definitely meet all the requirements under the general requirements for special exceptions, which is found in the zoning code at, I believe, 17.16.150. It enumerates those general standards. And then the specific standards for special exceptions specific to a kennel in this commercial use, I think that's 17.16.175A, uh, and that's enumerated in your packet as well. And I think uh, Mr. Dean's brief probably talks about some of the particulars of those standards. So. Short version, take up the variance first, vote on the special exception. But there is, there is a, a condition. I mean, the, the fiscal characteristics of the land are, are an important part of, uh, of a variance, but it also, there is the, the catch-all that I think Mr. Dean had mentioned, too, that, that uh, this might fall uh, more specifically in than, um, than the fiscal characteristics, which are a, a square Right, plot. square piece of land in the middle of town, sure. But I know that, that there may be folks listening, and I, and I don't remember exactly what they are, but I know that they basically say if, that if the specifics of this case and this property negate the requirement, that that's, I think, a reason to... You've got the right idea, and that's uh, touched upon under state law in particular at Tennessee Code Annotated 13.7. Uh, I don't remember the specific subsection number, but it talks about the standards by which a variance could be granted by a Board of Zoning Appeals, and the idea is other exceptional circumstances. Here, you're right. You're not talking about an unusual shape of the lot, as we typically don't regard rectangles as particularly unusual. Um, you're not talking about 100-year-old trees you're trying to save on the back end of the lot, uh, a creek running through the middle of the property, anything like that. So if the board was going to find a hardship, it would almost definitely be under that state law provision that talks about other exceptional circumstances, whatever those may be. So you're right that that's probably where the board's consideration is heading on that yes, no question. Okay. Okay, board members, deliberation. I've disclosed this before, but I want to disclose again before our deliberation that I am well acquainted with the owner of this parcel of property and her family. I do not see that it affects my decision making. And the owner technically is not an applicant to this proceeding. Right. It's the renter. Okay. Okay. Well, this is not the only kennel case or special exception case that we're going to hear today. Uh, and we've we've had this applicant in front of us several times, and I do think she has made great effort to address the concerns of the nearby property owners. And I want to discuss it with my colleagues, but while I understand Mr. Dean's argument that the restriction of uh, distance it really is to deal with the sound 
and by having the location indoors that addresses that concern I do not feel that that really meets the catch-all other exceptional circumstance or I'm leaning that direction and even if we were to get to the special exception part of this it is hard for me in the face of this much opposition and, and valid opposition uh, potentially that how can the public health safety and welfare be protected if this many people that are nearby are do not want this even in light of the fact you know a liquor store or a nightclub may create a whole nother host of problems uh, that's not you know it's not our job to say you could have something worse well I, I don't know that opposition necessarily proves uh, danger or harm potential danger or harm to health safety or anything else it just means they don't want it I, well they're talking about sound and smell and well okay on the on, well we're talking about for a moment let's say the the variance and you know sound diminishes exponentially as as it travels so the difference between 100 you know from the source of the sound if you're 150 feet away from that sound uh, whatever volume that is you know it's going to be less than half at 200 feet I mean it diminishes that quickly it's probably even more given the atmospheric conditions and so on smell works in a similar way because it's it's dissipating as it as it moves away from the source so I mean and, and it's it's ironic that people would say that you know they don't want to smell dog waste while they're walking their dog down the alley making dog waste. Right. <laughs> but to me, the difference is one individual dog waste versus a dumpster full every f three or four days. Yeah. That's a lot. I'm also concerned that this is not the property owner, and it's somebody that's pursuing a 10-year lease, and council did indicate they would be willing to potentially come back in a shorter time but we have traditionally, in other matters where noise was an issue, looked at special exceptions on a much shorter basis so that the neighbors had the opportunity to really see uh, and experience what was going to happen with the use. Just I, I just, I have a really hard time buying the opposition specifically on the sound. I, well, the sound, I agree I, with you more I, than I the feel, smell. I feel like the the sound abatement is more than adequate and and I, I would agree I think that the traffic noise just the drone of the traffic noise will be okay. far but like getting pleasant. back to the variance what is the hardship related to the land to be less than 200 feet away from these residents well I, I don't I, buy the argument that this fits under the catch-all because if that be the case every single case that we hear here you could just throw under the catch-all well I just I disagree with that but well, what's the real compelling reason that you would I think the compelling reason the, is that that an outdoor play area is an assumption of a kennel uh, and therefore the 200 feet was meant to uh, to help accommodate the the noise issue with an outdoor play area if you don't have the play area I think the fact that you take away the play area uh, creates uh, you know that type of element that would fall into the catch-all that says you know you don't have to be as far I mean we've all gone down you know Second Avenue and Broadway and we and we see well insulated new places where you can't hear the band inside and we hear some that you can hear every word that's spoken and and I think this the insult to me I agree with Mr. Harper that 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 the, I think that the applicant has done what they need to do on the on the insulation part. I mean, I'm having less trouble with the variance uh, from noise, especially now I, I, the the odor. Um, you well, know, I think that it's been addressed. We can talk about some more. I have less issue with the the variance where I'm. I haven't been convinced yet is is the special exception in terms of neighborhood impact and in really understanding that. But well, getting back to the variance, what I don't agree related to that is you know. You say that the law says normally this is for indoors and outdoors. We don't get to play legislature. The, you know, that's what the laws say. If they wanted to change the laws, they could change it. So we can't assume that, okay, just because it was 
outdoors and now it's not, then they get more feet. Well, we, we've turned down kennels before that had 200 feet, well, but, like, but, but, but the neighbors complained about the noise and it the, had neighborhood impact. But that's so. not a reason to kind of use that catch-all category just because we think that's what the legislature in passing these laws thought. You know, to me, I have not received a good reason for a variance to be less than 200 feet of property. And that's fair enough. I mean, I just, I, 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 I have a different view on it, but I, 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 it's fair enough. I mean, I, I can see it. I mean, I, I was hoping y'all would decide this case in July while I was gone. <laughs> <laughs> Tried. You know. <laughs> I tend to agree with you, David, that um, I think the Ms. Elder wanted to have that outdoor space and was willing to give that up, which I think is a substantial um, concession on her part. Um, so I guess... I kind of agree with you. You know, I mean, I, I, and I, I get, I get the neighbors not wanting a kennel. I, I, I get it now. If I live close by and I had a dog, I might be thrilled it was there, especially if I didn't hear it at night, because it'd be very convenient. Um, I don't have a dog, but um, so you know, maybe <laughs> I should recuse myself. I don't, I don't really understand. Well, I issue, had a dog. I had a dog, and I lived close to Murphy Road Animal Hospital, which is in Sylvan Park, in the heart of Sylvan Park, with residents very close in proximity and I would walk my dog um, past that and gosh I don't remember any odors from dumpsters for the dog waste but do they board dogs there? yeah, yeah my dog would board there often and um, he did not try to escape although he was an escape artist um, so it's not unusual for kennels to be in neighborhoods and um, well go ahead no I, I, I agree and I would like to say that you know the opposition odor argument has has been anecdotal and and uh, predictive, where the appellant uh, evidence given has been specific, uh, a specific process and and uh, procedure has been laid out, which you know can certainly be a part of this uh, this granting of the special exception. So I mean. And the uh, same with the noise, actually. You know, but there's, I don't there's think it's no as anecdotal as you think. This one of the people in the opposition owned a dog kennel well, less was, than a fourth of a mile but what and was talked his? about the hundred feet away and the smell. We don't know what sound abatement was used in his I'm facility. not talking about the sound. I'm talking about the smell, the odor. Well, it, he didn't and mention how his odor was handled either. He, well, he, he just said he just said never, heard of, just, he never heard of freezing. Well, let me, let me ask you this. Does it, would it, if, if that dumpster were more than 200 feet from... You know, at any residents would that impact? You know, I mean, we're we're talking about the, you know, the the lower right corner in the picture is the offending, you know, 50 feet. If the dumpster's not within but, 200 but feet, but as you can see matter? at the top of the picture, that looks like there's some residents too. So if you move it away from the those condos, apartments, you're going to hit those other houses. I thought that was the house that was owned by the applicant or the, the property owners. In question, sister or whatnot. That's oh, I'm yeah. talking about the top right-hand corner. We can require oh. them to to deal with the waste. I think we have authority to have them deal with that in certain times. And but it's still got to go outside, and probably for hours and hours, it's probably like waiting on the cable person. They don't pick up just at 10 o'clock on this particular day. You got to just leave it out there, and whenever they get to it, they get to it. Well, I want to note what Mr. Harper said about um, the evidence that's been presented. A gen the gentleman who said he had uh, he just sold a dog kennel did not claim to be an expert, nor was he presented as an expert. And I want to reiterate that I heard him say he had never heard of freezing waste. And that's what Dogtopia is proposing to do. So I'm kind of, I'm very persuaded by that. This is like a Facebook discussion in person, so we're much more civil. <laughs> I feel like I'm using the same arguments I use on Facebook discussions about stuff. It's like, well, that's not really evidence. Well, maybe it is. <laughs> I guess, so in part, what it comes down to for me, though, this is a special exception as opposed to a variance. I would probably feel different if it were a landowner, whereas we have somebody with a lease, and to me, that is a component that and maybe it shouldn't, I'll say that openly. Maybe that shouldn't factor into the decision, but for me, it does. So, so would, would you be inclined to put a limit on a special exception as a lease? I mean, five years or 10 years, or you, 
I think that's too long. I mean, normally we would do like two or three if this was. Yeah, coming. that. I mean, if it, the, ideally it's a historic home that we can say, yeah, come back in a year. You're not really right. making a, an enormous capital investment, and well, sometimes and, you are. I mean, well, sometimes, but I mean, but not. You know, th there wouldn't be an another use. I mean, you you convert this to a dog a dog kennel, and a year from now you're not a good neighbor, and. I mean, you know, I mean, it, and there is but a then franchise. maybe you're a good neighbor because you know you're going to come back in a year. But that's what happened to the one down the street. They had a dog topia and they lost it. I mean, it, those kind of things happen. I, I think uh, to Cynthia's comment, I, I, I think it's they are a, a leasee, but there, there's the added not governance, but pressure of the of the franchise intact. So it's not exactly. So you all believe in this franchise model and the freezing and all that. Would you be willing to stipulate that as long as they keep this particular franchise with these rules and levels, but if they lost the Dogtopia franchise, then they don't have the special yes. exception? Yes. yes. Okay. Well, as a, as a condition, I mean, to me, I, w I would be inclined. I mean, that's, that's a perfectly fine condition, and even a length of time is something that, you know, I mean, I mean, I, I think I, I think that's I think that's brilliant what you, you just said. But I think if you, you know, I think gi giving giving the name if if we go with this and say that this is something that we are allowing, I think we also have to. I don't think we don't have to. I would <laughs> hope that we would uh, define those things that would empower the neighbors to be able to come back to us and say, this isn't happening like we said it was. But how do you do that if it's so quote unquote subjective? Oh, I was walking my dog and it really smelled yeah, bad. That's true. Uh, I mean, at least with sound, you know, you can get sound recordings. Well, that's what I think. It was sound more than than the than the odor piece. I mean, I. But you know, what about that ambulance that passes by, or fireworks, or some weird something going on Eighth Avenue that wakes everybody up in the all the dogs start barking at once. I mean, on that argument, we're talking about a condominium. I mean, all those dogs are going to hear the ambulance. And I didn't hear anybody say, well, that happens in our condominium every night. I mean... Now, are you more I, likely to hear the dog next door in the condo than right, you are I think, across the street, I mean, I, across I the think alley? The night is a concern to me also because we know we're not going to have an owner there. Uh, and so I think that's a legitimate argument to be made, although it's not been proven to be a real issue in this location. Well, I was persuaded by the letter that we got from the professional that is presented as an, uh, yeah. an authority on acoustics and, and soundproofing, so I was persuaded by that letter that we had. I agree. Okay. So does uh, anyone have an attempt at a motion? David. I can see David Taylor does. <laughs> I'm not doing it. It's my birthday. What do you think? Oh, that's true. That is so true. <laughs> well, okay. So, so we, let's 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 attack the, the variance first. Yeah. Um, I'll I'll move that we we grant the variance on the distance uh, and. We find that the hardship is the uh, unique characteristics of the property, and I will note that uh, much effort has gone into the mitigation uh, and documented, and will be a part of any subsequent uh, issuance of special exception for mitigating the uh, sound transmission and the odor transmission from the property. Okay. Then, would you? Um, Um, take an amendment because I don't know that the special exception I don't know how the special exception will go it may or may not pass if it doesn't pass then the variances uh, will hold and will you uh, take an amendment that uh, for uh, that this exception is for a dogtopia um, is, is for this applicant how about we can do that we're looking at John Michael we can do that okay okay so is that so? Motion has been made, and is that your second? And I would oh, I would be glad to second. Okay. Um, and discussion. I'll I'll just say, I don't believe in the hardship because there are no unique characteristics of this property. Any more discussion? Uh, seeing none. All those in favor of this motion signify by saying aye and hands up. Aye. Opposed. 
four two passes. Next motion. I did my bit. It's my birthday. Now I, I do think that the special exception has a harder uh, a harder path. I mean, I, I, I do think that 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 your comments about uh, you know, maybe community impact and and that matter there, um, but. I'm willing to listen to others. You know, there was overwhelming opposition and really hardly anybody supporting this. And that's the point of a special exception and having community meetings and going round and round is you've got to build consensus and you've got to kind of prove to this that's part of the process. And that's why the council made this kind of a very community driven uh, procedure. Well, and there was testimony that wasn't. Um, Disputed, although we didn't ask specifically uh, to dispute it, um, that the community, you know, there were two community meetings. It's been, you know, it's certainly been on the plate. Certainly a lot of people have, have signed um, letters, and that is very much respected. But, you know, they, they were not well attended community meetings. And so. Well, one was on like a hot Father's Day or whatever. Well, but the second one was less well attended. But we have all these letters. Mm -hmm. Well, they're form exactly. letters. And, and I don't see a, a passionate, you know, um, I don't see people taking the time to go to a meeting to write their own letter. It's easy to sign a form letter. And I'm not as persuaded, and especially since I'm not hearing a council member here saying. Uh, well, I mean, I'm looking at, there are at least five or six unique letters just in this one little part that are just totally, you know, somebody saying, I'm writing in strong opposition to the proposed kennel on 8th Avenue. And they conclude, please imagine if this were your homes being considered next to a dog kennel. Next letter says, please don't approve the dog kennel being proposed for a PIA site. And then another one says, his name, Dogtopia is attempting to rezone this to the dog park. I'm very against, so these are unique letters that I'm reading. I think we have to remember, too, that with the special exception, the ordinance says we shall grant it if we find the requirements are met. And again, uh, we've done that. You know, I would just distinguish a kennel. We do this for churches, daycares. Those are the kinds of things that we often rule on, even in the face of opposition. But those are simply a different type of use. And so to me, uh, I, while I know that we don't have, and I understand Mr. Dean's argument that sometimes property owners are concerned, kind of have a fear of the unknown, it does make sense to me that with 50 to 100 dogs, that could affect the long-term use of surrounding property. And so I, I'm going to come down, I don't think the, I disagreed with the variance, that being the case, that was one of one of the other requirements, special exception, is that it complies with all regulations, and that was one. And because I voted that way on the variance, I'm going to vote that way on the special exception. Well, and, I, and I'm, I voted the other way on the variance because I do think that, I, I do believe that the variance is legit. Now, the special exception is a totally different question, and I'm still having a tough time with the impact. Um, and. Usually the cases that go this long, you know, some folks are, are swayed and yeah. and that type of thing. And you know, we just haven't. Uh, you know, I don't know that we ask, but we haven't seen a, you know the you know the letters of support. I don't recall any letters of support. Um, and and that does matter. And I don't. You know, didn't vote the way I did earlier to, to drag it on. I, but because I did think that. Uh, because of the lack of outdoor play area, that that was a special condition that, that warranted the, the variance. But uh, but I do at this you know this juncture kind of think we need to really consider the the impact as one of the conditions, which it, I believe it is. What do you all think? I think as far as the special exception goes, I think the conditions have been met. And 
I go I go back and forth on the opposition letters, and you know we see a lot of opposition with churches and daycares, and I think one of the sort of built-in inherent problems with this sort of thing, and, and op, you know the opposition is local; they're their neighbors, and rightly so. But there there is no constituency for the appellant except for the appellant. Well, I mean, there's people that have pets that would love to, you know, have the convenience. And I get that we don't have enough kennels in certain parts of town. And so I actually think from a strictly business standpoint, it will do well because there just aren't a lot of kennels. And so there would absolutely probably be some people that live right next door that use this place. But we haven't heard anybody saying, hey, I can't wait for this to be right next door to me. It's almost like they'd probably rather be like a half a mile away. Hmm? Just just down the street, please, next to those people. And to me, you know, like I said, you look at special exceptions. We look at things like noise and smell. I mean, these are probably the loudest kind of smelly kind of entities concentrated that we get. And so to me, that has a big impact on whether you grant a special exception or not, because those are the kind of things that it talks about. John Michael, can you read us what those magic six or seven special exception things are? From 17.16.150, the special exception language and the general conditions. The general provisions, first, the burden of proof belongs to the appellant. B, general comp ordinance compliance proposed use shall comply with the applicable regulations, including specific standards for the proposed use set forth in this title, unless circumstances qualify the special exception for a variance in accordance with the variance section 17.40. Any accessory use to a special exception must receive express authorization from the board, not applicable here. Section C, integrity of adjacent areas. A special exception use permit shall be granted, provided that the board finds that the use is so designed, located, and proposed to be operated that the public health, safety and welfare will be protected. The board shall determine from its review that pub adequate public facilities are available to accommodate the proposed use and that approval of the permit will not adversely affect other property in the area to the extent that it will impair the reasonable long-term use of those properties. The board may re request a report from the Metropolitan Planning Commission regarding long-range plans for the land use development. D deals with design and architectural compatibility, E with the natural features of the land, F with historic preservation where applicable, G traffic impact, H has been repealed in an adaptation of the code, and section I has to do with hazard protection with regard to erosion, flood, fire, noise, glare, and similar hazards. Finally, J, special conditions, notwithstanding a finding by the Board of Zoning Appeals that a special exception application satisfies the minimum development standards of this article, the Board may restrict the hours of operation, establish permit expiration dates, require extraordinary setbacks, and impose other reasonable conditions necessary to protect the public health, safety, and welfare. Uh, the conditions portion of this is always important with regard to special exception cases. The board can impose and has wide discretion as to what conditions might be imposed. Just touching on the highlights of the sections applicable in 17.16.175, commercial special exceptions, section A, kennel slash stable. You'll find a lot of this has to do more with horse stables than dog kennels, but I'll just identify them one through 10. One, the setbacks. Two, building temperatures. Three, cages. Four, runs. Five, stalls. Six, riding ring. Seven, trail rides. Eight, gates and locks. Nine, watering of animals. 10, on-site waste collection. I'll read that into the record since it's been an extended part of your discussion. All, all on-site waste shall be housed either within the kennel building or an accessory structure, and all waste shall be disposed of in a sanitary fashion no less frequently than one time per week. The drainage of all liquid byproducts from the kennel shall be discharged into a permitted sanitary sewer line or septic tank and shall not be disposed of by way of storm sewers, creeks, streams, or rivers. Those are the 10 items identified under kennel stable under the special exception language specific to that use. What about the section where it talks about light and sound and impacting the neighboring property? It's back into the general provisions, I believe. I don't remember what H was that got repealed. I think it was repealed a long time ago. Well, I don't remember it. <laughs> A 
Of course, we read into the record Section C, integrity of adjacent areas. Section E deals with natural features. Special exception uses in residential zone districts must comply with the non-residential tree protection regulations and other natural site features shall be preserved to the greatest extent possible so as to minimize the intrusion of non-residential structures and parking areas. I think that's the closest thing that would address that. Wasn't Mr. there Chairman. some language that just talks about it shouldn't adversely impact, you know, the lights, sound, noise, whatever? I've read you what I think are the most applicable sections there. Okay. I don't see that. Very good. So here we are. So how are you feeling now? Okay, I'm going to make a motion so we can see where we are and then we can go from there. I'm going to make a motion that we find that the special exception requirements have not been met and then we deny the request. Okay. I'll Anybody second? I'll second that. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Yeah, that's great. Okay. That's where we are. Next motion. So, is there anything that we've discussed that would sway a <laughs> three? This is not a Facebook discussion group. I mean, well, just because you've asked, I would consider talking about no more than a 24-month grant of a special exception, franchise participation required, no more than 100 dogs on the facility, no more than 50 dogs overnight, that waste would be frozen is already discussed. And I, I mean, I think we ought to require it to be picked up a certain amount of time in a specific dumpster that is marked so that if there are going to be complaints, they're easy to make. That's so far as I've gotten on the requirements. I like that well, list. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was writing down, and, and again, you know, my, you know, the special exception piece that I'm having a tough time with is, is just frankly the overwhelming opposition of almost everybody around it. Um, I agree. And, you know, I know it's a commercial zone place, and they, that is a legitimate right. place to be. And, and, and I do think they've met the variance piece of it, which says I need to be thinking about what you're thinking about, uh, but I'm not ready to vote for it. But I'd written down, you know, maintain the, the franchise renew in an X number of years. Um, you know, you'd said 22 years, and so but up, up for discussion, you know, meet all noise ordinances, follow the sound abatement plan that was presented, um, follow the odor waste proposal that was uh, presented, a uh, dumpster at least 200 feet away from uh, the nearest residence, and um, you know, the 100 dogs max, 50 overnight, I think is, I don't have an issue with. And I mean, I, you know, we, we can ask. I, I just don't think there's a place you could put the dumpster 200 feet away from a residence on that property right. because you see the houses in the top right hand it's corner and then. Potentially it could be stored in the, the it could be stored in the building. It's got to be picked up. It, so it's got to be eventually. Structural considerations could be made to pull the dumpster. You know, you can make a, a bay in the building or attach it to the building. I mean, you know. I think it goes by the building. Yeah, I mean, hy hypothetically, you know, if, if but we. But you heard what our other guy that owned it when he put 100 feet away. I, I, yeah. Well, what I'm saying, if we gave the special exception with some set of conditions like this that might not be favorable to the business model, you know, it, w by granting the exception, we're not saying go do your business. We're, right. we're saying you now have the option to do the business if you want to take that risk. I know, but to me, this adversely impacts the neighborhoods too great, neighbors too greatly, and I'm just not for it. You know, it's just I what you said disagree. about the well, opposition. I don't disagree. I mean, I'm not. Would you, I, vote, would you vote for it, Cynthia, with your, with your conditions? I mean, we're on pace for a two-day meeting here. I mean, two full days of meetings. So this is over an hour. Any conditions you would consider? No, no. It's, it's a, it, they have not met the burden. One of the things that John Michael said, counselors, uh -huh. the burden is in their corner, and they did not meet the burden. Well, and so if we end at 3-3, three, three, what happens is they're denied. Yep. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I could... Uh, I really tend to agree with David, and I think those are some. <laughs> Which one? We're all David. <laughs> Sorry, the two to my right, on the right side of right. Uh, 
I tend to agree with those on this particular argument. And I was trying to think of a way I can agree with it, but I really don't. And I, I don't feel like that really. So, so Mr. Taylor, would, are there conditions that you would agree on that you would vote for this? Got Does money it, hall over here? I mean, come well, on. I'm just saying, I mean, if there's not, then okay, there's no so need. So if to, someone has a motion, bring a motion forward. If not, we need no, to I move mean, on. Why? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know what? Well, I think we're really arguing about something that's moot because our applicant said that uh, there was no reason for her to spend that kind of investment to make right. that building um, accessible if she couldn't have a long-term lease. So I think if we say two years, then she won't even try to do it anyway. So I think it's moot. To I, put I, those I mean, and that, that really is, I mean, I hate to say that's where I am, but I, I really am, and, and I can't can do that, you know, but. You know, I, I think that there's been enough testimony, and, and again, going back, Chairman Ewing is, you know, flipped through the pages and, and was reading, and uh, while y'all were discussing too, I was doing the same thing, and, you know, and it's, it, it's fairly massive. I, I don't recall a case in the many years I've been on here that has had as much opposition, and, and I think that does equate at some level to, to community impact, and I think to me that says that I would be willing to consider something like that, but it would be such a short period of time that I'm not sure, you know, I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I think if we, if we, if it, it's locked up 3-3 right now, uh, that does give the applicant, um, you know, they can come back and propose something and within 60 days and, or whatever, 30 days okay. and. But based on what I'm hearing the three of you say is that it's, well, I mean, David specifically said they haven't met the burden, but I, I don't know what else the applicant, I'm trying to imagine what the applicant could come back and say that would sway you because your opposition doesn't seem to be with the applicant. It seems to be with, you agree with the opposition. You see my point? So I, I it's, it's a no-win battle for, for the uh, appellant. Well, sometimes people come here and they win, sometimes they lose. It's just, that's the BZA. Well. I mean, I, I, I came here, hope, I mean, I, look, I, I would, I like it when everybody leaves reasonably happy. And I don't, and I don't like situations like this where there's a, a clear uh, winner and, and loser, not, so to I'm speak. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying and, to win you over. No, no, no. I mean, I get it. I'd be mean, pleased. But, I wish you would. But I mean, my I, point, I, my point fine. is what burden are they not meeting that could, they could possibly meet? That's what I'm What, what is ask. it you want? Right. And I'm not talking about. Let's make a deal. What do you want? I'm saying, what could possibly happen That's for them to question. prove their burden that I think they have? I don't know what but else I they could do. But I do think what you said about if it's three three, you know, it stays on there, and you know, people can we can deal with it again. I just don't think that this, whatever this is, is it, it is totally a fair question, and 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 you know, it would be the same. Well, you know, I you know. Is there any, you know, because um, would, you know, would it take um, some neighbor support? I don't know. Would it take a, a list of, of conditions that uh, Cynthia had kind of started to say, hey, you know, we can live with this. Would you, would this negate it um, coming from the applicant rather than us? Um, you know, possibly. Um, But I, you know, I, you know, I think I, I, to me, it's a 50, it's it's kind of fifty fifty. I would love for, I would love for this to happen, but if it's if it's that type of close to me and um, it's a, it is a special exception and it's not a, you know religious institution that has rights that other special exceptions don't, then then to me the the, the weight of the neighborhood tips it a little for me. Well, the neighbors are important and what they think is important and community input is important. But I, I guess I go back to the, if they meet the burden, then we shall grant the yeah, that's what I keep special hearing. exception. And so I don't know how they didn't meet the burden. Um, personally, you know, it doesn't matter to me if they have a dog place on 8th Avenue or not. And I, you know, would love for the opposition to be happy and 
I, I'd love everyone to be happy, but um, but it does go back to that, just that standard that we shall grant it if they meet the the burden. So I guess that's why we're, I guess that's why we're on that point. Right. I Okay, so does anyone have another motion? If not, we should move to approve the very the special exception because they met the burden of proof. I can make that motion. Is that your motion? I, I probably should say that differently, but what about the? Is there a time? <laughs> they met the condition. standards of the. Are there special any conditions? Exception. I will take a friendly amendment with all the conditions that you all have stated, but I don't. I hadn't written them down, so maybe. He's, anyone else? <laughs> this is what I wrote down. I wrote down uh, a review after 24 months. The continued franchise participation is required. There will be no more than 100 dogs on the premises at any time, no more than 50 dogs overnight. Waste will be frozen and picked up in a manner as designated by, I guess, other rules. The specific dumpster will be marked and be as far away from any housing as possible. Uh, and the soundproofing that has been promised would be performed. I would take that amendment. Okay. Well, that's not an amendment. That's yeah. just. That's a, I would uh, take those suggestions. Suggestions. And, okay. I, I, and I would okay, recommend so pick up be twice a week on that. Okay. So. So when you when you say 24 months um, re reviewed in 24 months, we uh, especially except for 20 months, four months, we would come it back. It has to be renewed. It renewed in 24 months for in for the length of it time. It expires then. in 24 months. Okay. I mean, I, I, I'm inclined to, to allow that, to, to give it a, to give it, if, if the applicant is willing to make that, to take that risk, then I would be willing to um, re review it because I think that it, uh, the neighbor's concerns would have, they would have an opportunity to address all of those concerns within two years to say, you know, they're, how, how did it, it the impact and it, it wouldn't necessarily be a permanent impact and I'm, I, I can live with that. I would also offer for consideration that uh, as with the variance that the, uh, the special exception goes with the uh, with this appellant. Right, sure. With the what? With okay, the motion has been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, motion has been made in second discussion. So what I'll say, I don't like this whether it be a 10 years, two years, or a month. Just they haven't met their burden. And we have so many letters in opposition, and nobody wants us. Nobody wants us. But maybe four of you might want it, but not me. No, I don't personally want it at all. I'm just offering a different motion because it was asked to do so. So. Does that mean you might not vote for your own motion? I probably will. Okay, then you want it. <laughs> okay, that's fine. No, Any no, more it doesn't discussion? mean I want. No, no, you no, want no, it no. to pass. This is about quasi judicialness. This is not about what things people want. Well, and I feel like what um, Christina said, the, what the law requires is not, you know, that's what I'm trying to think about is, you know, not what I want, but what does the law require? And I did hear John Michael read it. And that's why I looked. I don't think they've met their burden. I think it has a huge adverse well, impact for noise yeah, and sound. We obviously and just had a, a disagreement yeah. about it. Yeah. Oh, well, okay. Close. I do not have a dog, so. <laughs> so, any, any more discussion before we vote? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. It passes four to two. Next case to be presented to the board, if the board is ready to proceed, is case break. number. Please. Oh, break. This board will take a short break and reconvene with case number 334. All right, Mr. Chairman, we'll go back into session with the Board of Zoning Appeals. Two quick announcements. Uh, two cases have asked to defer until our next meeting, the first of which is Case 2018-390, a short-term rental case involving the property at 908A Young's Lane will be deferred to our next meeting on August the 16th. The second is BZA case 2018-340, 
Another short-term rental case involving the property at 1101 Shelby Avenue will also go to the 816 docket. Both will be pushed uh, near or at the top of the short-term rental cases that will be heard on that date. So again, case 340 and case, case 390, both pushed to our 816 docket. If you're here on those cases, they will not be heard today. However, we will hear case 2018-334, a zoning case involving the property at 207 Mildred Chute Avenue, downtown just south of Broadway, uh, just south of Lafayette more specifically. Board members, you heard this case last month. This is a sidewalk variance request. You may recall the complicating factor was that this property had been before the board about a year ago to obtain a number of bulk regulation-based variances, namely setbacks, I think height or possibly sky plane, and a number of other issues based on the small and unusually sized lot, shown here just off the 2nd Avenue corridor. The site plan submitted shows the issue. The sidewalk request will, or the sidewalk requirement will cut deep into the property, likely triggering the need to come back to the board for new setback variances if, in fact, the uh, required sidewalk is built out in this scenario. Um, planning recommendation is in your packet. That is a recommendation for a payment to the fund. The district council member submitted a recommendation for this case. It is for a payment to the fund. The appellant is present today. Mr. McTory has been present for each of his hearings. Again, one last view, my uh, site visit subject property in the lower right-hand corner uh, across the street to the top. And finally, below, the view up and down Mildred Chute. The criteria of the zoning ordinance that was passed, 2017-4, or 2016-493, is that if there is a sidewalk present that is not up to the current standard, and the property is within the UZO, which is the case here, then that property is not eligible to pay into the fund at the staff level. Um, however, the board can grant that permission, which is exactly what's recommended by planning and sought by the council member. But of course, it's appropriate to hear, as we had uh, asked, the board had asked to defer this to a later date so the uh, appellant could examine his options once again. The appellant's present and can make his presentation to the board. Mr. McTory, if you'd introduce yourself by name and address. Charles McTory, 600 Monte Carlo Drive, Antioch, Tennessee. Uh, hopefully, I don't think I need to say much. I'm just going to be requesting that I am pay able into to pay, the fund. pay into the fund. Okay. Any questions for the applicant about paying into the fund instead of building a sidewalk? Okay. Thank you very much. We are going to close the public hearing. I'll move that we grant the variance on the sidewalk, provided that the applicant pay into the fund. I was unclear on what Colby uh, Councilman Sledge said. What this, his sentence said was, I want sidewalk in lieu of fund payments at these two addresses. I took that to mean he wanted the sidewalk. No, Am I read, reading that wrong? Yeah, read it. He means sidewalk in lieu of fund payments. Yeah, He's calling it that. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I'm yeah. understanding. Okay, so your motion okay. is what? Yeah, my motion is to, to grant the... Uh, Variance on the recommendation of the planning uh, commission and the metro councilman of that district that uh, the applicant paid the in lieu fee. Okay. okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Good luck. Thank you. John Michael. The next case to be presented to the board is 2018-375. You've already heard from the district council member, Ms. Murphy, with regard to this case, which is located at 5535 and 5533 Kendall Drive in council district number 24, just off the White Bridge Corridor. Property shown here on the zoning map is set up for uh, HPR development, two residences on the lot. Aerial photograph gives you a sense of the layout of the neighborhood. The site plan submitted shows exactly how they've got the layout arranged vis-a-vis -vis the setbacks and also the proximity of the street. From my recent site visit, the view in the lower right-hand corner is part of the ongoing development of this property. You see that there are, in fact, existing sidewalks, though clearly not up to the current standard in terms of size, width, uh, planter strip, or the current condition. The view up and down the street gives a clearer view of the sidewalk on adjoining properties uh, in the area. You have recommendation of the Planning Commission in your packet. You have uh, comments from the district council member who came to speak on this earlier in the day, much, much earlier in the day. Um, <laughs> Bailey Neal is the appellant. If uh, the appellant would please come forward at this time to make the desired presentation of the board. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 375? There he is. As a result, the appellant will have five, uh, 10 minutes to make the desired presentation. Uh, uh, opposition would have 10 minutes as well. Again, is Bailey Neal or any other representative for this case present? Mr. Chairman, seeing no appellant, the, the board has the option to either defer to a later date or to vote no on the case now. You know, um, this is the second time we've deferred. 
How many we deferred at once? Forgive me, I believe this is the first time the case has been presented. Oh, I'd have to double time? check that. Okay. Um, board members, what do you want to do? Defer. Defer one meeting? Okay. Make a motion to defer one meeting, someone. So moved. Okay. Is there a yeah. second? I'll second. Okay, motion has been made and properly second to defer one meeting. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. John Michael. The next case to be presented is 2018-379 involving the property at 4019 Valewood Drive in Council District Number 34. What are we doing? Oh God! I don't withdrawn. Okay. 377 okay. withdrawn. Tracy Little is the appellant on behalf of Janet Harden, the owner of the property at this address, shown here on the zoning map, shown here on the aerial photograph, for uh, residential construction, single family construction underway. It's a request for a sidewalk variance in this, the RS20 zoning district. Site plan submitted shows proximity of the structure to Vale Wood. My recent site, plan, uh, site visit shows the construction of the residence well underway. And of course, the view of the sidewalks and planter strips as you go up and down Vale Wood uh, at the subject location. Probably the best view there. Um, you have the recommendation from the planning department in your packet. We do not have specific input from the district council member from 34 on this particular case. However, we do have an appellant. So if uh, appellants wish to, uh, I'll ask first, is there any opposition present for case number 379? Seeing none, the appellants will have five minutes to make the desired presentation. Just introduce yourselves by name and address. Um, Chairman Ewing, members of the board, thank you for uh, hearing us this afternoon. My name is Janet Harden. Um, my uh, husband, Matt, and I are the owners of 4019 Valewood, where the uh, construction is going on. I'm joined here by Ethan Cole Clasier, who is our um, contractor and builder on the property. Um, we, uh, we chose this neighborhood specifically because of how family friendly and walkable it is. We have three small children. I have a rising first grader in Julia Green. We're around the corner from the school. We are super excited to be able to actually walk to school. As you can see from the pictures, there is an existing sidewalk that runs the entire length of Valewood um, that has an, a grass strip that is a two foot grass strip instead of the required um, Four foot, four foot that is now required by the sidewalk ordinance. We're requesting variance for that and um, to not pay the in lieu of fee. Um, given that the sidewalk is in extremely good condition um, and that uh, it would cause a disruption to not only the, um, the aesthetics of the neighborhood, but also a potential hazard to our um, you know, young children that are going to be using the sidewalk regularly, um, given that it would have to be offset. Okay. Um, questions of the applicant? And what's the hardship for that? What's your request, um, your hardship? Well, the, the hardship is that it would be the only um, house on the entire street that would have this offset. Um, the concern would be of a um, uh, liability issue with having to um, not connect with the, the balance of the um, the balance of the the network. Um, in addition, you can see there's a fairly mature tree that is right next to the existing um, sidewalk. Um, there's concerns oh, over the there are concerns over the the existing the landscape, um, mature trees, which has stormwater impact, and, and in addition to that, um, utilities that are that are existing that run on the property. But why can't you pay into the fund? Um, I guess we can pay into the fund. I guess the question was, given that the that the the pro, the sidewalk and the existing infrastructure that's there in the neighborhood is in such great condition, um, how that how the the funds would be used? Okay, very good. Any other questions? Okay, let's close the public hearing. Yeah, I mean. I'm, I'm a little bit on the fence on the four foot and two foot. I'm less on the fence on the five foot, two foot because. Well, if you want to save the tree, you can. I, well, I think the tree's important and I think that's a legitimate hardship and I think it's a hardship to not pay. Uh, but I think the five foot, two foot in itself is almost uh, a reason not to pay. And you know, we got a, a, a letter on a different case from uh, you know, Public Works talking about you know, a, a margin of error of a certain percentage 
you know, saying, hey, this is kind of with, you know, this is close enough. And, and I know that Public Works doesn't agree. I mean, they, they recommended that we uh, give a variance and, and ask them to pay. But to me, the because the sidewalk is wide enough, because the sidewalk is in good shape, because uh, there is a mature tree, uh, my opinion is it's close enough uh, with the two-foot grass strip rather than uh, the one-foot grass strip, uh, particularly given the safety concerns. Uh, Y'all may disagree, but uh, that's my thought. So um, It's fine not to build it, but I don't see the hardship. I mean, about not paying into the in-lieu fund. A lot of other people are paying into the in-lieu fund. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 again, to me, I, I just distinguish the five-foot, two-foot situation as different than, you know, a no-grass strip or even a even a four-foot, two-foot situation. Um, you know, it's a it's it's barely over twenty percent, you know, off the requirement, and you know, and that's th those are deviations that we. Oh, you're you know, saying build it. Build it no, I'm saying I'm saying give them a variance with uh, without paying. I mean, and I'll, I'll make a motion yeah. to see if it, okay. it has that. Make that, a motion that will move uh, in this case to grant a sidewalk variance uh, without requiring the applicant to pay into the in-lieu fund. Okay, motion's been made. I will second it. Any um, with, with the specific conditions of the the mature tree, the mature tree and being the a hardship, five the foot, two foot grass strip, five foot sidewalk and two in foot good, grass in strip. great condition. Yeah. Okay. Motion was made, properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Hands up. Aye. Opposed. Whew. Tough crowd. <laughs> Next motion. I would make a motion that we uh, grant the variance as to the sidewalk but require payment of the in lieu fund. I'll second. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? The, the only question I do have. Um, is that is a variance, John Mark, is a variance required here? Do, uh, I mean, do I have, do they have to have a variance to be able to pay? According to planning. Yeah, yeah, under these circumstances, I think so, right? Typically identified explicitly in the planning department's um, recommendations, but I don't see it in this version. Forgive me, I'd have to look it back up, sorry. I don't remember off the top of my head whether or not it uh, as allows that or not. Certainly wouldn't hurt to include that in the motion either way. Well, I mean, yeah. Well, I guess I, mean, I okay. guess, I guess I could, it can hold out there. Since it, there are three people again. Well, no, I mean, it'll have three. I mean, but I'd, I'd, I think I'd rather just wait and see if, if, if Alma, if it doesn't pass, if Alma decides she wants to vote next time or. Uh, but then it's still just three, three. These people aren't gonna change their minds, are they? No. Unless you come up with a Monty Hall deal like <laughs> I think, I, you know, my position typically is that the council member requ requests to avoid the payment in lieu, but absent that, uh, I think the payments are, are made. That's what the council has told us to do. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's fine. I mean, it, I, the, so what, I, what I want to create. So basically, if it locks up, they have to build the normal sidewalk. That's the bad thing, right? Well, I, I want them to be able to keep the tree in the sidewalk, and if no, it but if they, they don't get the variance, if someone right, doesn't so join have, them, yeah. All right. then they have to build the sidewalk and lose the tree. So, All right. and Mr. Chairman, to answer the question, this case is fund eligible even without board action, so they could have paid oh, it six weeks ago. Oh, it is. Right. Okay. Well then. All right. So, we, so, if they, so, so the vote right not eligible on our planning sheet. Is that wrong? Staff on the application filed at the uh, zoning staff level indicated sidewalks are required. Applicant may pay in. So, regardless, it doesn't hurt to include it in a motion, whatever that motion may be. Okay. But that's what I was just going by was the staff, okay. uh, zoning staff. But if I would put in their motion, or or John Michael, if this, if if we're wrong, can you administratively allow them to pay into the fund? if they don't get four votes. First of all, I reject the notion that the board could ever be wrong, but I'm not sure I'll follow even conceptually what you mean if so if, if, if nothing passes, it's if three to two and they need our our ability to pay into the fund, can you still? Oh, yes, treat the motion as being something that gives them permission to pay into the fund. Yes. But the problem is it doesn't gonna get, it's not going to get four votes. I mean, I, I guess that it, makes it a moot it's conversation. A, it's a little technicality. If they can pay into the fund, 
now, then I'll, I'll vote against this motion because I don't think they should have to pay, right. and then it'll fail and they will have to pay. But if by me vote, voting the way I think I should vote, it means that they are required to build the new sidewalk, cut down the tree, and, and then, uh, you know, then uh, we, none of us want that. But, uh, but here's how staff would politely recommend handling it. Staff's original application for this case indicates sidewalks are required. Applicant may pay in lieu of sidewalk refund. Hey, we'll, we'll believe staff. So, and that's plan, uh, zoning staff specifically. In the event that further research indicates that's not correct, staff can bring back to the board a motion to reopen a previously heard case, okay. even if we have a final vote, well, reopen, provide that information, and see if the board wants to vote up a different motion. Well, that's it'd be not held a big up deal. In, it'd be held up in votes anyway for 30 days, so we'll know within 30 days, and, and one of us can change our vote to give okay. it Okay, understood. Votes. All right, thank you. I'm not sure the motion is. We didn't carry. Okay, yes, we didn't carry, so next motion. So I'm, I'm making it? Oh, that's fine. You made the motion. I made a motion. Yeah. Nobody seconded it. To deny. I, I second. I second. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I don't think we Motion's been made and properly seconded. Discussion. This is a motion to deny and that they. Deny and it's. And, pay. and the pay yeah. okay. is. Right. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. okay. Deadlock, John Michael. John Michael, I know for, we might have quorum issues. I'd like for us to take case number 406 before we go. Very well. Case number 406 will be the next case presented to the board. Chairman's suggestion. Uh, as for case number 381, of course, that means the case is not passed today, did not fail today. It stays open for 30 days and will be taken up by our board members at the next docket if there's another vote to be cast. Case. Oh, thank case you. number 406 involves the property at 1609 oh, Springfield that Highway. That mean I just missed some A moment while I get there, Mr. Chairman. Here we go. So 1609 no, Springfield good. Highway, shown here in the highlighted portion on the zoning map. The adjoining here. property to the immediate north and, I guess, east, as shown on the zoning map, is 1611, also under the ownership of the same owners, uh, Jimmy Sanders, the appellant in this particular case, all part of the request for a special exception related to proposed use of a kennel. The aerial photograph here shows the property, largely rural in nature, of course, in this part of the county. Another closer photograph shows some of the structures on the side-by-side -side property, 1609 and 1611, proposed for use in conjunction with the kennel use. The site plan submitted shows a highlight of the property in proximity to other uh, differently zoned properties. From the assessor's website, the primary structure in the residential part. Also from the assessor's website, the primary structure outside of the residential use. Because there is opposition present, both sides will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentations to the board. Uh, for anyone wishing to speak in support, in addition to the appellants, we remind them it's 10 shared minutes. If you wish to save any of the time for rebuttal purposes, save it out of this original 10. And then as for the opponents as well, because there are multiple speakers, um, there'll be 10 shared minutes, with the exception, of course, Mr. Chairman, as is always the case in all of our cases, no district council member is restricted by time in presentations, and the district council member, or a district council member is, in fact, present on this case. Okay. With that, Mr. Sawyers will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation. Uh, just please introduce yourself by name and address. Good afternoon. My wife and I are here to present an appeal for our property of 1609 Springfield Highway. We are requesting a special exception for a two-year period that would allow us to use an existing building on our property for a kennel. This building is in compliance with AR2A and Metro Nashville Building Codes to provide a safe and sanitary environment for dogs. Currently, we have a 5013C, 501C3 nonprofit called Five Oaks Therapy Dogs, which is registered with the state and federal government. Our mission is to breed and train quality British Labrador Retrievers to be uh, placed with people with special needs. Two years will give us time to find another location that is more suited to the needs of our nonprofit. Right now, we primarily breed labs and conduct obedience training. We do some specialized therapy work, and we also donate dogs to other organizations like Smoky Mountain Therapy Dogs and Ground Zero in Oklahoma City. 
Our plan is to do more training for specific needs like diabetic alert dogs and therapy dogs for returning soldiers. Uh, we do need a facility that would enable us to do more um, than we do now, as well as a place for training classes, lectures, and seminars. Our goal is to work more with people receiving service dogs. I regret that we have not been able, not able to bring more people here that you could personally talk to, so we did bring the book with us, and I'll be happy to go through the book and show you what we do. Yeah, I think you submitted that in the packet, so. Uh, yes, sir, and I'll be glad to so show you. So we're not really looking at kind of what I your do. good work in the community and Understand. what these dogs do. We're just looking at how these dogs impact your neighbors. Okay. <laughs> They could just be regular dogs or nice service dogs or canine dogs. That doesn't matter. What matters is their dogs and what you, you know, how many you have, the hours of operation, or the inside, outside. You heard that other the case, so. Uh, we are in total compliance with all zoning stipulations for a special exemption kennel. No, uh, no kennel buildings or run is within 200 feet of any residence. Kennel building is equipped with central air and heat. Structure is constructed of concrete and metal. All dogs have 80 square feet of individual run space with a six foot fence. Runs are under roof and are disinfected and sprayed quite daily. The entire kennel area is fenced and that, that area is then fenced again and locked. Uh, noise areas have been addressed using bark collars uh, they remain in buildings most of the day and all night. Uh, a 100 foot by 12 foot bamboo screen between the kennel and our nearest neighbor was constructed six years ago. We have not and have no desire to be a commercial establishment. We only have 30 runs. 20 of which are occupied by our personal dogs that we use for breeding. Uh, there is no signage, nor do we advertise. The waste products are, are gathered every day. We scoop, they are picked up two times a week. Now, other than that, I really don't have anything, and, and I wish you would ask me questions mm -hmm. because you've had your feel of so, for the day, I'm sure. If I have 20 dogs in my property, that's more than pets. I mean, so what is this? So you said you breed dogs. We breed dogs in order to develop and train dogs for soldiers, for diabetic alert dogs for children, PTSD dogs. Yeah, I understand that so part. So now you, we do that. Oh, John Here Michael, is. can you have 20 dogs on your property and breed them? <laughs> He's just one man. John Michael almost opened this once before. John Michael prosecuted this case in environmental court in 2011. I wasn't going to say it, but since the appellant did, this is case is subject to a court order right now, which is in your case packet. A copy of the mandatory injunction from environmental court, then referee Jim Todd was put down in 2011. This case was subject of a BZA filing in 2011 that was subsequently withdrawn while the matter proceeded through environmental court. That order is still on the books. This is a thou shalt not right now. So I'm sure the appellants will speak to that. The uh, property standards inspector from the Metro Codes Department is here to tell you about the current uh, case that they are involved with right now, though not in court at this point. It is a property standards case. Uh, again, things that since the uh, appellant mentioned it, I'm glad to give you that detail. Again, it's in your packet. You can read the specific language. Animal husbandry, to address your question most directly, Mr. Chairman, is not a defined use in our land use table. Uh, the number of dogs to be had as pet dogs is actually a different section of law, not zoning. And forgive me for not remembering what section of the Metropolitan no, Code deals with that. It is restricted. Um, and mercifully, it's not before this board today as a question for your consideration. So, so we're, it's, it, it, there is a court order that says you can't have a kennel? Can't have 20 dogs. That is a defined use that was not permitted 
uh, without special exception from the BZA. There was no special exception from the BZA. As a result, no kennel was allowed at this location and still is not allowed at this location unless the board grants this special exception that Mr. Sawyers has properly sought today. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, it's, I'm seeing, you know, furthermore that, you know, you vacate the accessory buildings, no animals, appliances, or furniture, no business operations of any kind to take place at these locations. So is, did I just hear you say you work? I mean, have you followed the court order? Yes, sir. Sir, we, we went back, we vacated the buildings, we redid the building. But you just said you we, had 20 dogs on the property, 30 dogs. We do. There is, there is no, there's nothing that says how many pets that I can own. Mm. But it, I mean, Referee Todd at, said to, at that hearing, said nobody needs to open the can of worms as to how many dogs one can own. Pardon me? All right, I, I guess I'm just confused as to how you're- But I could okay, own so as wait, many dogs so as I wish. let me read from the Jim Todd order. Okay. It says, this cause was heard February 9th, 2011. The defendant was not present. So you didn't show up? Of course I was there. The defendant was not present and represented. Oh, counsel. The court and the defendant, that's you, is in violation of the Metro Code of Laws, section 17-08-030, by operating a commercial business and or storage of commercial equipment at that location, in violation of the stop work order, failure to cease operation of an illegal dog kennel and dog breeding business, after a stop work order was posted on November 24th, 2011. So you had a stop work order and you continued to operate. Oh, sir. That is correct. That's yeah, correct that you had a stop had, work order. We had a stop work order from running any kind of a commercial business. And we illegal, not, illegal dog kennel or breeding. We, the breeding, I can breed whatever I want to. Not Just according like to anybody this. else in this town. Okay. You can breed anything you want to and sell. Well, you, it, it said dog breeding business. So that's for, not for our, us to decide. Right. But, but it says no, here you shouldn't be operating. I'm assuming this order is still in place. Is so, it not? We'll find out from the opposition probably. I so, guess, yeah, I mean, another question. I, I mean, so you, no you, arm, there's no arm of Metro law. It's, found me after this, that it's found me in violation of running a commercial boarding, grooming, whatever business. I have bred my own dogs. They've looked at all my papers. I've always had my papers. Here's a gentleman sitting right over here to my left. He's been there twice. I'm, I, I don't run a commercial kennel. So your neighbors have sent letters saying that, I guess, you share a driveway with your neighbors? We have a, an egress. And that, well, I, that's not my question, but they talk about um, kind of the number of cars that are coming and going. Yeah, I know. So why are there a lot of cars coming and going if it's not for your business? Well, they may be going to other houses. There's one behind me, too. Right. Well, they're, they're, their testimony is they're going to your house. So are they going to your house or not your house? Well. Yeah, some of them are going to my okay. house, of course. So you were represented by counsel in this 2011 hearing. Yes. You had a lawyer. Yes. And basically what this order says is that you were supposed to vacate the accessory buildings at 1601 and 1611 Springfield Highway, no animals, appliances, or furniture, no business operation of any kind to take place at these locations. And you didn't That's do exactly that. exactly what I did. You said just now you're running a kennel and breeding. I removed everything out of every single building. Do you have 30 dogs on your property today? I do, and they moved. And that's in violation of this. It's not? 30 of my own dogs. Metro cannot tell me how many dogs I can own. Okay, so it said vacate. They have been back and approved that. I can't speak to the circumstances of the case, but there is actually Title VIII for animal companion, companion animal hoarding. I don't know if he's in violation of that, but 
Okay, but that's not for us to say. But, not, but they came, this you're right, sir, and they came back to find out if I was hoarding Okay. okay so not taking care of my dog. So let's, so what are you asking us to do? You want to operate a kennel? No, sir. What do you want to operate? I want a two-year exception in order to breed these dogs for what I'm doing, and that is training and, and furnishing dogs for a nonprofit organization. Okay. Period. Well, and I meet all the exceptions for that. Mr. Chairman, to assess Mr. Salyers, because I think this actually will clarify what he's shooting for. The definition under the zoning code for kennel slash stable, quote, means any lot, building, or structure or premises used for the boarding, breeding, training, and or raising of domestic animals slash wildlife, excluding livestock, whether by the owners of such animals or by persons providing facilities and care, whether or not for compensation, but shall not apply to the keeping of animals in municipal animal pound, pet store, bona fide labs, for scientific experimental purposes, or in a veterinary establishment for the purpose of observation and recovery necessary to veterinary treatment. So the breeding and training components that Mr. Sawyer specifically asked for That's why meet the here. definition of kennel, which requires the special exception for the board, which is why he's chosen to come here today and seek the permission that he's seeking. It does require the use permit from zoning, which requires a special exception from the board. Is the stop commercial? work order still in place? The court order has never been set aside or anything like that. That case went final eventually, and those restrictions so to basically, my understanding remain intact. My reading of this is he's not supposed to have any things, any nothing in those buildings and remove everything, right? Again, I haven't prosecuted cases in those courts for a long time because I've been over here with you for a long time now, but as a result, I can't speak definitively. I have no knowledge of that order ever having been lifted. Okay. David? Well, I, I was asking if uh, I'm hearing that he, he needs a special exception to do the breeding, uh, whether it's commercial or not. It, it, that point is moot. So, and so then the question is, is he in violation of the court order, and, and can we give him permission? Can we give permission to do something that is in violation of a court order? I mean, I'm, obviously, I guess we can get permission to do whatever, but if there's a court order in place, it would supersede. So, so forgive an indirect answer, but I think it's the accurate answer. The board cannot supersede a court order. However, I think the board can grant a can grant a special exception that would allow the issuance of the permit with the condition that there be no other obstruction, i.e. a court order. So that condition, though slippery, it might seem like, is actually exactly what addresses your question. That way you don't have to worry about whether or not does this order pre prevent us. You can just say, look, if there is no court order preventing, then he meets the conditions. If it is determined that the appellant meets all the conditions required under the law. Thank you. Okay. So um, what else? Now, when I, when I went back to Metro Codes mm -hmm. and met with this gentleman and the chief of Codes, mm -hmm. they told me that they had gone through all this, and I had met with, with, with everything. But they're not the court, so they're just saying, you, I, I, this is our procedure, come in front of us, okay. make your case, okay? okay? Other questions for that? You'll be able to come back after the opposition. So let's hear from the opposition. Okay. And I had a question. Oh, sure, of course. About the operation, because we've talked about waste a lot today. <laughs> you, said, you said it's gathered every day. Yes, ma'am. Where do you keep it? We keep it in a, in a container by itself and, and twice a week. Property. Is it anywhere near the neighboring homes? How far is it from the neighboring it's, homes? It's behind our, our location. Would you, do you know how we many feet never, it's ever over? have had a complaint from our neighbors. About odor? Any? It's, two, it's 200 feet away from where we, where they pick it up. We've never had a complaint about odor whatsoever. Noise is a different situation. And we work on noise all the time. Are the, animal, are the dogs kept outside? No, no sir. They, we have indoor, outdoor runs. They're let out three times a day, and they're kept inside all night. So what kind of noise complaints are you getting then? They're too, they're too noisy. From being inside or outside? When, when, when they're outside. let out. Okay. But they're let out in runs, and then we let them back in. Okay. And what can you do to solve that noise problem? Move. Okay. And that's, and that's the reason we're asking for a two-year exception. 
we, you know, we realize that there's always going to be some type, and we try to keep that down as much as possible. Anytime we get a noise complaint, I try to address it. We're looking for a place and have been looking for a place. And as you know, in this economic climate right now, it's difficult to find a place because we certainly don't want to move into a, an 8th Avenue kind of place or, uh, you know, into a high, a high density population kind of place. And so you're asking for two years we're because asking you're for two years. having trouble finding And we place. have two different real estate companies right now looking for a place. We could find a place in three months and be gone. That's just, that's what we're doing. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay, let's hear from the opposition. You'll have five minutes and 10 seconds when you come back. Please come forward. Opposition, state your name, address for the record, and why you are opposed to this. Councilman. Have a seat. Yeah. You could, you could get it. Councilman Doug Pardew. First, first. Yes. Councilman Doug Pardew, the 10th District, 2086 Graceland Drive. So, Councilman, why are you here? Well, sir, I didn't want to come. You can bet on that. <laughs> but the, the problem is this has been going on since before I got elected. Uh, there was a, at one time I can remember the, the neighbors and, and, uh, and the other guy worked out a deal to where he, he was moved. He'd gone, left, supposedly. And then it was quiet for a while, and then all of a sudden, it came back. It came back a whole lot stronger than before. I have been to one of the complainants' houses during the noisy part, and I, I wouldn't live there. Uh, the property values are dropping drastically on the two people that lives on each side of it. And I'm not here to be against him as much as I'm here to protect the integrity of the 10th district. If he's allowed to do this at his house, then I will support anybody in the 10th district doing the same thing at theirs. Uh, this is not a, a place where he's got 40 acres to take care of these dogs, which he did. But he's between two very expensive pieces of property, and behind this place there's a lot of people. And so I think some of them's here today to tell you the same thing. So what I'm trying to say, I'm just trying to protect my district, and this is not good for my district, and of course the decision's up to y'all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Any questions for Councilman Pardee? Mr. White, get us started. Mr. Chairman, Tom White, 315 Dedrick Street. I want to start by saying I've submitted a position paper, and I think a lot of you have read that in advance, but it's frankly unbelievable that... Mr. White, can you move the microphone a little closer? Yes. We don't have the red buttons here, Mr. Chairman. I know, yes. I know. Uh, at any rate, uh, my comment is in our position paper, I attached a number of things that the people on this uh, commission have looked at. Basically, I think it's unbelievable brass uh, for the applicant to be down here in light of the fact that he's been operating on this site by his own admission in a total violation of a court order. What's referenced is uh, this matter was originally set before this board in February of 2011. We came down here, all these same witnesses. To my knowledge, there is not one person who has supported this other than the applicant. There's a number of people here, and I've heard the board talk about sensitivity to people in the area. There's a number of people in opposition that will testify today, but we were here in February of 2011, and the applicant withdrew the application. And they said, we're going to let the court system handle this. That's exactly what happened. And on February uh, 16, a temporary injunction was issued. To my knowledge, I've looked at the records. Nothing has ever changed. The cease order went down. It's been violated repeatedly by the man's own admission today. His comment was, I'm just breeding and boarding. That doesn't count. Obviously, it counts, and you've heard that. It's a total violation. He's been doing it for years. The neighbors have been incredibly tolerant, but that's the status in this matter. Uh, with respect to uh, the court order, again, I do not know of anything uh, that has changed. I will say this. The only reason we're here today, the codes department went out there and issued another uh, stop work order on this matter, and they gave him enough time to come before this board again. That's the only reason we're here. Uh, and I don't know if the codes inspector is still here. He was to be here today, uh, but he went out there. Excuse me. He could, you can ask him questions. He went out there, observed it was a commercial operation, took pictures of vehicles coming and going, took pictures of a vehicle that has the name of the operation on it. I mean, to come here before this board and claim that uh, I didn't know this was in violation and it's not commercial uh, is frankly a total ruse. Uh, I'll respectfully comment as well that uh, the issues 
before the board, you heard more about dog kennel cases today than you ever wanted to. But with respect to the general conditions, the general condition about integrity of adjacent areas, the court found this was not appropriate, period. Uh, and the language about adjacent areas, you've heard it before, it's got to be designated, located, and proposed to be operated. The public health, safety, and welfare will be protected. All these buildings are directly against my client's property, Mr. Wilkes. So I may address some other things with the uh, with the BZA today, but I would like to ask this next witness to address property values immediately. This lady's name is uh, Beverly Woodard. Woodard. Ms. Woodard, would you please tell the board what your qualifications are and your opinion about what the operation does to the value of adjacent properties? Yes. I'm a real estate broker, and I live at 1607 Springfield Highway, which is the opposite side of Mr. Wilkes' property. It's kind of in between. And uh, I feel like that this, the kennel and the traffic and the noise uh, has probably has a potential and probably has lowered our property values anywhere from 25 to 30 uh, percent. My next witness, Mr. Chairman, is Mr. Terry Wilkes, who's the property owner also that lives immediately next door. I'm Mr. Wilkes, will you address the board as to issues that you've had with noise at the property? Yes. I live at 1625 Springfield Highway. My wife and I have lived there for 28 years. Jim moved in about uh, eight years after us. Uh, the first kennel is approximately 175 feet from my bedroom. And the noise is unbelievable. You better be up at 7 o'clock because you're not going to get to sleep any later. Today, before I come to this board, I was in my bathroom going to take a shower. Normally I've got the TV on. I didn't. You could hear, hear the dogs barking with storm windows and air conditioner running. The noise has always been so bad. I've had to call Jim before at 2 o'clock in the morning and tell him to come down. And I guess he put a muzzle. You know, you can have uh, these coon dogs that really bark. Uh, I used to live next to railroad track. You get used to that sound. You don't get used to 50 to 75, up to 150 dogs. I have seen that personally, and my wife has too. He's, that's the first storage place. The next one is about 230 feet from me. Then he's got the runs right behind that. And then he stores them in his house in the garage when he's got overruns. 98% of all of his business is boarding dogs. Uh, they're coming in night and day on a one-way driveway, you got to back up to let them in. We live on Springfield Highway, which is a very busy road. Well, you're stuck out there in the middle of the road, you can't even turn in your own driveway. Uh, it's a gentleman here that built those houses. He designed them three driveways for three houses. I mean, one driveway for three different houses and not a commercial piece of property. Uh, the building he built, he did not get any permits for Metro. It was built illegal. They come in and made him fill them up with concrete, take the commodes out, do all of this. So you can imagine the sanitation problem. If a worker's got to go to the restroom or something, he's either got to go there or go up to Jim's house or somewhere else. And you can imagine with the, all the holes that were filled up and the substitute filled up, there's, everything's got to be on the floor. Now, it may be cleaned up, yeah, but anyway, you can smell it. You know, especially in the summertime like this. And the summertime is when he really does his business because people are going on vacations, everything like that. Wednesday's kind of a slow day there, which is nice. My wife and I built a brand new patio with a uh, uh, sunroom and everything. When Jim left, he had some partners. He left there for 18 months. We said, hey, then, you know, we built owned our house, spent $175,000, and it was less than two years, he was back again. He told me he wouldn't have but about eight dogs there of his. Within two weeks, a month at least, he had 100 dogs there. He got the business back from them, and they're the ones that turned him into codes. I've never called codes on him. You try to be a good neighbor. But when you're trying to do this, you know, you just can't put up with it. My house wouldn't bring 50% of what I've got in it because no one's going to move right there next to me. It's just too close. And I live on kind of a hill, and the uh, he's in the valley right below me. His house is way up from there. Uh, he's got two vans that go in and out all the time picking up dogs and delivering them. Now, these are not his dogs. These are people that 
is boarding their dogs with him. That's what he's done for years. That's where he makes his money. Uh, the soundproof buildings are not soundproof, believe me. You can hear them inside the building. You can hear them outside. We can't have company on the new patio that we built and everything for a holiday or something because that's when he gets all of his dogs. I mean, people are going places, and so he's filled up. Well, we got to go inside, you know. It's really not fair to us. And all of the neighbors around, Fox Chase behind us, they're here. They can hear him a, 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 a half a mile away. Of course, he keeps them up at his house, too. Uh, another neighbor here that's, I mean, you can hear them all over the neighborhood. You can be at the store, Baker's Market, and you can hear them barking. But it's just a okay. shame so that, okay. I know Mr. White will want to kind of wrap up and, uh, yeah. so Mr. White, Thank wrap you. us up. And uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, as we've commented earlier, I listened to the board very carefully in the first case. It was my law partner, George Dean, that was reminding the board about the fact that for property values, it just can't be opinion. You have to have somebody with expertise. We've got a broker here who's clearly taking care of that issue. The other one is under the general conditions under integrity of adjacent areas, quote, will not adversely affect other property in the area. Uh, we've clearly heard testimony about that. We've heard testimony about uh, noise. And the, and the basic issue here is someone's basically flaunted a court order, continued to operate, relied on the goodwill of their neighbors, and then has the audacity to come down to this board and say, I'm looking for uh, a special exception. I really don't think I need it. Well, of course he does because of the boarding. And, and, and if anybody thinks these are all his dogs, we're all somewhere other than Nashville right now. Uh, I'll, I'll comment by saying, to my knowledge and the councilman's knowledge, there's not one neighbor that is supportive of this. And in the comments by this board earlier, they talked about public health, safety, and welfare. They talked about the fact that that prior applicant had reached out to the neighbors and trying to reach some resolve. There's been no reach out here whatsoever. Uh, and so I'd respectfully ask it be denied. I'd ask that all those people that are here in opposition to this raise their hand. We don't know of anybody that's supportive. The last thing I'll comment is about at the request of the codes department, Mr. Darrell's here, I wish the board would ask him what happened when he went out there and looked at it and verified this commercial operation. Please come to the microphone uh, and state your name, full name, address, and, oh, the one over here, one over here. <laughs> and tell us what you observed and when. My name is Darrell Hardrick, Sr. I am a codes uh, inspector for Property Standards Division of Davidson County, Nashville. Uh, on the 6th of June, I did receive a complaint uh, from my office uh, about the property at 1611 Springfield Highway. Uh, the violation was that we do have a standing court order uh, and the illegal kennel was being operated. So as far as you're concerned, this is a valid court order from years to 2011, that's still valid? Yes. Okay. Um, because of the nature of the complaint, uh, we scheduled it for a weekend inspection. Uh, I did take photos, which I brought with me, and I'll pass up to you guys. On the 16th of that same month, June, at 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning, I did pay a visit to 1611 uh, Springfield Highway. Uh, what I observed, and I have, I have no vested interest one way or the other, I just report and uh, verify and report back. Uh, what I observed was to be operating was a kennel. Uh, he does have a commercial vehicle that's, that has the name of the business on it. Uh, Dogs are escape artists because I did take a picture of one that was escaping while I was out there. So uh, one got out. Uh, there are several there are several runs that I took pictures of and several kennel spaces. There was one young lady on the property that was I'm assuming was the manager, and she did in turn call Mr. Sawyer's and let, and let him know that I was there. Upon talking to Mr. Sawyer's, uh, because he could not come out. That morning, I scheduled a sit-down with him with my supervisor, Jim McDance. And from that point, we advised Mr. Sawyers that he was in violation, but he did have another, another option, which was to come before you guys. And right now, I have an open case, and I'm waiting for the decision of this board to move forward, whether to pursue the warrant or close the case. Okay. Any questions for... Um, our codes inspector. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. White, anything else? No, Mr. Chairman, we want to uh, 
uh, urge the board to deny this and make sure the board knows we fully intend to follow this matter through the court system this time uh, with every authority the court has got, which apparently it's going to take here to get this gentleman's attention. Okay, let's hear from the applicant again, rebuttal time. This is rebuttal where you get to respond to what you have heard. Well, um, I really, I'm just going to tell you, I did not know that there was an open case. I thought the case was over because we emptied the kennel. Are you saying that when the codes inspector and his supervisor came out to see you, they didn't tell you you had an open case? They certainly did not. So you're finding that out today from us. But I guess, I guess when you, if you cleared everything out, and you did what you thought the court said to do, at some point. And at, and at that time, he was not the. That's, uh, that's not my question. the lady's name? Sandy? Yeah, I, I've got a question. The question is, you thought you followed the court order yes. by emptying everything out. Yes. And at some point after that, you started up again. At, after that, we had visits from codes, Sandy somebody, that's, that's now retired, that he took her place, and she came out there all the time checking on what we were doing. We had our own dogs and we were training. We had our own dogs and we were training our own dogs. I was judging field trials, the whole thing. When did you, testified, you testified earlier that, that all you're doing now is, is training your own dogs, and, and the code said, no, you got a van that's got your logo on it and you're bringing other dogs in. So who are those dogs? It's for the therapy dogs. But that's a business. I mean, that's a... A nonprofit. It's it's in your packet. Well, a non. I mean, a, a nonprofit. That's it's still a nonprofit business. Right. And that's why we're. But that's here. what the court says you can't do. Well, Isn't it? well, we understood that we needed to come get uh, the special exception so that we would be. Okay. Do you do you board other people's dogs for money? Yes, I have. And it goes into the therapy dog. No, I say in the present. So you do. Was, the lady that was sitting right here. I board her dogs too, but and I don't charge her. But you do for other people. Do you know what that is under our laws? Yeah, that's commercial. That's a kennel. You don't have a license to do a kennel. I'm sorry. There is a court order that is still active that says you're not supposed to be doing this. All right. Do you have anything else to add? No, sir, I do not. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, let's close the public hearing. So I'm going to get started. So the way that this works is the environmental court has allowed us to go first, if you will. And... Anything short of just holding him in violation, they might just close their case. I want this to go back to the environmental court. So um, I think we need to find that basically um, deny this request, and then the environmental court will basically deal with this open court case. Does that not make sense? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that, that environmental court should have it. I, I don't understand the confusion. Uh, I think that there's, there's uh, a very, very long history of, of, I'll call it confusion. And, you know, uh, we, we have seen impact. I think that, you know, we talked about that uh, in the last case. I, I do understand that the desire to move, but I think there's been the move before. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, that's, I, I guess me, I, get, I get the whole story, cool. but I think, I think to me that the, the court case is and, out there. And, and to me, he has not met the items of special exception, like the other case where there was testimony of smell, of noise, particularly during the holidays. People can enjoy their back porch. So he has not met those requirements to me. I, I think it's at least at, at very minimum deny the special exception until the court case is resolved. Okay. Well, do you want to do Okay, I, I just move that we deny the special exceptions because he has not met these requirements and that um, that he needs to, that hopefully Metro will continue this um, in environmental court. So that's my motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye, opposed, passes. John Michael. 
Mr. Chairman, circling back on our docket to the original sequence of cases, the next case to be called is 2018-381, which involves the property at 1024 West Kirkland Avenue. That's property over in Council District Number 8, just off the uh, Galton Pike Corridor as you head toward Madison, but not yet to Madison. The request is for a variance from sidewalk requirements of the subject property shown here on the zoning map, shown here in the aerial photograph and a relatively recent aerial photograph. The proposed layout for the property and the expansion uh, that they want to bring forward is actually triggering the sidewalk requirement. The view of the property in the lower right-hand corner from my recent site visit, the view directly across the street in the upper left. Finally, the view up and down West Kirkland at this particular location in, these, in this slide. Uh, the appellant is present. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 381? Seeing none, the appellants will have five minutes to make the desired presentation. Please come forward at this time. Introduce yourself by name and address. Make the desired presentation with regard to your variance from sidewalk requirements. Are they here? <laughs> Ryan Sanchez or anyone else for case number 381 or anyone else who spoke to me earlier today wanting to present their case on this case. Seeing no one would recommend to the board either denial of the case or deferral. Either is defer one meeting. Yeah, I mean, unless we wanted to approve what planning said, we just approve oh, it. No, no, no. Uh, no, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> okay, we'll bring it back. Okay, next case, John Michael. The next case to be presented is case number 2018. <laughs> The next case for the board's consideration is 2018-385 involving the property at 3804 Fairview Drive in Council District Number 1. The request is for a variance from sidewalk requirements at the property shown here on the zoning map, undeveloped as shown in the zoning map and in the aerial photograph. Uh, the proposed development is placement of a modular home as shown here from my recent site visit on the subject property, the view across the street in the upper left-hand corner, the view up and down Fairview on this slide. You see, of course, no sidewalks at this location. However, the uh, placement of the modular home does, in fact, trigger the same requirements as the construction of a new single-family home under the zoning code, ergo the sidewalk requirement with this particular case and the request for a variance therefrom. The appellant is present. We'll have five minutes to make the desired presentation if, in fact, there is no one here in opposition to case number 385. Seeing no one, please just introduce yourself by name and address. Hi, my name's Amanda Villalobos, um, 3703 Dickerson Pike. And I am here because there isn't a sidewalk on the street or in the neighborhoods around us. And I've spoken to a neighbor and I told her about my case and about the sidewalk and how I wanted to get it. Um, Variance, I guess. I'm sorry. I'm not really familiar with the terms y'all use. <laughs> but um, the reason I do not want the sidewalk is because there are financial issues that prevent us from having one and because there isn't a sidewalk to connect to. So when did you move this modular home on the property? Uh, when it was approved by Metro Codes. So you don't own the land, you just rent No, I, them. I own the land. Oh, you do? Okay. Mm -hmm. Questions of the applicant? And do you plan on building a, another home there? Or is this, is this? No, it's okay. just the one house for yeah. my family. And we're thinking about putting a small 10 by 10 porch in the front and then a bigger porch in the back. My dad's building right now an eight foot tall fence. So you I, said you didn't want to build a sidewalk. Why not pay into the sidewalk fund? I wasn't aware of that. So you could either build the sidewalk or pay into the fund, which is also a charge you have to pay a certain amount. I, wouldn't, I didn't know anything about this. Okay, any other questions? The applicant. I was going to ask what the frontage was on this, but John, like, never mind. John Michael. John Michael. Rich. 
cheaper to build the sidewalk. Yeah. John Michael. Uh, could we go back? Do you, was there a site plan that showed the? There was not a site plan submitted. Property front. Did, did it say on the uh, metro map that you had up? in the 50. Okay. From my recent visit, Mr. Harper, I would estimate this to be not too far off of a traditional 50-foot frontage, just based on eyeballing it. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. We'll close the public hearing. Discussion? No, I don't see the hardship, so... I'm going to make a motion. I will move to... Um, Deny the variance request. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. John Michael. Next case to be presented to the board is case number 2018-408, or rather 402, sorry, involving the property at 1502 57th Avenue North in the nation's neighborhood, council district number 20. The property shown here on the zoning map shows the property which actually fronts 57th and North South Street that you see here on this map, uh, and is the only street on that block face that does so, and then intersects at alley, uh, identified there as alley number 1210. The aerial photograph shows the undeveloped lot, and it's pretty close to its current condition. A lot of development going on around it, but there sits that last corner. The site plan submitted shows the proposed layout for the structures on the property. The variance request is, of course, for both front and rear setbacks for this lot. Again, as shown here, uh, five-foot setback reduction on the front, five-foot setback reduction on the rear. From my recent site visit, the properly placed sign on the subject lot, the view across the street in the upper left-hand corner, and then the view up and down 57th on this slide. As there, there was someone here in opposition on case number 402, so as the uh, appellant still, comes forward on this are they, case. Are they still here? I believe yes. so. Okay, yes. good. So the appellant will come forward, introduce yourself by name and address, and make the presentation of the board. You'll have 10 minutes. Feel free to save any portion of that for rebuttal time if you wish. Then we'll hear from the opposition. Hi, my name is Britt DePriest, 1601A, 7th Avenue North. Um, I submitted with a packet here. Um, some documentation of the surrounding setbacks of homes in the general area. I don't know if you have that or if I need to hand that out to you now, but I'm going to reference it a few times. Um, I guess that's a question to the board. I, I submitted a, a, a diagram showing that, um, yes, that's the one. Thank you. This is our uh, packet. This lot was subdivided, we believe, in 1945. That's, a, that's according to the publicly available information. Um, and it led to just, I guess you would call it an excessive shallowness of the lot. Um, most of the lots in the nation's neighborhood that are on corners like this are 150 feet deep. And they front, I guess I would call it a state street. Because this lot was subdivided, and this lot fronts one of the numbered streets, um, it is only 60 feet deep. Um, and that is the hardship that we are, that, that we believe you have jurisdiction over here today, is the excessive shallowness of the lot. On the diagram that I submitted with this packet, uh, what I'm attempting to show here is that even with the 15-foot front setback and 15-foot rear setback, we are still further from the property line than all of the homes that I've shown on this diagram, which are all of the homes that immediately border this property. Um, the homes built both to the north and south, which are homes B and D on your diagram, both front a state street, and they are both 10 feet from 57th Avenue, which is the street that this home will front. The homes across the street, um, according to their SP documentation, are, gonna, are, are between three and 10 feet from the property line. And I've just presented this information to you in, in an attempt to show that we're not contradicting the established pattern of development in this neighborhood. All right. And I will reserve the remainder of my time for rebuttal. Okay, let's hear from the opposition. Please come forward, state your name, address, and why you're opposed.
Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jill McMillan, and I'm at 5611 California Avenue, which is the property that borders uh, other. the north no. of this. Um, but first, before giving my testimony, I'd like to read a letter um, that wasn't able to be submitted in advance. Um, but this is from Christopher Sean and Abby Harris, who are at 5609B California Avenue, which is the property next to us. Um, and it reads as follows. As homeowners of the adjacent property in negotiation, we strongly oppose and disapprove of any changes to the set zoning requirements. Our fence line shares the property with the aforementioned property, and if the builder pushes the agenda to have the house, etc., backed up against our fence, our property value will decrease. In the event we should have to sell our property, it will decrease our ability to do so. It is our right as home and landowners to oppose these changes that directly affect our property. property. It is also our experience with builders in this neighborhood that they operate out of greed just to make a buck on properties rather than valuing the integrity and appeal of the neighborhood by abiding by the preset rules. Additionally, our quality of life will be markedly decreased having a new building directly against our fence line as this greatly de decreases our privacy. Sincerely, Abby Harris and Christopher Sean Harris. Is that, are those the people that live right next door? So they are, um, that are live that diagonal. So their back yard fence will be at the rear of this property. Can we go back to the satellite? Hi, my name's Roger William Hutton. I live at 5610 Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, Abby and Sean live in the first rectangle house to the right of the red icon. Okay. The first rectangle house. Okay. Where do you all live? I live, uh, if you take a, a, a straight line from the red icon straight down, that's my gray okay. house and cement driveway. Right. And I'm at the house on the north yes. side of that. So let me ask you this. The letter that you just read their property is closer to this one than they will be to theirs. I mean, their, their garage is, it looks like a five foot side setback. They're five feet from the fence. He's gonna be 15 feet from the fence. Um, so he's further away than to them than they are to him. And I know now, but if you're just to the north of that one, are you the, you're the one in the other half of this subdivided lot? Correct, we're at the top of the subdivided well, lot. Well, and it looks like you have a further, a deeper setback than he's asking. I mean, it looks like that you're closer <laughs> to the back. It looks like you're closer to your neighbors whose letter you just read than this applicant is asking. So, so why should you get point, something your neighbor shouldn't, your next door neighbor shouldn't? We bought the house, um, and if you know that five foot setback was in question when we, you know, we didn't build the house at the time, we weren't involved in that hearing. Um, but five feet is very close for us and our, we love Sean and Abby, but it is very close. Um, and, you know, I think our issue here as well um, is that um, the codes are here for a reason. And by granting these variances with the builders that have already taken advantage in this neighborhood and pushed homes closer to them what they should be, um, it's really granting a pure money grab to this builder. Um, from as we understand it right now, Mr. Lauderbeck, who currently owns the property, Rogers ha has had issues with this property owner in the past in the construction of his home. And then also, as we understand it, Mr. Lauderbeck is planning to sell the property to City Limits Construction. Uh, the owner is Ken, who um, built our home, and we had multiple issues during closing and after with the state of the property and that our home was left in. Um, including um, cheap construction mistakes, such as an upstairs toilet left unsealed that nearly ruined our kitchen and first floor. Um, passed off is not a big deal and fixed to the bare minimum. Four blue tape walkthroughs where work had not been done, where we were scheduled to come to the house and claimed it was all done and completed and it wasn't. Uh, nuanced interpretation of our closing agreement, which the builder interpreted providing a refrigerator as sending a link to our closing agent to say, well, here's the one I would buy. Um, and then rather than buying, installing the refrigerator himself. Um, so if the builder that did ours does this to the property behind, we're worried about the quality of that construction, not just the pure codes you know, by asking these easements, we're just asking that an appropriately sized home is built on this lot that's already on a very crowded corner. So, but, but you're, but, all right, so the meat of your testimony that I hear is that, that it is your testimony that it's your belief that this property owner is asking for a variance in order to 
make it buildable in a way that would make his lot more profitable so he can sell it. Right. Okay. As, I, as we understand it, he's supposed to be... And we can ask the builder that, but that's your, that's your belief. Okay. As I understand, he's going to build a 2,200-square-foot house in a lot that's half the size of mine in a space much, much smaller. Where, they, where they're going to put their trucks, the dumpster, and everything that comes with construction for six months to a year is beyond me because there's no available space. Right. I came uh, uh, error widths from going to litigation with my builder. I built, I was lucky enough to pay for ca uh, cash with my house. I lived in Los Angeles. I did, married a woman here. I moved to, California, to Nashville. It's wonderful. I've had more problems with my house, more problems with George and his uh, sister-in-law partner than I've had with any other bu business dealings in my entire life. It, we have a war we had a one year warranty. It took him ten months to respond. My text messages, emails, phone calls. He built four houses, houses across the street. Not once did she come over and say, "Is there something I can fix?" Yeah. Okay. Uh, documentation on that, if you need it. Uh, so we're asking that this builder carefully consider the appropriate size and restrictions of the lot in question. Um, to build an appropriately sized home instead of just dropping another cookie cutter profitable model on this lot. It, it's laziness, frankly. Any other questions? Okay, anything else to add? Let's hear from the, any other opposition? Let's hear from the applicant again. I made a note of their objections, and if, if it's appropriate, I'll just run down and rebut each That's one of them. That's what rebuttal is for. Very good. So um, as to the uh, prospect of a property value decrease b because this home is being built, a standard side setback in the nations on the 25-foot-wide on the lots that builders generally build on is a three-foot side setback. So this is not a lesser setback than what most people build to over there. Um, as to building directly on the fence line, we're not doing that. Uh, we're asking for a decrease from 20 feet to 15 feet. Um, as to an appropriately sized home, the home, you know, they, they generally shoot for around 2,200 square feet over there, which is approximately the same size as the home in front of us, the one just north of the red icon there, that is on the same size lot. But just because it got to use California as its front setback line instead of 57th, the aspect of the lot was different and it's not as shallow. Um, as to the issues that, that both parties have had with the builder, if the board feels that is relevant, then I'll, I'll do what I can to rebut that. If the board feels that's not relevant, then I'll just let that rest. Okay. So and I guess the, the, the profit motive, I mean, are you planning to sell the lot? Uh, uh, do you have plans for this or do you develop? Are you planning to develop this? Or? Uh, you know, I, I am the realtor in the transaction. George Lauterbeck, the applicant, is selling this to another builder. So he is going to sell this, uh, assuming that the BZA uh, appeal is successful. So why do you need these setbacks? Why can't you just build within the code? Well, so there are several homes in the nations that are 20 feet wide, 19 feet wide, I should say. Um, when you talk about building a home that's 20 feet deep, it becomes very difficult to include the things that a buyer and the nations are going to look for in the first floor in that home. Um, with a 20-foot wide plan, some of that's a hallway. How much does this lot cost? Uh, it, I believe that George paid 150000 for it when he purchased it, the current owner. So he paid market value, basically. He did. Do you, do you yes. know what, uh, and I may, we may call, I may call the neighbor back, but sure. Uh, on, this is 57th. How far from the street is the home at the top of the page and the t home at the bottom of the page, which seemed to be reasonably in line, do you know? Sure. So in the packet that I provided, I have, uh, these were not measured by a surveyor, but I have their building permits, and it is showing that both of those homes are 10 feet from 57th Avenue, which is five feet Well, they're less. more than 10 feet from 52nd Avenue. They may be 10, 10 feet from the property line. Correct. They're more I'm than sorry. 10 feet from, yeah, correct. from the 10 property feet from line. 10 feet from the set line, set, set, or the property line. Yes, sir. All right. You're correct. And so why can't you build the new home in line with the one to the north. It sounds like you were proposing to, for it to be five feet back behind that 
Uh, well, we are. I mean, I guess we could do that, but we were just trying not to come in here forward. asking for too much. You know, we, we thought if we if asking for a little it less. Forward towards 57th, you wouldn't need the rear setback, correct? That would you seem would, to make sense to me, yes. You would uh, need a 10-foot um, variance on the front. In the front, yes, ma'am. And it would accomplish the same goal. Any other questions for the applicant? Uh, just, I'm sorry, sure. can, can I Continue. add of one course. more thing? Um, I did meet with the nation's um, zoning committee, the neighborhood zoning committee. They took no specific position which is just their way of saying, we don't have an objection, but we're not in, no. you know, jumping up and down. And the same deal with the council person, so. Okay, any, any other questions of the applicant? No, we'll close the public hearing. Discussion. Well, I, he certainly has a right to build on the property, and it is a narrow lot and shallow lot. Um, I would support the little different variance than what he was asking, and it would be the 10-foot variance from the front and no variance at the rear. It sounded like that was acceptable. So what do we think about that? Uh, yeah, I, I would, yes, I, I think that, you know, it, it is it is an odd-shaped lot that they do have a right to build on it. They. Um, the nature of that lot, their rear setback um, is the same as the neighbor's side setback, and it's just the way they come together. And so, you know, if if, uh, if it had faced the the street that the one above it faces, that's the reason that that one is so close to the line, is it faces the other direction. Uh, I think that it's important that, you know, the testimony was that that those houses were 10 feet from the line. Our intent is for those, for this home to line up with that plane between those, the two homes in between it. And if we say 10 feet, I just want it to be on record that the intent is for it to line up uh, based on the testimony today. Uh, so if, if all of a sudden it, uh, you know, it's a lot closer to the road than those other two, <laughs> the neighbors can come back and say, no, this isn't what, what they said. But I, I think that that 10 foot uh, front with no in, uh, in the back makes sense for that space given its neighbors. Okay, someone have a motion? Sir, sure, I will move to approve a variance request for the front setback to be 10 feet in lieu of the 20 feet that's required by code and no rear setback. Okay. And we're set back approved. Variance. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, so no variance. Or no. Yeah, no variance for okay. the rear setback. Yeah. <laughs> Motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. John Michael. The next case to be presented to the board is case number 2018 408. It involves the property at 4738 White's Creek Pike, Council District Chief Number Matt One. Law. Here we go, as shown here on the zoning map, as shown here on the aerial photography. Stephen Camp is the appellant and owner of the property. Uh, his request is for a variance from side setback requirements out in this AR2A zoning district in order to construct a detached garage into the setbacks. Site plan submitted shows the approximate area where he would be seeking to get into that 20 foot required side. 16 and a half, give or take, is the side setback proposed for this structure based on the site plan submitted. From my recent site visit out to the property in wild, wonderful White's Creek, you see the area already in place. Obviously, this is a structure already constructed. As a result, that's where we need the variance from the board based upon the prior construction. From the assessor's website, the picture in the lower right-hand corner shows the primary uh, residential structure on the property, the view across the street, across the pike, as it were, in the upper left, and the view up and down White's Creek Pike, uh, generally demonstrating the particularly rural nature of the area on this slide. Mr. Camp is present and had the opportunity to make his presentation to the board. Is there anyone here in opposition? Seeing no one, Mr. Camp will have five minutes. Just introduce yourself by name and address. My name is Stephen Kenneth Camp, 4738 White's Creek Pike. Um, homeowner uh, requesting a uh, side setback variance uh, for garage that I previously constructed. Um, 
and I'm uh, requesting that uh, variance for the per uh, reason for just desiring to permit the structure. Did you have a permit when you built this? I did not. Oh. So, John Michael, what is the general fine when you build something without a permit? And then have Obviously, to a permit has to be obtained. It's part of so we can go through and do the inspections with the codes inspectors to make sure it's built to the appropriate building and trades codes and is safe for uh, occupancy and use. Uh, but the permit is triple feed at that point. So a permit that might have cost, I don't know, $1,000 at that point automatically costs 3000 in that scenario when the work was initiated, let alone completed, without the permit. So if you built such a structure and it looks nice, you've built things before, you know about permits, why didn't you get a permit? Sir, I'm embarrassed to say I'm a contractor and I built my house, uh, it's, it's permitted and uh, it was um, legal all the way through. I wanted a garage on the property, I couldn't put it so much in the front yard because I thought, it, well I, I could have, it would have obstructed the view of the house, I didn't want to put it in the backyard to obstruct the view there. Uh, so I placed it in an area uh, where, uh, to prevent any kind of water from ponding there. And when I placed it in that area, uh, I w am uh, within the 20 feet uh, side setback. The front is at 16.57, the back is at 16.8. And then I uh, intruded on the uh, 114 square feet into the flood buffer. So I went through a stormwater variance and I have met uh, all of their requirements there, but it was, it was a judgment call. Unfortunately, um, it was an improper judgment call. Uh, I do wanna say that um, uh, there was no one that um, you know turned me in or anything like that. It was my own volition and conviction and uh, here we are. Ah, uh, self-reporting. So did, is, how's your neighbor? Your, your neighbor is okay with the setback? Yes, uh, he is. Uh, he asked about one of the letters that went out and what it was all about. Um, his response was he, he was, had no concern about that. Uh, he and I are friendly. So, Anything else to add? Um, i just like to say that um, uh, variance request was granted by Stormwater. I uh, had a certified arborist letter uh, stating the landscaping project required by stormwater variance committee has been installed per their uh, per the approval plan is complete. I have an architect's letter stating the the structure is structurally sound and compliant with current building codes. I sent a letter to my district council member um, informing her of my actions, and then uh, sent out, of course, the uh, zoning appeal letters, place a sign. And I began the application for Wait a minute, the permit. Wait her. Who did you send that to? That would have been a while back, Mr. Chairman. You may recall uh, Council Member at Large Chan Hurt actually represented District mm -hmm. 1 at one time, I think. Of during the five out of the two between. years. Yeah, you, you got a pretty good chance if you send it to anybody. There's about a one in five shot you hit the right council member there. <laughs> okay. Then finally, uh, I began the application process after I went through the stormwater variance meeting, and there was a flag in there that I was too close to the I was within the setbacks. Uh, sewer and water variance approval uh, has been met, flood plan review and, and grading review. So this is the last stop. Okay, so any other questions of the applicant? Okay, let's close the public hearing. Discussion. Well, I think the hardship could be that he was trying to avoid the the ponding water, I think, is At something. At the front, yes, ma'am. Water, um, trying to build it in the right place on the property to avoid the water infiltration, something like that. Yes, the water. So okay, the well, the public hearings. So we've closed the public hearing. Him, but, We're but, done. Um, sorry, so, okay, so you want to make a motion to that effect? Sure, I will. Unless there's more, no. Um, I will move to approve the variance request um, due to the characteristics of the site with the the way the site is um, handles stormwater. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. John Michael. 
The next case of the board's consideration is 2018-410 involving the property at 521 Arrowwood Drive out in lovely Creve Hall, Council District Number 26. The request is for a variance uh, from rear setbacks and from maximum height for the construction of another accessory structure at the subject location. The aerial map here shows the subject property. Um, in the depiction presented by the appellant this gives you some indication of the proposed area for the garage. They'll probably Here's describe it. that, I can certainly hope, with greater detail. Uh, from my recent site visit, view of the property from the front and up and down Arrowwood uh, here. We'll go back to the aerial to give you a sense. The neighborhood just off of Trousdale. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 410? There is. As a result, the appellants will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation. Any time you wish to save for uh, rebuttal, save out of this original 10 minutes. The opponents would have the opportunity to speak thereafter. Um, just introduce yourself by names and address and make the desired presentation. Thank you. Uh, William Haynes, 521 Arrowwood Drive. <clears throat> um, we would like to build a, a uh, garage um, a detached two-story garage because um, we do not ha currently have a garage for our vehicles. We want to make it two-story because um, we like to be in the neighborhood a long time. We have two young boys, five and two years old, and we'd like to put a, like a, basically a bonus room, playroom above it. Um, I've already signed something with codes to the effect that I will not rent it out or seek short-term um, short rental. Um, also... Um, well, you wouldn't put any showers in it anyway, would you? No. No, I was just planning on doing a half bath upstairs because it's going to be a playroom, and then I'd like to have a sink in the, um, in the garage itself. Sink, no kitchen, no shower. No kitchen for sure. Yeah, and no if shower. you want no shower, that's fine with me too. Yes. Okay. Um, typically, there's a 16-foot height requirement um, for, for the neighborhood, unless you're above an acre. We have 0.51 acres um, and um, a, most of our property, as far as the hardship is concerned, most of our property is um, unusable due to a 100-foot uh, setback in the front. And I think you have that um, due to the waterway, the, the flood zone. Um, and, um, and also, there's an extreme elevation change as you get to the back of the property. Um, there are... Um, I brought, um, I th in addition to the packet, I also brought, I just had a survey done that shows the replacement of the garage. I made eight copies in case y'all wanted to see them. Um, it just shows where the garage exactly is going. So, And it's pretty much the only place we can build on the property due to the fact that all the front is unusable and <clears throat> the elevation change from where the house is. Um, I would like to point out a couple of things. Number one, uh, aesthetics is very important to us, um, keeping the value of the neighborhood. Uh, there are three two-story structures on the street. Um, uh, although our house is, is one story, um, I... Uh, I plan to vault the second floor, so you, the wall may go up like four feet, four or five feet. So will vault. this out structure be taller than your normal house? It will be taller than a normal house, um, which is why I'm requesting the, the variance. Um, John Michael, is that legal under our code? The variance would baptize it, frankly, just to kind of put it like it is. But generally, you cannot have an accessory structure taller than mm -hmm. the uh, primary structure absent of variance from the Board of Zoning Appeals. We see this a lot in contextual overlay districts where, yes, you're allowed to have a detached accessory dwelling unit, a, a detached garage, whatever the case may be. But under those circumstances, you cannot have a detached structure that is taller than the primary. Uh, obviously, part of the trick here has to do with the um, topography, the slope mm -hmm. of the lot. But visually from Arrowwood, it may not appear to be taller. We occasionally bump into problems where people want us to go check stuff out where a lot is uphill, and it looks like we're seeing something that is a lot tall that really is not, just because of the change in grain. Mr. Taylor? Yeah, did, did you give these pictures, or is that something from the opposition? I those. Oh, okay. The, um, have you seen the pictures? Uh, no, sir, I have not. Well, then give them. Yeah, I gave those to you. Yeah. Thank you. No, I have. Yeah. So, 
I guess I'm looking at one that has this. Yeah, this is the property next door to us. Um, 517. 517 Arrowwood. They're immediately to the, the left. If you're facing our house, they're immediately to, immediately to the left. But is this your driveway and retaining wall? No, that is the neighbor's driveway and retaining wall and fence. And so your house is the one to the right? Correct. Okay. Correct, yes. Um, and again, for context, Mr. Chairman, these are photographs submitted by the opposition sure. for the board's okay. consideration. So it may be that he's in a better position to respond to any questions about that in rebuttal. Yeah, no, I just wanted to know whose house was whose and why it was here. Okay. Um, also, because the topography change, the 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 garage would be effectively going underground as you go further back. So um, the effective height might be wind up being a lot less than 24 feet. Um, but I even brought a picture to show the. Um, if you face rear on our property, the, um, the our driveway, then a retaining wall, and then the bottom of the fence behind us, which is at least eight feet going uphill in the, in the property behind us. I've talked to her. She's fine with it. She's so far elevated that she'll be looking down on the garage anyway from her point of view. Um, but... Um, yeah, we plan to, to break it to match the house, make it aesthetically pleasing. It's going to look really good. And, okay. Um, so you've we'd talked like to, some more space because we have a very small house. So you've talked to your neighbors, and I know you've got a letter from Councilman Elrod supporting your variance, too. Do you have a, any other? Uh, I think we have, like I said, maybe one neighbor that, that provided pictures that we'll speak in a minute. But We had, um, uh, yeah, Mr. Elrod approved the project. I explained it to him. He thought it was a good idea. I uh, had uh, one neighbor showed up here but had to leave after a while go back to work. David Harvick lives across the street. And um, he actually, after he left, he emailed a letter to you guys and me uh, voicing his um, support of it as well. So, but I'll, I'll save the rest of our time for rebuttal if necessary. Okay. Let's hear from the opposition. Please come forward, state your name and address for the record and why you're opposed. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is George Fussner. I'm an attorney in Brentwood, Tennessee. The address is 7104 Peach Court. And I represent um, Helen Underhill. She lives at uh, 517 Arrowwood Drive. She can't be here. She's over 80 years old. She has serious health problems, including heart, recent stroke, and the stress of this was just not going to be good for her. So she asked me to come on her behalf. Um, so she's lived at the house next to this one for uh, since 1985 and the uh, picture I presented the four pictures that were taken uh, the first picture is shows the two driveways her property is to the left um, and this yeah. property is to the right um, and then the next picture in the sequence is a little bit more close up where you can see the corner where that retaining wall is um, and then the uh, chain link fence chain link fence is approximately six inches on her side of what she claims is the property line. Uh, there actually is a, a boundary dispute concerning that that is not in play here. Um, then you've got the retaining wall. Uh, it is quite frankly starting to crumble and fail. And the where he's going to build the structure is approximately 10 feet off of her driveway when you look at that. So you go 10 feet and then you put 24 feet on top of it, you've got a three and a half story building that's right over. I'm sorry, how, how, how big? He, he wants to go 24 and he's starting 10 feet over her driveway. So he's going to be effectively 35 feet over her driveway. Okay. Relative to it. So um, that bank is not stable. It actually washed out in the 2010 floods and put a a foot of dirt in her driveway. That's her only ingress and egress practically to the house. She has a front door, but that's more difficult. So our major objection is, is that number one, he hasn't shown a hardship. Hardship of his undoing, unfortunately bought a house too small. Um, I've done the same thing. And um, so now he has to build a garage to do it. We're very concerned with building a garage that's 24 feet tall and obviously starting to use the upper part for residential purposes. That's not a garage. Um, the, um, 
when you look at the standards for review to granting a variance, um, you know, the property was bought as is. Uh, it's, he didn't create the problem, he created his own problem by buying it. Um, there has to be no injury to the adjacent property. And there is an injury to the adjacent property because the um, codes say that it's not supposed to cut off light to it. And here you're putting 24 foot structure, 35 feet blocking out the driveway uh, to this home that as you can see has vegetation, has ivy and those type of things gonna be blocked out from the sun. So that light will be reduced. And then you've got the harm to the, the public of, the, of the, uh, that the construction and the weight of that building moving, sliding that um, hillside down again. So you've got a safety issue involved. Um, but how, how would, if, if this is built up to code, how would the construction of that building impact that hill? Because you've got a, you, because you have weight on top of it and it's filled. It washed off once, and there was actually, before they bought the house, there was a, a extension on the house to the left that actually f fell off the, the slope. That's how unstable the soil was. So you're building a big garage that has this, the uh, great uh, impact of doing exactly the same thing and ending up in her driveway, which is a real problem. So um, just sort of in summer, we don't think he's met the criteria showing hardship. Um, and then, um, do you think he's met the hardship of the, the rear setback? We don't have an issue on that. It's, it's just the height issue. setback. It's just the height setback. That's it's the problem. And is there, I mean, I, and I, and I get it. I, I would, you know, it, I, I, I understand the need and the desire for, to me, for more information, uh, a plan. I, I don't, I still am trying to figure out, um, you know, how a, a well-built garage on a firm foundation is gonna move the land because that, by, I mean, if that's just, they're designed not to do that. So, um, but yet, I, you know, I, I, I know, I know how- People that have houses slide off the well, I, yeah, hills I mean, out I'd, there. Yeah, I had a, yeah, a friend whose Think apartment building filled. slid down a hill in Birmingham but exactly. for, because they were building a mall next to it and dug out too much. I get that, but it- um, Did you say it was fill? Yes. It wasn't soil. It, 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 it was went off once before and the, and the flood washed it off in 2010. Okay. And, and I guess the only other uh, piece on, on that is, would your client, um, I, don't, I think that we, we have a site plan and we have a proposal and an idea, but we don't have you know, a, a drawing. Would your client be willing to work with her next door neighbor uh, on options that would meet the concerns? You know, I mean, I, I think if it's, it sounds like if you have no opposition to the rear setback and it, I, I think there's a hardship for Clearly, for the rear setback, um, based on the the uh, the frontage, um, it, would you be amenable to working with the neighbor to you know talk through ideas, or is, are you just? Um, I'm just going to be frank. There's been some very very um, harsh words and things taken over, particularly over the property line, um, and some intimidating statements made. And it's just not a good neighborly situation. Okay. I mean, I wish he had counsel and then I could speak with counsel and that would smooth things out. But to date, that hasn't happened. Okay. okay. Any other questions for the opposition? Anything else to add? No, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Let's you hear from the applicant again. Rebuttal. To uh, address. Uh, Mr. Fusner's concerns. Um, number one, as far as the garage um, safety and stability is concerned, if you look at the pictures, the beginning of the proposed garage is maybe lateral to where the end of her driveway is anyway. For it to fall sideways, there's no place for it to fall sideways. Uh, maybe there's a foot overlap on the front. Number two, I mean, as far as making sure the structure is safe, that's what Metro codes will ensure. 
whenever we they could you have to get an engineer's letter and and at that point be um, have a inspection of the footer and, and everything else when you submit a proposal to go through codes to build a structure um, and they would never approve it if they thought there was a, a chance of a disaster like that occurring um, and uh, to be frank he's correct it's we, we we've tried several times to have a conversation with our neighbor and and she's not willing to have a conversation or speak to us so I, um, we regret that's the case. We've tried everything we could um, to do that, but you know, we, I don't see how this affects her at all, as a matter of fact. Um, it, it can't, I, there's no way, practical way it would cut off any light. If she's worried about privacy, I'll go on record and say, just as a consideration, I'll make sure we have no windows on the east, east facing side of the garage. Not that I would put a window in, the, in a garage anyway, even a, a two-story one. Um, so what's your hardship here? Why do you need this? Well, my hardship is I have very little space in which to build on. There is a 100-foot um, waterway uh, or setback in the front due to the waterway uh, because of the flooding zone. And then the, the, in the, the property itself goes uphill at such a steep angle um, that if you look at the... Um, the property so that's there's, that's the only space we had to build so we can't if, if i had enough space i would just go back and make it deeper or you know give myself a bigger garage or i wouldn't feel like i needed any. can you add on to your house not anymore from where it is we actually have a, a small addition under house when we bought it we renovated it why can't you add on more to your house well it there's butts up to the it butts up to the hill um basically i mean we could Right now, we turned a, it's a, it's kind of an L shape. You couldn't put a second story in your house? I don't think I could afford to put a second story in my house. That would be a lot more expensive than building a garage. Well, like I said, you're, you're requesting a two story garage. And you, and one of the reasons it's a two story garage, you say you need space. Correct, yeah. So, but there's other places on your property you could build something for more space. <laughs> Is, we could go up, I guess. Up. Yeah, but we'd have to rip the roof off the house, go up to. And I, I don't, I don't think that would be practical for for us for us to be able to do that. Whereas building a detached garage and and it would just be a lot cheaper and um, it'd be more usable for for what we're. Okay. For. Other questions of the applicant? If we don't grant the height variance, are you going to build the garage? I'll build it and just build it shorter. I guess you'll build what you can build. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, and and I guess that uh, I mean I don't know how the conversation is going, but it also if there are concerns about the height, um, I think there probably still is an you know if you you know did an L shaped garage where you know you had instead of having your second room up you had it to the side, you might need uh, you know a, a size variance of some sort, but I think that. Uh, I don't know that that would be eliminated if if the height variance here was not uh, was not granted. But if I could interject, I, I I personally would prefer not to have to go because our backyard space yeah. is pretty minuscule. It's a small um, backyard. And so our plan was to build the garage, and once that was complete, kind of turn that backyard into a usable space. Um, you know, maybe just for grilling and that kind of thing. So I think if we had to L shape yeah. into that, we'd probably lose the ability to do that. Do you have mature trees in the backyard too? Or are you losing any trees for the garage? Um, no. Is there one? Would well, we, we have one? mature trees back there. There's one, but it's not that large that we would that we would remove just to put the garage in. But um, everything else should be fine. Yeah. And any other questions? Anything else to add? Uh, no, sir. Okay. Um, Let's so. close the public hearing discussion. Okay. I mean, I, I think that they're, they clearly have proven the back setback need, and I have no issue with the back setback, and the neighbor obviously didn't. Um, I'll let you all talk about height. I, I think there's... Well, I think the neighbor did. He, he, he said he had no issue with the rear setback. Okay. So, I mean, the, the neighbor, I, we, we, yeah, he said that he said the only, the only setback they were opposed to was the height, was what yep. the, the okay. attorney said. Well, as sympathetic as I am to not having enough space to store things in a home, um, this would be a very tall structure, and 
be taller than the existing home, which we heard the, what was said about that. And so I couldn't support, I just don't see the hardship on the height variance request. Anyone have a motion? I will move to approve the rear setback variance. Can we take those separate? Sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll move to approve the site, the rear setback variance due to the um, nature, what was it, a waterway that was on, that was limiting the amount of um, buildable area site. I'll second that. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? I have one thing to say, okay. and I, I'm not sure I heard him correct, but I'm wondering, it's a 20-foot minimum setback. He's asking for 10. Does it help him if we put that all the way back to the property line? Can he build all the way back? Uh, if, if the height doesn't get um, approved, then that would allow me to uh, be able to go further back with the garage. Yes, ma'am. Would you consider that, Christina? Okay. Bending your motion if he went back. I'll second that. What was it? <laughs> um, so it would be a motion to approve the three feet career setback variance of three feet. Is that what it needs to come off the property line? At least yeah. three feet off the property line. Okay, and this is the motion's been properly made. Is there a second? Well, I, I second it, uh, but I will say I don't know. I don't know if that gives him anything because he has the uh, the utility easement. He also may have the hill. It looks like he's backed up part. the utility yeah, easement know. anyway. So, Maybe. but there it is. He can have it. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? Yeah, it was second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Passes, and you haven't talked about the height, so you need a motion pointing to the height. I will move to deny the variance request for the height. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Discussion. Well, I mean, the only th the only thing I mean, I, I, I think there is uh, uh, a hardship uh, question there. I get it. Um, I don't know if it, if it makes sense to, you know, defer that indefinitely until uh, if the applicant wants to come back with a different plan or say it says 24 feet. I just, and I just don't like it's taller than the main structure, and it seems like there's some. Well, issues I guess with I guess the I guess the question is if if the applicant says, hey, I, I want to build, I really think I can do it in 20 feet instead of 24 or whatever that was asked. They just apply again because that would be a different plan. You wouldn't have to wait six months. It would be saying, no, this is a different a different request. So if the applicant did say, you know, go back and look at it and, you know, maybe talk to an architect or whatever and said, no, hey, I can, you know, here's here's the height that you can do it. Um, and that would give him a chance to, he, he could reapply for the height if, if he wanted to with a different plan. I just, I just didn't know if the door was completely shut. Uh, and that was it. That was it. That was but your question. Okay. Well, my motion was seconded. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we can vote. Okay. Motion's been moved, made, and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. John Michael, next case. Uh, can we take a break? Oh, few months break? Yeah, a quick break. I'll take a quick break. When we reconvene, we'll hear case number 2018-413. How long is everyone here for? Can agenda at the uh, Howard School. What can go wrong? I've got four board members, so we'll reconvene. The next case to be presented is 2018-413 from Council District Number 6. You've already heard from the District Council Member with regard to this project. Manly Seal is the appellant, Robert Acuff, the owner of the property at 912 Main Street in the People's Republic of East Nashville. The request is for a variance from sidewalk and parking requirements in an MUGA zoning district. Of course, that's mixed-use general alternative zoning district for the rehabilitation of the existing structures in the manner shown here on the site plan, the structure at issue shown here from my recent site visit, the views up and down the street with the existing sidewalk on Main Street. 
Good. Um, the request, of course, is for variance in the sidewalk requirements. The council member addressed that specifically. You also have planning's recommendation in your packet, condition of the sidewalks in the area shown here. And a uh, request for variance from the parking requirements for this property as well. The appellants are present. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 413? Seeing none, the appellants will have five minutes to make the desired presentation. Folks, just introduce yourself by name and address. Okay, uh, thank you for uh, waiting till the end here. Uh, my name is Manly Seal, as uh, stated. Uh, 904A Main Street is uh, our office, which is just across, like, uh, just down the block. Um, and these are the business uh, owners here with me, or proposed business owners. Um, so, uh, uh, again, appreciate one of uh, uh, Councilman Withers, his comments and his support um, uh, for both requests, uh, and also his support to not pay the in lieu fee um, due to the, um, the bootstrap nature of this project. Um, as you can see, uh, and I think you guys have the these two letters um, that pointed out our hardships. Um, so uh, on the sidewalk um, issue, um, it was the the context of the block. Uh, there's a contiguous uh, sidewalk there already, but also several buildings that are all already built to the uh, sidewalk edge that. Um, yeah, we'll probably stay that way for a very long time. Um, the um, also the grade of the site, you can see there's a, a significant uh, difference um, there, and so uh, that would uh, require quite a bit of uh, extensive retaining wall of some uh, sort uh, to accommodate um, a sidewalk. Uh, there's also a mature tree that's on the site. Uh, that tree was planted um, as part of a replanting effort um, uh, after the tornado, I think of 98 or 99. Um, so that tree is, I mean, there's some meaning to that tree there for sure. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, cost is uh, one of the hardships, um, but, you know, I'll put that last uh, on there because there's other uh, site. Um, but you know, their, their overall budget, um, which again, Councilman Withers uh, alluded to, uh, was, you know, quite uh, small, but uh, it is, uh, they're gonna put two bathrooms in the existing building that is there and essentially build a covered patio and uh, they're gonna put in a lot of sweat equity themselves and pull whatever favors they can. So like I said, they're bootstrapping this. They, they do not own the property, so they are tenants. It's a big risk for them, the investment that they're putting in. Um, so both the sidewalk cost and the in-lieu fee, uh, the in-lieu fee would be uh, at $179 or $176 a lineal foot, ends up being about $8,800. Um, so that's already almost half of their budget. Um, and as far as the, how much time do I got? Um, as far as the parking, um, the, you know, the site really is not large enough uh, to accommodate um, uh, the, uh, 18 spaces that code says is, is required. Um, uh, they're proposing to gravel the lot and have five spaces um, uh, on the lot, uh, which is, I think, um, allowed by code uh, without having to pave the lot. Uh, if you have to pave the lot, again, that's a cost factor that would be uh, a hardship. Um, they have parking next door. Um, uh, there's five spaces, I believe, in front of the property uh, that's a right adjacent that the same building owner uh, owns and has agreed to let them use. They also currently uh, own and operate uh, Crying Wolf Bar, which is just uh, uh, down the block, um, and they have uh, uh, more than the required spaces they need there. Um, so there's uh, 10 to 15 spaces available at Crying Wolf that could so be used. I guess the question is if you. You know, if your other place is over its required spots and you can take 10 or 12 from there and and you've got four or five here, why do you need a parking variance? Why don't you just write a letter? I mean, why don't you just, can't you just have an agreement with those businesses and say these, you know, I've got four here and I, I need 18, I got four here, I got 14 over here, that's 18. You don't need a parking variance. If that is, I, I thought that that if you if you used off-site uh, parking with a shared lease agreement, that that there is no variance needed at that point. Correct. Uh, 
the Metro Code at 17.20.080, 090, and 100 kind of outlines the alternatives to meeting the parking count. The most customarily used ones are shared parking agreements and off-site parking agreements. Those are memorialized by just a simple agreement, like a contract between the parties, even if it's the same ownership group, as dumb as it seems to have a party signing a contract with the same party, Metro is technically the third party to that contract. It's reviewed by the zoning administrator into the theoretical model where we have a zoning administrator and approved for that purpose so that if there are, say, for example, 10 spaces required, 10 can be provided. The lot has to meet the requirements of 1720 for that off-site parking agreement. It has to do with proximity and access and all of that stuff. But if it meets it, then uh, it negates the need for a variance. So if you know space for space, you can meet it. If you know that this is accessible under the parameters of the code uh, in terms of uh, distance, uh, I mean, if we're talking half a mile away, that's not going to cut it, obviously. I don't have the exact provisions in front of me at the moment, but it might can be done. So, I mean, I guess, I guess to me, if I would... And and I and I'm I, I defer to I mean I think Councilman Withers is uh, you know when he asks for a variance like this it, it's it's rare so I, I I do have a lot of respect for the councilman and but also think to me I, I I mean I don't have an issue with the sidewalk variance I think to me that's fine I don't know how my fellow commissioners think but to me on the parking that's where I thought you know I I prefer to defer the parking to, you know to the next meeting see if you can meet it without coming to us which it sounds like you might be able to, and if you can avoid the parking variance, I think that's not a bad thing. Is that acceptable to you all? Yeah, okay, that's fine. Okay, so. Um, but I mean, but, but leave the door open, so if you do need it, you can come back in two yeah, weeks and, sure, and we absolutely. can address it. Yeah. You know. So we're taking care of sidewalk today. Any other questions about sidewalks? Okay, we're gonna close the public hearing. Discussion, I agree with you. Do you have yeah, a motion? I mean, I'll, I'll move that, uh, based on the recommendation of uh, Metro Council members and the Metro Council member and the uh, mature tree that we uh, approve the sidewalk variance uh, without requiring the applicant to pay into the fund uh, because there is an existing sidewalk in uh, also really great shape. Uh, as part of that motion, I will also def move to defer the parking requirement uh, variance request until the next meeting. Okay, motion has been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Great, good luck. Good luck. John Michael. The next case to be presented is 2018-416. This involves a property at 3168 Parthenon Avenue in Council District Number 21. Keith Dowd is the appellant, Mark Lynn, the owner of that property. The request is for a sidewalk variance. The property shown here fronts out to Parthenon, as you can see, an RM20 zone property and backs up to 440, presumably a good neighbor. The area here gives you a layout of that uh, lot. You see the development to the north, the development to the south, the blank in the middle. The uh, proposed layout demonstrated here in the site plan gives you a sense of the uh, construction that is contemplated. The sidewalk variance, of course, in play based upon the conditions you see here, an existing sidewalk in the lower right-hand corner, not up to the current standard. The view across the street also includes sidewalks. And then the view up and down this bend in Parthenon from my recent site visit. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 416? Seeing none, the appellant will have five minutes to make the desired presentation. Please just introduce yourself by name and address. Hello, my name is uh, Keith Dowd. I live at 1518 Clayton Avenue. Um, I am basically wanting a, a variance for uh, the condition of the sidewalk. Um, majority of the things around these neighbors, uh, are, the majority of our neighbors are new construction. Um, the, New sidewalk would allow it to be five feet and push it back another foot, breaking the continuity of the neighbors. Um, there's sidewalks on both sides. Uh, so for that reason, is we're applying for this variance. And uh, one thing, um, the Planning Commission did uh, express that they would have approved this. I was on vacation last week when the deadline, they contacted me. I was not in, in the state to be able to take a picture of the the actual width. Um, I did submitted that and uh, did not hit the deadline. Questions? I believe you have, I'm sorry, excuse me. Oh, I believe no. you have the pictures that I submitted. To yes, them. very good pictures, thank you. So, but the Planning Commission's recommendation was disapproval unless you pay into the in lieu fund. It was. 
to pay it to the Alu Fund? Mm -hmm. Okay. I. These are pretty old sidewalks. They look like they were built during the Fulton administration. And so I don't think they're, in, I think they're in need of fixing. So any questions for the applicant? Um, well, he can withdraw. If you want to file a planning request, you can withdraw. So would I be able to pay, still pay into the fund? Um, well, I guess I guess paying the funder or build sidewalks is probably cheaper to build sidewalk new sidewalks. I, I mean, I don't know that it's not but my decision. I'm just saying, you. based on everybody that's ever come before us in a, on a flat piece of property, <laughs> it's probably better to build the new sidewalks than not. But well, that's one of the reasons why it it, it wouldn't make it would make sense to build the sidewalks. Just the continuity of the street, it would be. Yeah. But that's our new laws. Our new laws are very specific. What sidewalks supposed to look like? You either build them that way or pay into the fund. I just think this is an area eventually there's going to be a lot of new construction mm -hmm. and they'll all catch up. There's really only me and the house next door that have not, that does not have new construction. The entire street going to the left. And that little that bungalow point. down there. That's, that, not, that's my one neighbor that doesn't have construction. If you look at the zoning. Now an empty lot up there to the left. Yeah, that's that's my one neighbor that does not ha is not new construction. There's condos to the right, and then on the other side of her, going all the way out to Long Boulevard is is all brand new construction. Oh, but that West Nashville desirable property, it'll get there. It'll get there. Any questions for the applicant? Anything else to add? Okay, let's close public hearing discussion. Our birthday boy. Uh, I move that we. Uh, I move that we deny the appeal. Motion has been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion has been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed. For nothing. Motion passes. John Michael. Chairman, previously we called case number 2018-375. The appellant was out of the room at the moment, but has dutifully been with us. If I recommend that we go back to that one again, that's 2018-375. Okay. Bailey Neal is the appellant, known of the property at 5535 and 5533 Kindle Drive. You heard from council member uh, from council district number 24, Kathleen Murphy, earlier today with regard to that matter. Forgive me for taking a moment to scroll all the way back to it. The, zone, the uh, zoning map here shows the subject property, R6 zoning, hence the HPR development that's already underway. Aerial photograph shows the neighborhood in its current condition, relatively recent condition. Site plan submitted shows you the proposed layout for the structures. Of course, the request is for a sidewalk variance, um, requesting to neither upgrade the current sidewalks to the modern standard or pay into the sidewalk fund. From my recent site visit, the view of the ongoing construction uh, in the lower right-hand corner, the view across the street above, and view up and down the street of the current sidewalks in their current condition. Uh, is there anyone here still in opposition to case number 375? Again, you've got the planning recommendation in your packet. And you've already heard from the council member. What, was there opposition here before? I don't recall, frankly. I apologize for that. If there was, I don't remember them coming up and speaking to me. Regardless, you do have the case at this point, case 375, the appellant's present and with no opposition, he'll have five minutes to make the desired presentation. Mr. Neal. Sir, can I ask you before you start, your council person was here earlier and she was agreeing with planning. Are you aware of planning's recommendation? I am. Okay, and you disagree with that? Uh, I do, yes. Okay. And why do you disagree and why are you here? Get us started, name, address. While you're here. Sure. Bailey Neal, I live at 5533 Kendall. Um, that was the existing house that was there that I tore down and I'm building my own house back there. Um, so effectively, as you can see on the pictures here, we have the continuity of the sidewalks in our neighborhood. Um, by adding the four foot planter strip and the five foot sidewalk, we'll have the, we'll lose the continuity, but it actually will, the water taps for those two homes and actually that the original house was a duplex the entire neighborhood was built in 1948 and they were all duplexes so there were existing two water taps there from that point uh, but the new sidewalk will sit in basically on top of those water taps and they'll have to be moved there's also a fire hydrant further down that the sidewalks would then also run into so it's my belief that the hardship is that those items would have to be moved. The fire hydrant's on your property? Yes. So, John, what happens when there's a fire hydrant and you have to 
build a new sidewalk? I have a survey. Feel free to go ahead if you want. I've got. If there are any utilities that are interfered with by the required moving or reestablishing of sidewalks, you make those moves. We're talking utility poles, uh, fire hydrants, I believe, are treated the same way. So the applicant any has to do that? Things. Correct. Cost of development, Mr. Chairman. So I, I will say that the sidewalks that are there now, I am planning on if I would put them exactly back and replace them brand new because admittedly we have uh, injured them during the course of construction. So I would have to fix them no matter what. I'm just asking to not then set them back with the four foot uh, planter strip and the five foot sidewalk. I'm basically saying I'd like to just re-pour them exactly where they are today. You wouldn't leave them the way they are and you don't want to pay in lieu. I think that by me re-pouring them where they are and paying to do that, I shouldn't have to also pay the in lieu of fee. And so the hardship is the? The fire hydrant and the water taps. Okay, which we have a picture of. Okay, any other questions for the applicant? So your council person, who's very familiar with the area, says that you should build the new sidewalks the way they should be. No, she but she okay. said to rebuild the she existing. Was okay if he rebuilt oh, it. Oh, but rebuilt it in the, are you willing to do that? Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna, okay. I'm gonna put them back exactly where they are and re-pour them brand new where they are today. She was okay if he wants to keep the sidewalk, but she wanted him to pay in lieu. Oh, okay. So I keep the sidewalks and pay them in. and pay them. Yeah. Well, that's what she we says. Understand. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, well, I can save that for discussion. I, I guess. Okay, but, so I mean, you any, have you any, have to repair the sidewalks. Anyway. Well, either way. Either way. Yeah. Well, so that's really not. You're really not giving us. I anything. just don't want to. But the hardship is then if I go with the the sidewalk ordinance, I have to then also move the fire hydrant and the water taps. Right. Indeed. But if you just repair the sidewalks and pay in lieu, you don't have to move the fire agent, right? So that's cost of doing business, right? Okay. Any um, other questions of the applicant? Okay, let's close the public hearing. So what are we going to do? Councilman has said she wants the sidewalks. Yeah, I, I, think, I think at minimum, he pours a new sidewalk. I think uh, y'all probably know where I would go and so I'll let it let see where you all are on that and I'm I'm willing to be a fourth vote to, okay, to we'll give them an answer today okay we'll but, make a motion well no I mean I, well I'll, you know I I mean I'll, I'll move that uh, we grant the variance for the for the sidewalk uh, you know and on the condition that the appellant uh, repair and replace the existing sidewalk and pay into the in lieu fund Okay. I'll second that. Motion's been made properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. John Michael. Mr. Chairman, confirming one last zoning case, 2018-380, which had requested to be at the heel of our docket. Uh, obviously, the appellant has not been able to make it at this hour. I know that he was in another uh, court matter, stuck there, and so we'll have that on our next docket since he's not able to be here yet. Okay. That won't be taxed as a deferral for them since he had asked to be at the very, very end of our docket anyway. Let's do a couple more. Which brings us to a couple of short-term rental cases. Case first, number 2018-200, Alicia Gardner is the appellant and owner of the subject property at 492 Southgate Avenue in Council District number 17. I believe you have commentary from the district council member in your packet with regard to his input on the matter. Yep. Uh, staff is represented by, um, well, we've got Mac here today to make the presentation from staff, so we'll invite him forward at this point. After his presentation, we'll have the opportunity to hear from five minutes worth, at the most, from the appellant. Matt. Okay, Matt, get us started. Come up here and tell us what you know about this, why it's here. John Michael. Good afternoon. Um, this is an owner-occupied permit that was issued on um, July the 2nd of uh, 2015. It expired one year after that and on July uh, 2nd of 2016. Host letter was sent out on 3-4 of 18, estimated delivery date 3-10. Appeal filed 3-30 of this year. Uh, approximately eight documented stays after the letter was delivered. One documented stay in April, which was the last uh, ads reposted and removed several times, but no further stays. Uh, last removed on 725 of 18. 
there were 179 documented rentals, 111 of which occurred after the permit had expired. Um, there are a couple of concerns with this. Uh, first off, there were two separate ads for one bedroom uh, and um, simultaneous rental at a short-term rental property is not permitted. Right. Okay. Um, state your name, address, and what happened there with the two simultaneous rentals? Alicia Gardner. Um, I'm not really sure what happened with the two separate rentals. Did you post two rentals? I may have. I'm not really sure. I know that I was trying, so I was told by the um, zoning board that if it's over 31 days, then I could have oh, okay. a, so I tried to create a new listing at one point, and then I just took it down because it was just too much But you never hassle. had two rentals at once? No. Okay. Sure. Um, we have a letter, an email from Colby Sledge, the councilperson from the area. It says, I'm in favor of the short-term rental permit appeal at 492 South Case Avenue after speaking with the owner. Uh, how come you didn't send us a check for $50 and put a stamp on it? Um, to be honest, I was in an abusive uh, relationship with my very controlling husband, and I had absolutely no clue that we did not have a rental. I mean, a uh, a permit and the reason why we had a permit at the beginning in 2015 was because I had told him that we had to have an, a, a permit um, even though he was um, reluctant to get one. <clears throat> um, after that he had told me well, we had gotten a, a renewal letter in the mail and I said oh Chris we have a renewal letter, letter don't forget we need to renew the permit and he said don't worry about it I took care of it. And I had no reason to not believe that he did not take care of the okay. permit. Okay. Thanks. Any questions for the applicant? Anything else to add? Thank you. We're going to close public hearing. So we have a letter from the council person. I think the last rental date was April, correct? Mm -hmm. um, I move that we uphold the zoning administrator's opinion and that the applicant is eligible to reapply for a permit on Monday. Is there a second? I'll second? Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. John Michael, this is it. We are done. But I want to uh, introduce our honorary BZA board member here, and he's going to let us all go home. So the floor is yours. Meeting adjourned. Very good. <laughs> This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.